can please come off stage and join us uh, as we properly understand. You are welcome, Mr. Ken. Yeah, good welcome. morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, hola, buddy. Uh, Michael, good morning, everyone. Yes, you're welcome. As we engage in an intellectual discussion today, uh, let's kindly think in our friends, think in our colleagues, um, invite as many people as possible as we have a very intellectual conversation today. It promises to be educative as usual. It promises to be intellectual as usual. It promises to be thought provoking as usual. Let's bring in our friends. Let's have a critical mass because we don't want people to lose or miss anything in this discussion. Before we start, what is Nigeria? What is the plan of Nigeria? What is the plan of those who want to create the Nigerian empire? What is their plan? What is their plan? Why, what is, why do we have so much uh, disorganization in the land? So Mr. Michael, over to you, please kindly take over the room. Are you there, Mr. Michael? Yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Um, yeah, for from the title, I has done um, a good um, justice to, to open the floor. Um, creation of the Nigerian Empire, um, the fate of the indigenous people, and the same lesson can also be extrapolated across. Um, can you speak up a little bit? Okay, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> I hope I'm more. I hope I'm clearer now. Okay, just increase the tempo a little bit. Yeah, um, yes, I was saying that like you said, and the fate of the indigenous people, that um, it's a very great topic to have because in talking about um, Nigeria or even any other African nation, we tend to, to most of the time, ignore the plight of the indigenous people, their fate, because as we all know, the greatest crime that was committed over the past five centuries is the is stealing the sovereignty of the indigenous people from them. And at what point would we find a way to resolve that question? The African question, where we have um, 54 administrative areas that we can we tend to call countries um, um, today, which are just easy for the world, which are which only exist because they are easier for the world to relates to trade, to buy and sell essentially with Africa, because you only have to interact with 54 um, representatives at the end of the day. Or in the case of Nigeria, you just need to find that one person to relate to and everything else will, will boil. And um, for the Nigerian question, that is Nigeria tenable or untenable? Should Nigeria be allowed to work? So and so, to put it in quotes, it's a question we ask a lot as Nigerians, and many people on this stage, many people in the audience, many people that might have shifted positions, ones were absolute believer in that thought that yes, Nigeria, the Nigerian project, um, their population, the identity, you know, we could, we could, um, giant of Africa, we could rule the world if we just get it right, and <sighs> over time understanding what is necessary for that particular project. I, for one, have come to a little bit of clarity that, hmm, that uh, as people say in the other day, be careful to wish for, you might just actually get it. Because we tend to look at what is possible in the future. We don't focus more on the current realities of what's happening. And most importantly, we don't focus on what it takes what it actually takes to get to that um, that ending. Because for the Nigerian empire to survive, many sacrifices are needed to get it done. And that goes back to accepting the reality of the moment, which is we have found ourselves in May 1st, 2021. What are the realities we live in? What are the um, current, um, economic and security and political realities that we find ourselves. And if we can take a closer look at these things and accept them and then try to now use that to relate towards tomorrow, we'll be able to make better decisions rather than 
always living in this belief of belief of maybe tomorrow, maybe people will just wake up tomorrow morning and we just start acting like robots or zombies without that um, the past doesn't matter, you know. People should just act normal. Things that there is no in this of humanity, there has been no group that has woken up and simply started acting normal. And for those who have been able to do that, they decree it's there is a reason. It's mostly because you probably have external bodies to exploit for your prosperity. Because uh, as we see in Nigeria, prosperity, most of the time, prosperity cannot be shared equally. And if you exist in a position, which is what we see, we've seen in the European order, whereby you lack the resources you need to build yourself and you live in in a, in, in a state of strife with your neighbors, finding an external body to exploit makes it easier for you to live in peace, which is what the Western peace that we've all enjoyed anyway for the past almost seven decades is built on, the expectations of the rest of us. And the same is true for Nigeria. If Nigeria wants to attain the level of peace, certain people need to be expected for it, certain sacrifices need to be made. Um, for it because everybody must align either in thoughts, either in culture, either in language, either in practice. There must be there must be an alignment of everybody. And in getting that alignment is what people don't want to agree that sacrifices to we need to be made. Either you sacrifice your language, sacrifice your culture, you sacrifice your being, you must sacrifice your resources, you must sacrifice your land, you must sacrifice something towards that end. And I think without the fact that many people haven't taken the time, it's time to actually think if this is a sacrifice they are willing to make, it is important to ask um, that question. And to people who tend to say no, like we just get to that day in the future where Nigeria works and you know um, it will be benign towards everybody. Uh, I tend to remind them that China is now at that point where they've gotten everything right. But China is not benign towards everybody. The yoga population is currently being re-educated so that they can more align with what they consider the Chinese mindset. And it is important to understand these things that development, progress, and um, of a nation requires a common purpose, a common identity, a common future towards tomorrow. And whoever doesn't align with it at the end of the day would have to pay the price for it, if not in the immediate, but definitely someday because for a nation to progress, you have to ensure that you have that uh, collective of mindset, collective of purpose that to guide it towards the future. And in Nigeria, achieve it that, which, I, which goes back to the question is, what would be the fate of the genius people? And many people here today will talk on that. And in my own personal opinion, at the end of the day, when you have that Nigeria, a lot of cultures, a lot of people would not make it to that end. A lot of languages would have been eradicated. A lot of um, indigenous people would have lost their lands or rather they would have lost over one million portion of their land to the Nigerian project. And these are questions and realities people must consider if, like I said, if you are willing to pay the price. And which is the most important question, if you are willing to pay that price, you must sit down and ask yourself, you must look at, look back at your family, at your people, at your community, at your land, at your ethnic nation, and ask yourself, are we willing to pay this price? Because we tend to just jump towards and forward and forward without really, really, really bothering to ask these important questions. And um, so for us to explore in depth of the topic, I will actually now move on to um, our um, it seems uh, Mr. Labode has kind of stepped out for a second. So I will move to Are to take the mic and actually um, explore and just um, give us his thoughts on the topic. Are, um, Thank can... you very much. I greet you all in the name of Olodu Marare. You're welcome into Think Yoruba First, where Yoruba Nationalist Organization, and um, we hope to continue to educate Yoruba people and indigenous people across the world on the need to practice self-preservation, to practice to, to practice cultural preservation and language preservation, and even 
the moral preservation of their civilization. Today we are having the topic, it says the creation of a Nigerian empire, the fate of indigenous people. The first question we ought to ask ourselves, who and what, who is a Nigerian and what is, a, what is Nigeria? Another question we need to properly explain is what is the definition of an empire? The usage of the word empire uh, lasted till the last 28th century. And I'm very sure that many people listening to me, both on the stage and in the audience, were born in the 28th century. What is an empire? And what is the definition of an empire? An empire is a political unit made of several territories and people, usually created by conquest, divided between a dominant center and a subordinate periphery, peripheries. This definition was by Owe, Mr. Owe, 2002, in his article, which he titled Empire, that was published in the Oxford University Press. One more time, I am going to define an, uh, an empire once again. According to Owe, 2002, which he wrote in that classic article, Empire, which was published in the Oxford University Press. There's a reason why this discussion is started starting with an intellectual angle to it, so that we can properly set the foundation for this intellectual discussion. An empire is defined as a political unit made of several territories and peoples, usually created by conquest, divided between a dominant center and a subordinate periphery. Any political unit that fits into this definition of an empire by Mr. Howe, Professor Howe, which is dominated by an ethnic bloc or a geopolitical bloc or a racial group is definitely an empire. And um, from this definition, one is very certain that Nigeria fits the definition of an empire. So we live in an empire without many people realizing that Nigeria is already an empire. When you have a conglomeration or amalgamation of different ethnic groups and ethnic nationalities based on an egalitarian federal principle, where each the different federal uh, groups, um, federal blocks and units have equal footing that is based on mutual trust and mutual understanding in the same ethnic block, in the same political unit, then that particular setting is no longer an empire. So from the definition I gave, Nigeria is an empire. And in an empire, there are always the ruling class and the subjugated class. The ruling class used, usually belongs to a different tribal, ethnic, or racial group, while the, the subjects are always the conquered people. It is very sad for me to say that the remaining majority, 99 to 93 to 94%, or those who call themselves Nigerians, are conquered people uh, and are subjects of an empire. When it comes to empire, 
Empire is always associated with uh, words like uh, colonialism, globalization, and imperialism. So when you see those who want to continue to justify the existence of Nigeria by using the concept of globalization, you are going to see that they understand what Nigeria is, that Nigeria is nothing but an empire that was built to destroy indigenous people. The biggest victim of empires anywhere across the world for the past 5,000 years of the great empires like the Babylonian, Babylonian Empire, Egyptian Empire, the Abbasid Empire, the Andalus uh, Empire, Aztec Empire, Inca Empire, or your empire, Bini Empire, you know, all empires across the world, the Songhai Empire, the Mali Empire, the biggest victims of these empires are always the indigenous people, people who own the land. Just like the Russian Empire, just like the, the all sorts of empires across the world, the indigenous people are always those who suffer, who bear the brunt of the creation of empires. We must never forget. Going back to the definition of um, empire by Owe, I said empire, it is a political unit that is made of several territories. Nigeria is a political unit. There is nothing organic about it. It is an amalgamation, and the amalgamation treaty was done in 1914. So it fits into this definition of an empire. It is made up of several people. They call it the, the, the that, that professor wrote peoples. Nigeria is made up of different peoples. Peoples from different tongues, different race, different genetic makeup, different identity, different civilizations, different history, different spirituality, different worldview, matched together to create a Tower of Babel. Also, it is also created by conquest. Nigeria was created by conquest. The mere fact that the Nigerian Polity, political entity was created by conquest, gives the, con gives the uh, uh, support that uh, a definition of what an empire is all about. So it's a product of conquest, where people were killed in their millions, lands were taken away from indigenous people, and several people were destroyed before empire, that empire was created on the blood of the indigenous people. You can check out this definition, HOWE 2002 definition of empire. And it is well revered, well accepted in several, the several academic environment. Uh, I'm talking in the academic community, most especially in the field of political science and sociology. And the last uh, criteria that uh, defines, characterizes an empire is that it is divided between a dominant center and a subordinate periphery. Uh, because it is um, divided between a dominant center, what do we mean by a dominant center? It's, um, there's always a centralized system of government where that is very, very powerful. And the other periphery are always, uh, uh, you know, lesser, less powerful compared to the powerful center. That was why, if you remember, during the course for the Nigerian independence, many of the distrust that uh, many people have, especially in the intellectual circle, 
as towards people like uh, Inamdi Azikwe was his, his, his insistence in the 50s that Nigeria should practice a very powerful center and a very weak periphery. When the reality is that Nigeria is made up of different ethnic identities, different nations, different empires, forced together through conquest, yet you are advocating for a very centralized system of government. So it was very, very clear that he was, we wanted to create an empire which he wants to be the emperor. So that was why it was very, very uh, comfortable becoming the governor general, general in the First Republic. Meanwhile, he held no power. He was tricked, used, and dumped. Even though there were already killings and there were already different clash of civilization taking place amongst the indigenous people, he, he still didn't. He never and never and never saw the need for him to de amalgamate an empire that would lead to the marginalization of his people and other indigenous people in Nigeria. So let's look at Nigeria because the topic says creation of the Nigerian empire. And we have to give kudos to somebody like uh, Chief Obafemi Awolowo. This is history, this is not sentiment. For being very, very uh, altruistic and um, being futuristic, seeing what Nigeria was going to be. Even though he wanted to get out of Nigeria, but the Pan-Africanists uh, foisted uh, people with Pan-Africanist ideology in the South. They were able to um, use Inamdi Azikwe to create this empire that has put more than 200 people in chains in this 21st century. In the First Republic, there were very powerful regions and a very weak center. The only thing the center, what the British were able to do was that they were able to ensure that the means of uh, violence, the means of enshrined violence, the means of perpetrating violence was left in the ends of that weak center because they understood that no matter your economic power, no matter your economic development, you no matter your economic uh, achievement, without a powerful, a powerful, uh, without a center that has the means to perpetrate violence, the gains and the formation of an empire will not be possible. Because every empire and every world order is always curated in blood and iron at the expense of the indigenous people. So they ensure that the police and the army was majorly controlled and majorly manipulated by people from a section of the country in order to continue to perpetrate and create an empire that will give them undeniable access and undisputed access to millions and millions and millions, thousands of resources that is needed to build and maintain any prosperous civilization. So that was what they did. And um, we all saw that uh, when Inamdi Azikwe, um, when Agui and Rossi started the centralization of the Nigerian public sectors and started the creation of the empire, because Nigeria, used to be a colony of an empire. And uh, they knew it was not going to, British knew it was not going to survive. And uh, people like Inamdi Azikwe, Agui and Rossi was, was, were convinced why this empire was needed. And uh, we all know the story. 
And um, what started as a power struggle between the three regions, by 1962, the Western region was already balkanized, um, was already destabilized, balkanized, and weakened. Uh, the Eastern region and Northern region, it was a matter of time before they destroyed themselves. And um, the Western region made a very big mistake, um, which was looking at the antecedent of uh, the people, people like um, Inamdi Azikwe, to side with the Nigerian side, which was the federal side against the Afghan side. It was a very big mistake because we should have looked at the bigger picture and don't look at the stupidity and the madness of people like Inamdi Azikwe in taking millions of people into eternal slavery. What um, we don't understand, because we talk as historians, what Inamdi Azikwe has uh, actually done in Nigeria, um, many tens of ethnic nationalities will be wiped out. Even after Nigeria disintegrates. So he was, uh, I want to call it, it was a mess even to the African civilization uh, because of the role he played. That is why those who continue to tow that path of this um, Azikwe's Zikist doctrine that has made the southern part of Nigeria ewers of woods and drawers of water. I'm talking about slaves to the Kulans, Kulanis Caliphate that, uh, that are not indigenous to the space called Nigeria, that never fought for the independence of Nigeria, that do not bring any material, any human, any, any reasonable human resources to, the, to Nigeria. We have to understand that um, it is really a disaster that um, we have been thrown into the backyard of human civilization because of the mistake of one person. I'm not trying to be too hard, but we have to put things in, in context uh, and be very, very uh, blunt so that we can understand. So when anybody comes up stage, we can properly have a conversation. So it has been proven that Nigeria is an empire. And um, the West was taken out in 1962, and the Eastern region was brutally taken out in 19, between 1967 and 1970, remaining a very powerful North. And the powerful North was preserved first by the British. They, in fact, till today, there's an Institute of Northern Nigeria in Britain today, in the British government, where the North has a different department, a specific department. A specific department that existed before independence and still exists today. Uh, it's not history, it's not a mistake that uh, Northern governors are summoned to Britain and to America for, for meetings. Why Southern governors do not even have any say when it comes to international affairs? There's a reason. That is the way power games are played. They are the chosen ones, where we are the we are the accursed ones. Um, it is not to say uh, that we shouldn't say strong words. This is a situation of the Nigerian situation, and um, we all know why people that have benefited from this rot of the Nigerian system. Uh, we we'll continue to tell you there's nothing called restructuring. They will continue to restructure Nigeria to protect their own power at the expense of the indigenous people. Any restructuring that will take um, prevent Nigeria, turn Nigeria from being an empire into a federal or a confederacy, where people will be on equal footing, will be resisted with blood and iron. And that is why you see the killings going on, the anarchy going on, the manipulations going on. You don't need to be a genius to understand 
the evil of the Nigerian state. When it comes to evil, when it comes to the definition of evil, Nigeria as a political unit is the definition of evil. So that is the creation of an empire. And I'm going to use two to three um, examples of um, empires, four empires in the world, how they were formed and how they became what it is. In fact, I'm going to be using example of three countries, three present countries that are, uh, 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 that are calling themselves countries that many people think they are homogeneous, many people think they are diverse, but in the true sense of it, this was an identity that was forged at the expense of millions of people, at the, that was formed at the expense of millions of lives, that was formed at the expense of the indigenous people. Nigeria is already an empire. So what the Fulanis are currently doing is consolidation. I was in a room yesterday and somebody from the Niger Delta was speaking. And if you listen to this man, if you are not intellectually and emotionally mature, you are going to be very angry. I don't want to mention the name of the man. When he was justifying the sabotage that some of the people in the Niger Delta are doing perpetrating towards the Yoruba, major ethnic bloc, the Yorubas and the Igbos. So he continually justified the need to continually, people that were in that room will know what I'm talking about. The need to continually to politically sabotage the Yorubas and the Igbos so that they are, it's, it's, um, its own sentiment, its own aggrandizement will be protected. I understand self-preservation, but he's ready to continually support those who continually exploit him at the expense of the indigenous people. That is why sane Yoruba nationalists will never want to be fighting for self-determination that comprises of minorities. And I've told many Igbos who care to listen, if you do not pursue how you are going to survive, because when we talk about self-determination, self-determination in Nigeria has gone beyond controlling your resources. It has gone beyond fulfilling, uh, looking for prosperity. It has gone beyond um, looking for political sovereignty or political freedom. It has come to the extent that we want to survive as a people. We want to live. That is what we are even asking for. That is what we are begging for. That is why we don't want to be in the museum. We don't want to go into extinction. As a people, that is what we are asking for. That is what any patriotic Yoruba man should fight for with all his life. That is what any patriotic and sane uh, Igbo man should fight with with all his life. And um, right within our, 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 our face, let, let me tell you, because I'm going to explain so that you can understand what Nigeria is all about. And you can properly put this into, uh, put this into context, how empires are formed. Every major superpower in the world, from Britain to America, from America to France, from France to Russia, from Russia to uh, China. These five powerful superpowers in the world, they've done the following three things. One, they have committed genocide against indigenous people that lived within that entity. They have wiped out people in their millions. Two, 
they are taking over people's resources and lands. So that is what they done. Three, they've been able to create an exploitative system of government that is built on the exploitation of indigenous people. So this is what has been done. These are the evil that has been perpetrated in the creation of these superpowers. Now, let us look at Nigeria. For the past 50 years, Nigeria has been feasting on the blood of the people of where we call the geopolitical zone called Niger Delta. It steals the resources, bleeds its dry, and kill anybody that ever, that even, even advocate like, you can take the resources. What about the environment? And you see that the justification for this is that it should, this, this stealing is done in the name of the sovereignty called Nigeria that was created by conquest, by the British, who came to steal, who came to plunder, who came to destroy. And we are not surprised. Many of these resources, many of the companies, multinational corporations, many people don't even know that even the word empire can be used to regard multinational corporations. So they call it, you are going to see people like Ford, automobile empire. You are going to see cases like um, issues like the oil empire, oil magnets, oligarchs. You are going to see things like, um, you know, telecommunication empire, steel empire company, because these are multinational corporations that are far powerful, far richer than many, many, many nation states in the world. If you also observe that many of these empires, these multinational corporations, they are reverting to what it used to be in the 19th century. They now have their own personal militias. So you see that many countries of the world, from Russia to America, to America, to China, to China, to France, from France to Britain, they now have their own, they, are, they now have private contractors. We call them private military contractors that protect oil installations, that protect uh, assets, you know, across the world that belong to the metropolis. I'm talking about the, the, the colonizing power that created those empires. So they knew that for them to be at the top, they need to invite some ethnic nationalities across Africa to the table. So what we now are is that they've been able to convince the indigenous ethnic nationalities across the world and in Africa that they need to displace another African ethnic group or tribe to be at the table. So the Yoruba people, have been convinced that if they can displace the, Fula, displace the Fulanis from the table, they will be the ones that will become the house Negro in the house of the British. They convinced the Igbos that the Igbos should be the person that should be supporting the Fulani, um, that should take over from the Fulanis and be relating with the British directly. Right from the beginning and independence, the Yoruba people were already killed Negroes. We were already all out of the picture. So the people, the, the, the talk of war was that the Igbos wanted to replace the Fulanis. Um, and uh, it was not Igbos. Uh, Inamdi Azikwe's ideology uh, of Pan-Africanism fits into this uh, ideology. And he got this from Marcos Garvey. Uh, because uh, yeah, we should see what happened in Liberia. Liberia was created by the United States basically for the returned slaves. So when the returned slaves, black slaves got there, they created, they became the new uh, uh, overlords 
against other people of color or black people like them because they believe they are racially superior because they become they become americanized they they are more westernized they are more civilized and um they were the ones that were relating with the americans so you see people like uh, Charles Taylor, you know, those are American agents. Forget what they tell you. Who are descendants of these black slaves? Who Britonies, enslaved people, who took over lands, resources, rigging election for thousands, for hundreds of years, and they destroyed that country and they created another apartheid system of government right in West Africa. So when people talk about the instability in West Africa, in um, Syria alone, and um, and Liberia, many people don't think um, Africans are killing themselves. No, it's a racial struggle between enslaved, freed black slaves coming from America and the British islands in the Americas, who wanted to continue to to perpetrate what the Europeans did to them. They learned so well. So when the indigenous people started revolting with everything necessary, it became war. And that is why we call this civil war. It was not a civil war, it's a war between the second class and the indigenous people. And um, that is why the concept of Pan-Africanism was um, particular from that definition. It's, it's bigger than um, uh, satanic. It's an ideology that um, will surely lead to another brutal war. In Africa, but I'm talking about the very brutal war that we have had, and that uh, demonic uh, ideology will be defeated once and for all. It doesn't matter the kind of um, definition you come here to talk about, because we've seen that um, even the Fulanis are Pan-Africanists. Uh, they hide under Pan-Africanism to continue to propagate in Nigeria, where they continue to steal and steal and steal. So this fight between the different ethnic nationalities to become the house Negro, because there are the, the, the world has been created in the pyramidal structure. So some people are ready to be in the intermediate for as long as possible till they get the right opening to also become power brokers. So that is why you see that um, the Fulanis know that they will prefer an Islamic Republic. The Fulanis know that they will prefer an Islamic empire. The Fulanis know that they will prefer an homogeneous Fulani state. The Fulanis know that they want the Fulani to continue to rule Nigeria under enemies. The Fulanis know that they, they want to continue to use the resources of everybody, the taxes for their own development. But the problem is they are still bidding their time before they finally do what did what America Russia, China, Britain, and France as well. So we are still in the age of empire. Um, there's no nations, there's no sovereignty anywhere. The sovereignty that was created was created by some people. So when you talk about the international rule of law, the international rule of law is a law that was sent, that was set up by gangsters, that was set up by crooks, that was set up by mafias, that was set up by oligarchs. So Nigeria is an empire. I've been able to define and actually tell you Nigeria is an empire. So the next thing is to talk about what is the fate? What is going to happen to the indigenous people that are unfortunate to be within this Nigerian empire? What is going to happen? And uh, we are not looking into the crystal ball like prophets, we are only trying to engage in an intellectual conversation, discourse, using history as our guiding light into the future. What will our faith be? What will the faith of the just be? What will the faith of the Yorubas be? What will the faith of the Igbos be? What will the faith of the um, Thief people be? What is the faith? of other indigenous ethnic nationalities would be. That is why you see some people, they are very, very, you know, uh, it is um, when I, you know, I used to think that um, for you to be oppressed, you should also have a form of, um, of mindset of anti-oppression, but I was wrong. There are many people that are oppressed 
and um, they are only waiting for the opportunity for themselves to be oppressed. So, if for instance, you look at, um, I was reading somewhere, and so on, on this clubhouse, people will continue to say one Nigeria forever. Um, Nigeria needs to be Nigeria, Nigeria forever. And they tell you that uh, the Delta Igbos, the Igbos that have been caught into Delta states should not be allowed to have any political contiguity or political synergy with the Igbos in the Southeast. They tell you no, even though they are Igbos, they have no right that the entire Delta and the Benin will be used to create the Midwest, the Benin Republic. And you start asking yourself questions. Are they not Igbos? You say it's none of their business. They dare not, they are, they are Igbos, but they dare not call themselves their friends. These are people that are not up to 4 million in population, that are threatening people that are powerful, Igbos that are known all over the world. This is what Nigeria will create to everybody. And if you look at Nigeria, uh, when I try to talk, I know um, people like uh, not every ethnic nationality think that way, ethnic minorities think that way. I know many people in the Middle Belt, the Tif people, you know, they are now the fought against uh, Fulani hegemony, and they lost more than 50,000 people right at independence. So many of us even think about what the Fulanis are doing to us in the did in 1962, did in 1967. The, the biggest victim post independence of Fulani uh Machiavelli games were the were the full were the were the, were the thief people total massacre so total massacre and you understand that the same thing has been happening um the massacre you know the it was called my malari that's a ruthless fulani uh um ruthless fulani uh a military man i'm a soldier who who, who killed men to rape so they and, and they declared the declared state of emergency in that um, in that area of the north, you know that which was uh, ably supervised by the British government, because um, they could not. Um, uh, it was too dangerous for the Middle Belt people to say they don't want to be part of the north, because the Middle Belt being part of the north is very very instrumental for the creation of the Nigeria of British dreams, and to properly hand over. Nigeria over to the Shokoto Caliphate. So it was very, very important. So as they were, and if you understand what they also did between 1960 and 1962, the British were very, very desperate. In order to continually, how are they going to make the bridge of Aousa Fulani hybrid of legacy, where the Aousa people are the us and the Fulanis are the riders, a master servant relationship, you know, uh, which is not surprising. Even Russia, when we talk about the ethnic Russian identity or Ukrainian identity, the ethnic Russian identity is an hybrid identity of the Viking people and the Slav. So coming together, breeding together, intermarrying together, that's how you could decorate Russia. So the Vikings and the Slavs, the Slav Slavic people, and the Vikings by the ruling uh, house, why the Slavs were the subordinate house. That was how Russia were, were, were the subjects, were the conquered people. So that was how Russia was created. So it was created on feudalism. So just like any other European power. So that was why you saw the way the British accepted the full and new, uh, destruction of the indigenous people. So the British are not people that come to a place you think they are coming with the sword of justice to intervene in any matter. They intervene in promoting minority rule over majority rule. So, and they support the minority in destruction of the majority. My many minorities are victims of those people. And that is why we need to continually preach to the minority that when Nigeria actually truly forms, you guys will be white out. You guys will be white out. Don't think that the Fulanis are destroying the Yorubas they are destroying the egos, and you are standing in the sitting in the spectator with your popcorn, clapping, and you are part of those. Because if you remember, the other Benin, the Benin people are responsible for the destruction, uh, for the for 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 for, for not allowing the the the, the Aburi Accord to be to be to be to be to be followed, which could have prevented the loss of more than five million lives. 
that 5 million lives could have become 20 to 30 million people in 2022. So let's just, generations were wiped out. But um, because they wanted everybody, you know, weak, weakened, they wanted everybody brought to the same level. So they believe the Fulanis are doing a good job. The Igbos do not mean well for them. The Yorubas do not mean well for them. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Destroy the Yorubas, destroy the Igbos, you know, destroy any other Egypt major ethnic group. Why they continue to clap? You know, they continue to clap. That's why we saw, when I saw the guy saying his biggest, uh, his role model within the Nigerian Federation was uh, General Stanley Abacha, that the job people have a special day in Bayesa for him. I knew we are talking to a, brain, a deranged individual. And these people are in their millions in the South. They are in their millions across the country. So we have to understand that we are in trouble. How important, why we need to understand what is going on. And if you look at how the Aztec empire were, were destroyed, the ethnic minorities that were not part of the Aztec were the ones that the Spanish used as mercenaries in the destruction of the Aztec empire. And let me now tell you the funniest thing. After the Aztec empire were destroyed, they were the next people that were exterminated. The same thing happened in the destruction of the indigenous people of New Zealand, the Maoris. The same thing happened in the destruction of the indigenous people of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of Russia. You know, the Cossacks, you know, the Cossacks, the, the, the Cossacks were used, you know, you know, were used in the fight, were fighting, were used in the fighting of Tatars. Look at the way they are using the Chechens in destroying the Ukrainians in the current war going on. You know, they are acting the Chechens and the Chechens are clapping because the Chechen also have issues against the Ukrainians. So they believe by fighting, joining our ranks and destroying the Ukrainians, you know, they will be fair, they will be, they will be happy. They, we shouldn't forget that at a point in time, um, Russia, the same like Vladimir Putin bombed Grozny. That's the capital of Chechen Republic. And it was um, more than 200,000 people were wiped out. I'm talking about within two months, just less than 15 years ago. And these same people are going to Chechen. They are the most one of the most ruthless ethnic nationalities in that war currently going on between Ukraine and Russia. So it's the same. The you so it is that's why when Amadou Bello said that the 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 my ethnic minorities will be used as willing to that word did not come from his mouth. He was reading verbatim. He was reading verbatim from what the British told him. The British told him the difference between the Fulanis of 1960 and the different the Fulanis of 2022 is that the Fulanis of 1960 they were very vocal about their intention about Nigeria. They were not interested in Nigeria. They tell you what they want to do and they will do it. The Fulanis of 2022 they've mastered the art of lying. They mastered the art of deception. So people like Wari is a very good exception. So people like Atiku they are liars. People like Saraki they are liars. You know, they can hide their true intentions in perpetrating what they want because they understand that Nigeria is the biggest deal. Look, if you are a full animal or you are any, any, any ethnic nationality, that the British have done what they did for you, placing the fate of over 250 million people into your hands, a place where you came in as third class, you have no spiritual and ancestral connection to that place, and you are controlling uranium deposits, gas deposits crude oil deposit, diamond deposit. You can control the ocean. You can control the space. You can control the sea. You can control the land. You can go anywhere. You know, they control the police. And they say Nigeria is the most powerful country, biggest country in Africa. And you are here. Why won't you support the continuous existence of that country, even though you wipe out millions of people? Because you know that if this particular social engineering is perfected, you become the most powerful, you become the most powerful, your ethnic nationality will become the most powerful ethnic bloc in the world. In the world. So this is the Nigerian empire. So I'm just telling you what some, some how, how minorities are also being used. And they know, they know that at the end of everything, their destruction is certain within that ethnic, within that identity, within that contraption. So I don't understand. I don't understand. But I understand by history. That has always been what it is in history. And the biggest mistake any Igbo man will make 
It's not to figure out because what is going on? Nigeria is being reconfigured. And the, the word like the, the, the Igbos I adopt in Osako did not come from Buhari. It tells us what they told him in London. Anytime he goes to the military, he goes for visits in the United States, in the United Kingdom. That was what they told him. The Igbos are conquered. They are a dot in the circle. The next people are going to be Yoruba. Yeah, Yoruba man listening to me. The, you are next on the menu and on the table. So if you are doing PDP, APC politics, and you, that has made you lose your cerebral, you know, sorry to use this word, your brain. It is destruction that is happening. Destruction that is happening. They're already encroaching into our spaces. That's why you see, the guy was talking purposely, and the Kaba people are also a different ethnic group. The guy said, it's wicked. When he knew Kaba people are Yoruba people, he has already minoritized them. And when somebody was trying to say, somebody from Mokirika is not the judge, was, no, how dare you say they are not the judge? He was, you, you are embracing the judge nationalism while propagating Yoruba destruction. Because if you don't promote Yoruba nationalism, you want Yoruba destruction. All right, can you take um, like 10 more minutes so that we can kind of just go around your room? So you can take quarter and take a break. Exactly. So let me quickly round up. So, um, because there's still another part that the, the next session that we I would also like to talk about, where we are going to be talking about the different, um, because this conversation has to be a discussion, it's not a lecture anymore. Because when we, when we, it is like when we talk about too much terms, terminologies, people just forget what we're talking about. So we need to break it down. We need to, um, uh, uh, we need to break it down, and we need to properly elucidate, expatiate, draw parallels, so that people that are already in the museum, you know, they are in the museum. They will not go and they will not go to the party, the party they want to go in this afternoon. They will think twice. They will not be promoting their own destruction. They will do everything necessary. So thank you very much. I don't want to hold the mic for too long again because um, there are other, I'm going to be comparing the American uh, empire. I'm going to be comparing the Delian League, which was the Athenian empire. How it was formed, very, it looked very well like Nigeria. And we are going to be looking at um, uh, uh, the, 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 the Chinese empire and all these empires and how it was formed. And we are going to know what, why is Nigerian empire and what is going to happen to indigenous people. But what I'm, I want to promise you, before Nigeria becomes so powerful, so great, Yoruba people will be wiped out, Igbo people will be wiped out, Ijo people will be wiped out, Beni people will be wiped out. So that's why you see so many people now are so bastardized in their, in their mentality that they themselves are openly saying, take away my yoruba -ness. take away my igbo -ness. I'm not Yoruba, I'm Nigerian, I'm not Yoruba. You can see that it is working. And there are different means in which you can destroy people. You can ethnically assimilate them or ethnically genocide them. I'm talking about use of bullets, put them in concentration camp, like what they are doing in the Middle Belt. The Middle Belt refused to be not a night. Places in Nastarawa, Benue, Plateau, Benue people refuse to speak Hausa. Kogi people refuse to speak Hausa. Many places in Nasrallah do not speak Hausa. Many places in Plateau do not speak Hausa. So these people have to go. So you, they, they are, you have to just displace them. So you displace them from their ancestral roots. You occupy those places. They have to go. So if you look at places that have surrendered, it's relatively peaceful. Like Southern Gombe, Southern Pauchi, Cape, Southern KB, all those places are relatively peaceful. But those places that refused, that still have a form of self-preservation, that if Nigeria breaks down, they will resort back, uh, back to, their, to their identity. They needed to be taken out. So that, they will be, they will, that, will, that will be done. So they need the, 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 the approach they will use for Southern Nigeria is going to be style, um, carrot and stick. And when I mean carrot and stick, it's going to be uh, uh, both they will use the woke generation, the woke generation that uh, they are mentally deranged. They, they can speak English, but they will fail Wahek, uh, English in Wahek for more than 10 times. These are the woke generation. They will tell you their spoken English is very good, 
but their English, written English is very bad. That is the woke generation. They know nothing. It's not their fault. They were programmed to be like that. That is the woke generation. These are the people who say, I'm Nigerian first. They have no understanding of what they're talking about. So they, that generation would have self-destruct and everybody would have been wiped out before maybe three, four, five generations will now be crying in concentration camps about what the woke generation has done to them. So the woke generation need mental help. And that mental help is proper education, proper education and aggressive nationalism so that they don't destroy the rest of us. Thank you very much. Um, this is also thank you, thank you Robert, for kindly follow the room that are just joining us. I'll hand over back to Mr. Michael. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. I thank you so much. Um, yeah, so much has been said about know, the makings of an empire and what people should look forward to the future. And um, your um, look at uh, the American um, example would be interesting so that people can get a perspective of um, the fun idea of democracy they claim in the United America, where during that period, indigenous people were stripped of their land, people were used as chattel slaves, people could not vote until very, very recently. But anyway, fun ideas of um, democracy lies, nations tell themselves. Um, uh, there are so many questions I know people would have. You might have if if you which which borders on borders themselves would do the borders empires rising empires falling eventually what would the people that constitute that empire ultimately fall back on because those are things people don't necessarily think about because um, in the history of the world i think one of the largest empire ever created was the holy roman empire that lasted for oh my god during that period it was an eternity but it fell and all the nations that considered that empire went back to their identities. But I think that's something you you and maybe others who have who have more knowledge which will touch on. So I'll go to I'll go down the PTR. So to so be in the audience, please come if you want to join. This is thinking about for us, and this is one of the many interesting ones we do have. Please raise up your hand, come up and provide your perspective on the topic. It is a discussion where all of us can participate in to learn from each other. Um, Mr. Kemi, I don't know if you have either an opinion, a reply, a response, a question, or just, yeah. Just yeah uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Michael. I would just uh, uh, like to ask uh, Are, uh, because when we are talking about uh, wipe out, does it necessarily mean that uh, the whole ethnic nationality is going to be wiped out? I had this question because uh, I'm in America, right? And uh, when we celebrate, or when they celebrate, because I don't know if I celebrate it anyway, but so far they still give holiday and I still partake in the holiday, either I like it or not. So I still see it as if uh, I, I'm, I'm participating out of it. During the Thanksgiving Day in America, it is a sorrow day. It is a sad day for the indigenous people. These indigenous people, their population is nothing to write home about again. And uh, despite the fact that people are happy, people are like, oh, we are having another day, blah, 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 celebrating, killing the turkey. What these people do is money, is crime, and uh, things like that. So when we are seeing people, uh, some people, Igbos, Igbos needs to be wiped out, Yoruba people need to be wiped out, and the people in the middle belt too need to be wiped out for this sovereignty to be, I mean, for the other ethnic groups who are not even indigenous to be that powerful. What does it really mean to be wiped out? Because does it mean that the all the ethnic nationality in their population will be wiped out without remaining one? or the population is going to be, be reduced to a point whereby they, there will be no influence, there will be no power, there will be nothing. They will just be there existing. I would just like, Ari, probably if you can just uh, shed more light on that. Thank you so much. I don't know if Ari wants to take the questions at once or one at, uh, altogether. 
Okay, I think it's away from your phone. Um, I keep I'm thinking. I'll take it um, one after the other. I'll, I'll put okay, it in. Um, okay, sir. Um, we are going down the pit here. Um, uh, Mr. Ayi, we'll get to you. Uh, just give us that, um, yeah, that moment. Mr. Aki Kenju, I don't know if you have a few words as well. Not yet. I'll still be listening. Maybe later. Thank okay, you. Okay, sir. Uh, Mr. Shango. Mr. Shango, are you there? Okay. Uh, Patrick. Um, Patrick, uh, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There. Yes. Um, so yeah, um, it's always um, nice to see these type of topics uh, that are brought up in this platform. Um, it it just provides an opportunity for us to just speak about a lot of these things. Um, even if it's one person each time that we speak about this, that gets to understand the reality of Nigeria, um, it would play and, and go ahead. We are losing long. you, Patrick. Is it only me? No, it is clear yeah. to me. Okay. It's, it's, clear. Yeah, it's, it's clear from my angle as well. Ah, OK. Um, so yeah, like I said, um, it's actually a very great, um, it, it's really great to have this type of rooms. Um, where we can just brainstorm about a lot of these issues. Um, I think that that one good thing that um, a lot of the the people that we look up to, the likes of Aolowo, the likes of Michael Okpara, um, they actually did understand that everyone has a role to play um, in bringing down this this empire that um we that that had formed um and we are seeing the resurgence of um such an empire um and all of us actually do have some sort of role so um like Are has said massive education of our people is what we actually need to um undergo i think that um one of the the things that work against um this this education campaigns is that we delve into um, a large number of discussions that we actually have no business um, going into. So when you look at um, the history and the um, massacres, the marginalization of a large number large number of groups, um, when you go into this guy has um, done this to me um, and all that. Um, we actually do lose focus. The reality is that this history has happened. Um, we also have a large number of disagreements among ourselves from a historical perspective, from um, whatever ideological perspective, whatever you may call that, right? Um, but the reality is that this empire is going to crush all of us. That is the total sum of thing. Um, you may have people that understand this reality. Um, however, their solutions may differ slightly from yours. Um, you actually have to um, reach out to them, try to understand their own perspectives. Um, they may they have an interim role to play in this in this movement, despite their they are differing solution. The main thing is that they understand the threat. Um, I give an example of myself. When I joined Clubhouse, right, um, I, I didn't have the, the solution to the problem of Nigeria. Uh, I differed slightly in it. Um, I actually did have the solution that I had sympathy towards your banish. I had sympathy towards your banish. And, and like I always said, I said, if if the Yorubas are going, if the people from the Niger Delta are going, if the Igbos are going, we in the Middle Belt are definitely not staying with the North. Um, I always had that sympathy before I joined Clubhouse. Um, I knew it was going to be very difficult. I didn't really think of an independent Middle Belt and state, but I actually had something like that. But when I started conversing with the likes of Are, Bonka, um, 
and all these guys um, that when we met, um, that was about two years or a year ago, um, those, those solutions started popping up. So um, right now, I, what I see on Clubhouse is that once you don't believe in the ideology, they go after you. If I joined Clubhouse, um, just um, let's say I joined it last month and I spoke like that, probably I would have been demonized and I probably would not transform to where I am today, speaking on Middle Belt and related issues. A lot of these conversations that I had, that I speak about, actually went back and looked at these, these um, articles and looked at this history. That would not be possible. So the first thing I would always say is that a lot of people are on their transformation journey. Um, it should, it, we shouldn't be too hasty. And, and when you look at what people like Awolo were built, they reached out to people from the Niger Delta. They reached out to people from the Middle Belt. They reached out to a large number of um, people like Michael Barano and, and even people from the north, um, like Nepal, the party of um, of the Talakawas that Amin Okano um, created. You have everybody has a role to play in this movement. When you are when you are crumbling, when when your aim is to crash this um, empire, everybody has a role. Um, I read touched on something very, very important that I would also like to uh, further add, um, expatiate on or illustrate. Um, it's it's the role of minorities in this empire building. Um, when you look at a large number of um, empires, you'd see that largely a large number of the population are peasants. Um, it's so sad that the peasant population um, in the current day Nigeria is the, the target group is the ethnic, the other ethnic nationalities, which range from the, the Middle Belt, um, the the southern and the entire southern southern Nigeria, right? Um, it has already begun in the Middle Belt. Um, what you see in the Middle Belt is that regardless of whatever states go on would create no matter the states that the other um, uh, successive governments would create it always remains certain that the british and the northern elite wanted the middle belt to be northern that's why you have this issue of geopolitical zones it doesn't matter how many times the middle belt people have said they don't want to be part of it but for this empire to move forward, the Middle Belt people must be called Northern. That's why you have this North Central thing. For this empire to continue, the resources of Southern Nigeria must be used to build this empire. That is why there's this deliberate um, push. There's, there's, there's this deliberation that the North would not be independent with looking for alternative resources. The resources in the south, when, when we see that the resources in the south, when we are coming towards an, a, a time period where the resources in the south, like the oil, people are going to use uh, electric cars, uh, it is switching to land. There will always be something. That's what I always tell people from southern Nigeria. A parasite does not live till the host is completely dead. Right? And the funny thing about it is that the North, if they wanted to be independent, if they wanted to have, it's even in their interest for them to try and be independent and develop themselves, right? It's not an insult to tell them to try and seek to be independent in the way they do things, in, in harnessing their resources, in harnessing things like agriculture, in even improving the education of their people, right? But for this empire to be formed, it is. It has always been on the from the colonial period. It has always been about exploiting the resources of southern Nigeria, and it would never change. We are still seeing that with Ruga. We are still seeing that with um, most of the policies, the blocking of of um, the the economic blockade in the east, and all these things. Um, now, when we look at the role that ethnic minorities have played. 
um, we see that what is being relied upon, and, and I've seen this on Clubhouse, strangely enough, it's a thing, right? When people in, uh, from Northern Nigeria were being attacked, who were the, who, what were the topics that were being brought up? The topics were, that were being um, brought up was, um, were the massacres of um, this man um, in the Niger Delta. And immediately those type of topics were brought on. They, they sparked a lot of um, debate. When a lot of issues are going on in, in Nigeria, they turn to the minorities and spark a lot of debating topics. And I was I was having a conversation with someone from Benue State, and I was telling him about self determination. And he said, "Yeah, yeah, 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 yeah." I heard you. But what we want is the governorship position. When you look at the demographic in the Middle Belt, you see that the Birom people are the major ethnic group in in um, uh, in, in Plateau State. Who were the people that? A lot of these settlers and the northern Nigeria reached out to. They reached out to the ethnic minorities in Plateau State that were being marginalized. So they reached out to this man from um, the current governor is is from um, is Gume by tribe, very small, and he was being reached out to. That's why you see currently he is the governor, and the policy in Plateau State is that there is nothing like IDP camp because. That, those IDP camps in Plateau State were drawing a lot of attention. So the man brought a policy, cancel all IDP camps. There's nothing like IDP camps. Let everybody go out. You saw people roaming around Plateau State, homeless. The thing that happened was that a large number of people, uh, people's family were in Joss City. So they, they, they started staying with their, with their kin folk. First of all, he canceled the concept of um, IDP camps, no IDP camps. Um, secondly, when when headsmen come and massacre people, you have you are, you don't even have rights to the body. The government comes with a bulldozer, packs all the bodies, and throws them in a pit and closes. This is the policy that an ethnic minority in Plateau State is doing to the um, to the people of his own state, all because he wanted power, all because he wanted this same governorship position that we are fighting for as ethnic minorities. When you look at the presidency, a large number of these other ethnic, semi-ethnic um, groups that you may not really call them. Uh, it's the same game plan, right? So first of all, when we engage in a lot of these debates, we see that it goes downhill from there. You always pitch, they always use us as um, to pitch us against the major ethnic groups. Because you know that once you, lead, once you, once you pour gasoline and you light that match, it is all over. The entire thing crumbles. We have been used as tools for far too long. When you when when you even listen to that that statement that um, we will be used as tools, um, it goes deeper than just the the using of dominating someone and using them. It also means pitching them against other people too. Right? Go to Benue State. Look at um, the Thief people and look at the Idoma people too. Most of the people, the Idoma, the Igede, the Itilo. What are their what are their major issues? The major issues is also the governorship position. Go to Nasrawa State. What's happening in Nasrawa State between the Igon, the Alago? The Igon and the Alago don't even look each other in the eye. They have brought settlers to become governor. Because they cannot even seem to agree. So let let them, since we cannot agree, let just let the settler just have the thing, have the governorship at least. We will support anybody. We rather even die than support any one of us. Let us let it let it let settlers just continue to rule us if not like so. Go to Benue State. Is it not the same thing? Why did Benue State turn turn in its on its head? It's still the same disagreement between the Thief, the Idomas, the the and the other ethnic nations. Go to Taraba State. What's happening in Taraba State? Between the Mumiyes the Jukun and the other ethnic uh, nationalities. So we have always been used as pitted against one another. Same thing with the South, with, with the South South. Right? So the first thing is, and, and, and largely most of the conversations are even here on Clubhouse. It's not like we don't understand because largely a lot of us have read widely. We do understand that there's this formation of this empire. But the thing is that our differences take um, take 
priority over this empire. And the thing is that the empire building in Nigeria should take priority over any individual beef. You have proud egos. It should take priority over any historical squabble because in the end, all of us are launched, right? So that's the first. That's the first thing that I just wanted to say. Now, the thing is that, like I said, everyone has a role to play in this, right? So the role of a large number of these intellectuals that we see from the north is to deceive that's their role a large number a large number of these people that i've seen on on clubhouse here their aim is to deceive us so when you talk about headsmen attack most of them refer to bandit attacks they are not the same thing they are different militias different goals different objectives the people that are attacking in um, communities in the Middle Belt and in Southern Nigeria, there was this heat map I used to have on my profile that showed the different groups and showed their territories. Large numbers of these genocidal massacres, the taking over of homes in the Middle Belt that has pushed to places like Ebonye, that have pushed to places um, in the Southwest, in Oyo State and in all these places, Gongong, um, Yewa, those communities, those are not bandits right the aim is to deceive them and this is what i usually till today since i came on clubhouse i always give this example i said when did boko haram start boko haram started in 2008 2009 fine okay most of this bandit um i mean most of these headsmen attack these full name ethnic militias they have been going in places in plateau state going in places in southern katana before 2009 show me if if you say this thing is not ethnic cleansing if you say this thing has no ethnic connotation show me where both 2008 fulani ethnic militias have gone into those communities and killed fulani people show me give till today i haven't gotten an, an answer and that shows you that a large number of these people just come to deceive you to just mix bandit attacks when i talk about my killing they talk about their own killing they are killing us no the attackers are actually very different. The intent, as, as I keep saying, is to model up the killings, to deceive, right? So until we start um, understanding that this Nigerian empire, we all have a, a role in it. The people in the Middle Belt will always be under the people in the North, according to the way they have structured this empire, including our land. What was the first thing the British did when, when, and this thing started immediately? The British took down parts of um, Plateau State in the 1900s. Communities like Gindri, the first thing they did was to put Fulani over that land. Lands that Fulani have never been able to uh, uh, occupy. They tried negotiation, they tried treaties, they tried invasion, they tried everything to those communities. They couldn't. And I used to share articles on this. The first thing they did, so the British and their co-conspirators would always continue because they have, they have always had favorites. If you're on Twitter and you listen to this man called Onye Nkuzi, he always says that every country in Africa has had its um, favorites and has the people that are not the favorite. The people of, of um, New Belt, the people of um, Southern Nigeria would never be the favorites of these people, no matter how many no, no matter how you think you have the same Christian um, um, uh, ideology with these people, they would still never have that relationship with you. And it's, it stems from a long colonial history with your ethnic group. It doesn't depend on you. So the, the, the more we start to understand that position, the larger we begin to move um, forward as a people. The larger we start to look and 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 this is something when I started speaking to people in the middle belt and and I I, usu I usually hear a lot of these complaints of marginalization from the smaller ethnic groups. If you go to Kogi and you see the Igalas, the Igalas, and you look at all this, I start to tell them, look, if there's a middle belt and state, this is how it will be structured. 
usually do not hear feedback. But when you delve into discussions of this guy is a doma, this guy is thief, this guy is this, this is what these guys have done to us, you lose the plot from there. So even engaging intellectually and engaging strategically is something that we actually do have to do. We actually are looking at, in fact, the large number of studies have shown that Nigeria would implode in the next couple of years. Right? So there's actually even no time to be going on this fruitless uh, debate. We actually need to move. And that's why I've been reaching out to a large number of my people. Right, It's really hard getting them, but it's actually a journey. Right, A large number of the people have the ideology. They understand what is going on, but they need an extra push. And I can assure you that pushing them aggressively or pushing them through insults would not work. Right, so everybody needs to even understand the demographic of people that they are even dealing with. The way you push some a Talakawa person will be different from the way you push a middle belt person. The way you push a middle belt person will actually be different. Now, lastly, let me touch on something. The same format um, when the jihad started, because these people, who are the people they look up to? They look up to a large number of these people that were successful in their jihads. When you look at the way they invade, um, the bandits invade with uh, their motorcycle, it's similar to the way the horses, they use the horses to invade the communities. The same way Agatu communities in the Middle Belt um, and, and a large number of the um, Igala communities fell because a large number of the settlers in the city um, collaborated with these groups to fall. It's the same thing that is happening. When that lady from Saduna came, and was thinking about the bandit kidnapping. What did she say? She said um, a large number of the neighbors in those communities were the ones that pinpointed um, the Christians and, and um, the, the indigenous people, and the bandits came and performed those kidnappings. So to solve this problem oriented, right, to solve these problems, you actually do need to look at the history, look at the history of uh, and, and what informs these views, look at the tactics and how those people in the past countered it. And you can also come up with your own solutions on, to, on how to tackle um, these cases, right? Look at the policies on land, look at the, 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 the land policies, look at how it affects um, these, these um, numbers, these groups of people. In the Middle Belt, in, in, in a couple of years, you would have people that claim to be indigenous from the Middle Belt. You have large numbers of these groups that set up shacks in southern Nigeria, and this is what I keep saying we should be wary of. Um, you actually do need to be conscious of your communities. You actually do need to be conscious. Uh, even as a minimum, you actually do need to be conscious of who you hire as your security guard, because these are the people that point out those communities, point out um, who stays in those communities, similar to the, the, the issues of old, right? So we actually, as a minimum, have to actually be conscious of our community. So community policing is what we continue to preach. Community po policing means who comes um, to your community. You actually do need to be aware of those um, people. You actually do need to be aware of the people that you hire, right? So um, before I round up, there's the icon um, app that you should also go and um, share documenting a lot of these killings because um, we have seen on the international stage that largely these people deny these massacres. So documentation um, is quite important when we push um, for self-determination, when we push for our own nation state. So I'll just um, end there, thanks. Thank you so much, um, Patrick. It's, hmm, it's always a remember a, a reminder of the reality we live in today whenever you speak from where we have to kind of remember that um, we don't live in the future neither do we live in the past we live in today we are a lot of things we tend to close our eyes to keep happening like in some cases uh, we will remember that we are still living in um the in 1800s in some cases yeah um once they get this um, think about first people please ping in your friends and um, colleagues and even your enemies to come and listen to this conversation just 
for us, based on the topic, we are um, discussing the creation of the Nigerian Empire and the fate of the indigenous people um, of that land. And yeah, as indigenous people, what is our fate in the world today? As we can look across the world, especially within the African and the American continent, what are the fate of the indigenous people as compared to others? And should we keep suffering this particular fate? Should we let um, these um, empires we built on us? blood, our, our tears, uh, on our lands, where we are kind of, where we are continuously expected for it. So, yeah, um, bringing your friends, your, your family to come and listen. Um, you can find us on um, Facebook, on um, Twitter, YouTube, our TikTok has exploded. You people, you don't listen. You should really, really join us there as well. Uh, yeah, and also follow the club if you haven't, so that you can get notification of, um, Future rooms, future fields to kind of just the past, the present, and future. And how do we pray about it? Um, if we check out the places, if we have just rooms there, we had the discussion two two episodes actually focus on tech, focus on. Uh, the need for us to take uh, things seriously. We had a discussion also. Um, is it on Thursday or Friday? That's current affairs where we take a look at the speech given by the UK Foreign Secretary, um, Liz, Liz Truss. Oh my God, I can't pronounce her name for the life of me. Forgive me. So, yeah, so just follow the club so you get any such rooms. In the coming week, we'll be holding rooms, a few more geopolitical rooms and a few more normal rooms. So please follow us on our social media platforms as well so that you can actually get the notification um, as the room starts or as also we start streaming so you can always come and join us. Um, um, yeah, uh, I will go next to um, I can share. I don't know if um, you're available to share. I'm I'm not I'm busy right now. I'm okay, just man, listening. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Aye. Yeah. He, so because we want to go back to our uh, and we yeah. are just we are just going to clock to our soon and we like to go back to our uh, to kind of answer the questions, can you submission? So you can just take five minutes and we'll just do that towards the end because we still have more time at the end of it for everybody to kind of share their ideas. So go ahead, Mr. Aye. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I just want to, you know, share uh, something, you know. I was on uh, Twitter space about three weeks ago, and uh, everything we've been saying here, uh, I really was not there. No, I, think, I don't think anybody here was there. I think Obadi was there, and they were talking about Alizin being into Nigeria development. So I went up and I was like, what is even the definition of tribalism and all that? So after I stopped talking, a guy, he sounded like a youth, maybe in his uh, 20s. He started saying something, like uh, he even wants something that uh, uh, in order to curtail tribalism, he, he mentioned three things that must be done in Nigeria. First, people were laughing, but then I thought deeply, what this guy actually said, these things are, are very, very strong. These that are dangerous. And I don't know where that guy got that information or the knowledge from. The first thing he said, he said ethnic languages should be scrapped and then we should uh, have pidgin and, all, and English only. Then the second thing he said was, I even said that is a linguist. Okay. It doesn't care. Now the said is that uh, ethnicity should be banned. That people should not uh, refer themselves to as Yoruba or whatever. And in forms, there should not be anything like state of uh, uh, state of uh, what's the name now? State of origin. There should be something like state of residence. Wherever you live, you are from there. That guy actually said that. Now the third thing that he said is that. Nigeria should be invaded by a larger country, just like Russia and Ukraine war. Like a country should invade Nigeria so that all of us 
we leave our ethnic nationality and everything because of that external enemy and then face it and drop all our ethnicity aside for a common goal. He said he doesn't care if people died and all that, that people should just invade Nigeria. Uh, like a country, bigger country should invade Nigeria, bully us, so that all of us, it will, call, it will cause a coercion. Now, the impact of that was that people were saying, people were like, good, good, good. You are saying good thing, right? But I was like, for this kind of guy to have said this, I've never heard it from even the Yahusa Fulani guys. Right? This guy is a southern that said these three things, three major uh, uh, um, uh, conditions or how to make how to make this Nigerian empire. And I was just thinking in my mind, since then I have never forgotten. Like if this guy could give this kind of uh, speech, and all these our politicians and all whatever, I know they know that already, anyways. But I was just like, who gave this guy this kind of? like this kind of uh, 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 information how to how to create an empire nigerian empire because that was very very tough for me that i uh, i i was just kind of disturbed after hearing that so that's what i just have to share and if i like to talk about that because after hearing that on um, twitter space i got to know that twitter is not People are they are actually smoking opium of Nigerian state over the Nigerian unity, Nigerian dream, the opium, the 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 the, the, the what would I call it now? Uh, the the activism. They are just they are they are they are living on it on that hope. That's Thank hope you. Of potential of Nigeria. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hai. Uh, Maria, I don't want to take all the questions that uh, that has been asked so far now. Do you want to add a few? More? Yeah, let me um, quickly respond. Uh, thank you, everybody, once again. I greet you all in the name of Ulodumare. We welcome you all into Think Yoruba first. And I greet all the erudite scholars on stage and in the audience. Uh, we will be happy if you also come and join us to share your thoughts. Um, this is not a lecture. It's a discourse. Um, because um, this is what pertains to the survival of every one of us. Nobody should be left out. Even though there is still a second uh, part or third part to my discussion, where I will be juxtaposing and drawing parallels with uh, uh, the situation of the Nigerian state. Now, the first question that was asked by my comrade Kemi, if he's still here, oh, comrade Kemi is still here. When he asked the question, what it takes to be white, Wiping out of indigenous people is not a new thing. In fact, there are close to three Yoruba ethnic um, Yoruba tribes that have been wiped out and that are currently being wiped out. Uh, when people talk about the Yoruba people, uh, as big as we are, uh, we are a nation comprises of different tribes. Some Yoruba tribes have also gone Distinction. Just two, three incidents or four incidents or two, three occurrence is capable of wiping out Kiti people, the Oyo people, the Eda people, and the Igbomina people, the Jebu people. So don't think because you've ate Pandediam today in your little sitting room and you're listening to me or you sitting in Amalan Begiri, you cannot be wiped out. What the way the world works in two in 1804, the way the world works in um 1400 is not different from the way the world is working in 2022. There is a particular Yoruba tribe that used to be preparing in current day Togo and Benin Republic. They call them Isha people. The Isha people, I think they were totally free by the Daume people. So many of the Yoruba descendants of Brazil, Cuba, United States of America, Barbados, Colombia, they were from the Isha people. So they were ethnically uprooted and wiped out. So when it comes to Yoruba assembly, the issue no longer exists. I'm going, I'm going to talk about that. 
maybe in one of our rooms so that Yoruba people can actually know there's fire on the mountain. Uh, two, another Yoruba people that were, you know, so that was exterminated using force, slavery, genocide, and um, subjugation. Another Yoruba people that were also wiped out uh, are the, another Yoruba group called the Gedefi people. The Gedefi people are also indigenous uh, uh, to, the, to the place called Benin Republic now. In fact, they used to be the biggest uh, ethnic nationality in, um, in Benin Republic uh, for close to 500 years, 600 years, in that area called Benin Republic. And um, how were they wiped out? How were they exterminated? They were exterminated via intermarriage. So they intermarried with um, a migrating group. You know, They gave them lands. They welcomed a particular clan of the Ewe ethnic group, E-W-E, Ewe ethnic group. That is the largest ethnic group in current day Togo. So because they have Yoruba affinity, they also have Ile Ife. So, so they, are same, they allow the Ewe people to see this tribe called the Aja tribe. So because they were in the central place, too, so that they allowed them, they, you know, they started living, they, they, they accepted them into their midst. And within 200 years, a new ethnic nationality and ethnic identity were formed, which was called the Fon people. When you hear Egun, Egun people are an intermarriage between a Yoruba ethnic group and the Yewe ethnic group. They are hybrid. So imagine the uh, just the way you call the Yoruba and Fulani intermarriage in Ilon, we call them Gambari. So the Yoruba and Ewe ethnic group create and the Gedefi tribe of the Yoruba people. You know, Yoruba people have different tribes. So the Gede, just like your people, Egba people intermarrying with the Igbos, you create a different ethnic group. So the Yoruba uh Gedefi people intermarrying with the uh, Ewe ethnic group led to the total extermination of um millions of um, millions, one of the biggest Yoruba tribe called the Gedefi people, and they no longer exist as an independent ethnic group today. So they are created Daume. So they are a hybrid of Yoruba people. And that was how the Gedefi people went into extinction. So that's how people go into extinction, Mr. Kenny. Um, by marriage, when you, when you want to practice humanity more than God, you want to be insane in the name of egalitarianism, and you don't want to be called sensitive, conscious, and protecting your space, you know, without being politically correct. This is what this is what happens. Anybody can marry what they want, you can marry anybody they want, but you do not do it at the expense of practicing ethnocide or genocide. So how do so after, so there are two fundamental ways, two fundamental ways in which you can wipe out people. You can wipe out people. So those are two Yoruba people that have been wiped out. So the, we also we have other Yoruba people that are also currently being wiped out. Uh, the Sabe people are almost um, ninety percent of them were also um, taken out. So when I said that anybody can be wiped out any day, um, close to eight million Ukrainians. Ukraine Ukrainian identity is an ethnic identity, not uh, just a name of a country. It is an ethnicity that came out of the Russian ethnicity. Russian or the Slavic entity. So that was how Ukrainian identity was forged and formed. It was created out of conquest. So the destruction of people creates another identity. Just like the way the when you call about the Ibadan, it's almost a tribe, a subgroup, a subtribe within the larger Yoruba group, even within the Oyo uh, tribe. So it was created out of the fall of the Oyo Empire 200 years ago. It was created out of war. So when they destroy you, it creates, it changes you. So the conquest of the Igbos, the Yorubas, created Nigerian identity. And when they, that's why you see that those who are powerful in the world, they continually use violence. They continually use uh, genocide to continually to protect who they are. So the use of violence is a very good weapon, a very good tool to any superpower. If you want to last, you need to use violence. The Fulanis are using violence. This is why we are here. We are. So those of you that continually go to church on Sunday, we are, I'm not going to interrupt Christianity. And you've been brainwashed using because of the bio colonial security and uh, Christianity. 
that your weapon of war is spirituality. When they put a pistol to the back of your head, continue to shout peace, you'll be wiped out and the world will move on. They will wipe you out, the world will move on. It doesn't matter, maybe it's the Muslim killing Christians, the Christians killing Muslims, the Hindu killing Christians, the Hindu Christians killing Muslims. When you look at countries like Sudan, Kush, Asian Kush, um, those areas of Morocco, uh, Egypt, all those places, Syria, Lebanon, um, area of Palestine, those area, even Yemen, those places used to be historically Christian centers, Christian empires, Christian empires, Christian civilization. What happened to them? Gone, Turkey, Byzantine, to a Central Asia, Central Europe, they were wiped out. And they were replaced by a new civilization, new spirituality, and a new people. You know, that is the way the world works. So those who survive this world are those who are not politically correct with their survivor, those who are not politically correct with their existence, those who know that there is fire on the mountain. So you have to understand that those who are currently killing people with KK-47 in the bush, you can continue to cause them from now to tomorrow. If you don't defend yourself, you are gone. If you don't promote self-defense, you are gone. And people will forget you. When people are we putting double barrel anti-aircraft um, guns, uh, grenades, sophisticated weapons, you know, automatic rifles, you know, taking over your land, taking over your resources, rigging election, installing Supreme Court gov governors to steal your gas, to steal your resources. And some Nikon poops with red bullets are telling very beret are telling you PVC. It's insanity. BBC has never given anybody, any indigenous people, freedom anywhere in the world. Until the indigenous people are, you to, you are going to control their society. You see what is happening in Ukraine. The reason why the Ukrainians are doing what they are doing with the support of the West, because they know via election, they will never be able to control their destiny. Because the Russian speaking people will always vote. And due to the constitution of Ukraine, they will always block and have political power over the other Ukrainians. So what did they do? They needed to use uh, violence. They, they needed to do everything necessary to control things within the Ukrainian society. So you have to understand the way it works. So the use of violence is a very good weapon to further your advantage, to further your goal. So I think I've been able to use so ethnic assimilation and genocide. So how do you practice ethnic assimilation? You ban language. You want to destroy people, you want to wipe them out. I've started asking your question. I, I'm answering your question, Aya Kamara. You ban the, the language, you ban the culture, you ban the spirituality, you destroy people, you, 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 you subjugate them, you, 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 you whitewash their history, you change their history. Those are things you do. You weaponize poverty against them. You make them poor. You know, all these things are, are, are preponderant within the Nigerian uh, context. Um, I think because there's a lot to talk about. Should I continue, Mr. Michael, so that I can finish the second part and I wait for the third part? So, oh, yes, yes. center. The empire that they built will collapse in one year. So a powerful center where they will control the police, they will control the seaports, they will control the gas, they will control the crude oil, they will control the international affairs, they will control currency, they will control economic policies, they will control agricultural policies, they will control everything. It's important in the extension of Utmadam Fodio Jihad. So it's very, very important. A very very important to, to, to create a powerful center. So you see, Nigeria is as a powerful center. And you see, with the powerful center, people are losing their ethnic identity. People are gradually shifting and ready to, to, to destroy who they are. They are not legitimizing their, their destruction. 
they are legitimizing they are in slavery and um, they are becoming irrational trying to create rationality out of irrationality so um the, yeah so so that is that is the situation of things so that is what an empire does so when we talk about imperialism and some people think we over on overestimate the power of the full learners. we are not overestimating their power we are saying calling them what they are the full are imperialists and i'm going to define an imperialist for you um an imperialist this is oxford dictionary an imperial imperialism is an idea of a major power controlling another nation or land with the intention to use the native people and the resources i repeat it is an idea of a major power controlling another nation or land with the intentions to use the native people and resources. So when you see a Fulani controlled Nigerian polity, bringing, appointing Fulanis to be end, to be heading NNPC, the crude oil coming from the Niger Delta, that's imperialism. The Fulanis to be controlling the Nigerian Port Authority in Lagos, that's imperialism. You know, you 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 when the Fulani come into a space, conquer a space, and all of a sudden you see people like uh, El Rufai and other st state governors in the north creating emirates over the indigenous people. That is imperialism. The Fulani people becoming the emir of Ilorin over the indigenous Yoruba people. They, that is imperialism. The Fulanis becoming the sultan and emirs over the indigenous Hausa people in Niger and, and, and the contraption in Niger Republic and Nigeria, that is imperialism. So you see that there is, there is no fundamental difference between the outlook of the Fulanese when it comes to the treatment of indigenous people and the British and any other European power or any occupying power. So it's all they are imperialists in 2022. That is why they tell you, in as much Nigeria continues, the oil will continue to flow from the south to the north. The gas will continue to flow from the south to the north. And they are not just talking, they are making it happen. Because they've been able, they've looked at the weakest and the most ridiculous and the most terrible class in our midst. Give them education. It doesn't, look, let me tell you something. There are some people that it doesn't matter, maybe they attend Harvard, they are attend. Uh, 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 Oxford, they attend any kind of advanced education or university. They will continue to be anti their people. So these are the people they empower. They give them billions of dollars, billions of money, give them contract and give them access to both local and international power, 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 power centers so that they will continue to say, well, we are speaking for our people. So we are speaking for our people. So they know this are not, they are not speaking for their people. They are destroying their people. They, they, they lie, they do all sorts of things. This Ukrainian-Russian war has shown that the West, the, the, the Anglo-Saxon dominated world order is, uh, is nothing. It's nothing but an empire of lies. So it's, um, they are imperialists. And I'm gonna talk about the Athenian empire. So before the Greek empire that was uh, led by Alexander the Great, that uh, fantastic uh, Greek general, there was already, there was an Athenian empire. So there was um, a league of different Greek city-states. They call it the Delia League that was um, established in 476 BC. So the Delia League came together and they said, okay, let us come together and let us form um, a confederacy. It was a confederacy, that's why I'm not interested uh, uh, somebody like me would never be interested in any form of uh, uh, restructuring. That's a bit of truth because you look at history, it's the same. It's the same. It's still going to revert to the old status quo. So in the Delian League, so the Macedonians came, the Spartans came, the Athenians came, the Tyre, you know, different people came in order to face Persia because Persia wanted to cover that axis so that Persia would be able to, to, to cement their power as the unipolar world power in that axis of the Mediterranean. So they, 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 so they came together that if we fight individually, because Persia was using the disunity amongst the different Greek city-states against the Greeks. So they came together and everybody was, okay, let us come together, let us work together. But while they were doing this and fighting against Persia, 
The Spartans, we all know Spartans. We've watched the film Spartacus. Spartans were the best in military warfare. But when it comes to craftsmanship, the Athenians were the best, even though it came to backfire. So the resources and the money they were keeping together, Athens was using it to build its own hegemony. So while they were fighting Persia and defending their land against Persia, Athens was already planning. If we defeat Persia, what happens? So what happens after? They will not be the new Persian superpower, uh, uh, Greek superpower. Where well, that era empire will now be called the Athenian Empire, because the Persians, be, uh, Athenians people, uh, believe believe that they are more civilized and they are more intellectual and more uh, destined. They are destined to lead compared to the other uh, uh, Greek city states. So the other uh, Greek city state did not know what was happening to that confederacy. So immediately, immediately that. Uh, empire finished immediately that um, immediately that war against Persia finished the next thing they did was to uh, um, immediately they defeated uh, Xerxes of Persia the Athenian exact power and they started ordering the other city, the Greek city states left and right so it's not different from what happened in Nigeria the different ethnic bloc and the major ethnic ethnicity came together let us fight against the British let us fight against the British. Even though the Greek city state still had some modicum of um, uh, 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 synonymous civilization, the other ethnic nationalities within Nigeria have nothing in common, absolutely nothing in common. But they still came together so, and to fight against the British. Why many people were fighting against the British, the different, some ethnic groups were already fighting. What will happen after us? We must control Nigeria. We must turn Nigeria to the estate of our grandfather, Utma Danfodio. Other people were also thinking of um, other people were also thinking of how they were going to, you know, become Pan-Africanist and become the Zeke of Africa. That was what Azikwe was absolutely true. That's the bitter truth. He wanted to create his own legacy. He wanted to become, you know, and this is, has always been a big problem, even within the Igbo nationalist struggle, the Afran struggle, even the Yoruba nationalist struggle. You see, people right within a particular struggle they are with the, when the struggle we don't even know maybe the struggle is going to take 10 20 30 40 50 years they're already cooking up how they are going to hijack the struggle kill many people as possible defame as many people as possible destroy as many people as possible in order to create their own empire so this was the game so immediately that happened fortunately for spartacus uh, for the spartans they still had their own military strength they were able to fight against the athenian and they destroyed the athenian empire that we will not leave Persian hegemony, Persian empire to come under you while you are using all sorts of tricks and all sorts of lies, all sorts of lie and, and coerciveness to lure us and turn us into your eternal slave. So that was how the Athenian empire was destroyed. So I gave this example of the create of the, to, to draw a similarity between um, the Oyo empire, the, 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 the Nigerian empire and the Athenian empire. So the, let me also tell you something. It is possible for a particular empire to create, to be very, very big. And a breakaway province can also declare itself an empire. So that Nigeria was with, with the British empire does not mean uh, that Nigeria is not an empire. The United States, which is an empire, broke away from British um, empire and declared itself as an empire. The reason why they did not have an emperor was that they were against the monarchy. And they modeled the United States system after the Roman Republic. And that is why you see the Roman Republic led by the Ciceros and all the Isoretos, you know, they were not different from the empires that were led by Augustus Caesar or Julius Caesar. It's the same. Or Calvin, it's, 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 it's the same. So the, and you see, that is why you need to be very scared. Those who want to create the Nigerian empire copied the United States of America. In fact, the Nigeria is more brutal than the United States of America because it has a centralized structure. Why the United States does not have a centralized structure? Now, let me tell you why the United States does not have a centralized structure. If the British 
if the if the United States of America was like uh was like was like Nigeria, they were going to do something. The ethnic composition. They needed to have this centralized structure while they continue to decimate the internal ethnic constituents within Nigeria. So what am I saying? Before, before the part, before Nigeria was formed, uh, before the United States of America could practice true federalism, the Anglo-Saxon settlers, the European settlers, had already done two things. They've already exterminated. I'm talking about killing, massive killing of a uh, killing of 80 to 90 percent of the indigenous people so those ones were already suya sorry to use that word they were already gone you know they were gay so they were gone they were gay you know the black americans were already enslaved enslaved and were already gentrified you look at the population of black americans in america almost over 40 million and they don't even have a single state to themselves. Not a single state that they could that we are going to say this is a black American state where they can black American state in the United States of America, where they can protect their rights, where they can protect who they are. No single state in America. Do you know why they did it? They broke them into pieces. And they were not allowed to be what? To be, to be, to be, to be, to be, to be on the same block, just like you have in, in, in Brazil. In Brazil, you go to places like Bahia, you think you are in Yoruba land. The only thing is that they speak Portuguese. You go to places like um, El Salvador, you think you are in Yoruba land. Even some places in Sao Paulo, these are hard core, you know, where you have Yoruba civilization being protected at, at you go to Eastern Cuba, the same thing. Where Yoruba preservation is being well, 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 is very well protected. But this is the problem. The Americans, black, white Americans, Caucasian Americans, actually saw the future. So the United, the indigenous people must not, the indigenous people must not have a state. That was why they destroyed the white. So the indigenous people must not have a state, and the black Americans must not have at least two states. So if two American, black American people have, uh, have states. Two, if two and um, black American people have states, that means it may America disintegrate tomorrow. The black people in America can actually move out and have another extension bridge for black people, people of color in that part of the world. So they sought into the future. So they make sure that it was called, I call that particular agenda. I call it, I, it can either be called the gentrification of the black people in America or the minoritization, minoritization of the black people in America. They repeated the same thing in Nigeria. Let me tell you what they did in Nigeria. You see the thief people broke some of them into Taraba, broke some of them into Benue, broke some of them into Nasarawa, broke them into pieces so that they can ever, they can never have a united front and a united power in to be able to be for, to in, in order to order their own uh, uh, agenda and to be able to talk as one as one voice so the person the chief people so there's no chief states in nigeria so the chief man in nasarawa we call himself i'm a nasarawa man meanwhile it's, it's not called nasarawa man he's a chief man the chief man in taraba taraba we call himself i'm a chief man I'm a taraba man meanwhile he's a chief and the chief man in benue we call himself a Benway man. Meanwhile, there's nothing called a Benway man. He's a thief. So he has been destroyed. He has been gentrified. He has been minoritized. Just the way what they did to, they did it to the close to 50 ethnic groups and tribes in, in the Middle Belt. In the Middle Belt. The same thing they did in the South South. People where they call the South South. The Igbo people of Ben, Igbo speaking people of, uh, of, 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 um, of, of, uh, of, uh, of 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 Edo of Edo, of Edo state they call them Ibanke. They don't want to regard them as Igbos. There's a lot of the uh, thing going on there. Their names they have been forced to change their names so that they do not see themselves as Igbos. The same thing that they are doing in Delta. You are going to even see ethnic minorities threatening other ethnic minorities. Why they should never never join other ethnic 
or there are other people in the, in the bigger blocks to identify with them politically in, or, in, or, in, or in any form of ethnic nationalism. It's, you think it's not working, it's working. To the extent that you are going to see somebody bearing Chidi Ebele, uh, Kelechuku, uh, Uche, come out to say, yes, I'm Uche, Ugo Chuku, but I'm not Higbo. All sort of mental, yeah, that is the level, that is what identity crisis can do. That was what they did in the United States of America. So the Shekiri will not be able to have a block, to have a state, to fight for their own political right. The European people, people will not be able to do that. The Soko people will not be able to do that. The Ogoni people is not, will, not be, will not be able to do that. Never. They will never have their right. You go to places like Southern Kebi, Southern Bauchi, Southern, uh, uh, go to Plateau. That was another case, messed up place entirely. Same thing in Adamawa, Southern Adamawa. You go to all those places. Which I call the uncompleted, un, un, incomplete mission, because it's not easy to kill millions of people. You are going to kill and kill and kill till you get tired. So when they kill, because you think it's very, do you know how many bullets you are going to use to kill a lot of people, to kill millions of people? So that is why the most potent weapon of wiping people out in the Americans and in Australia was poison and uh, and uh, and and biological weapon. That's why you see that even in modern warfare. They say that nobody should use chemical weapon and biological weapon because those are the weapon that are nuclear weapon. Those are the weapon that are capable of wiping people out in their millions within the short period of time. So using bullets is not easy. So what do you do? Use bullets to do is to kill ten to twenty percent. Use instill fear. Use state terrorism and not state terrorism. Instill fear into that indigenous populace, and you now displace the population, displace them. They will be culturally assimilated, and you now take over the space. And when you take over their space, their population will diminish. They will shrink, and they will what? They will be assimilated. Simple. So that was what has been done. That's what was done in the Russian Empire. The same thing was done in the Chinese Empire. So that was what was done. So um, uh, I want. How do you how to maintain? Uh, uh, an established and imperial political structure. So for you to maintain this Nigerian structure, this Nigerian empire, you need to do the following thing. There are, there are two ways. And I'm going to give you instances. How America does it, how Russia does it. So that's why I said this world is full of, it's, it's full of hypocrites. The international rule of law, all those laws you're talking about is all hypocrisy. Some people are above the law because they created that law. That's why you see Russia saying, you don't tell me which law to create. We, after this World War II, we created this law together. China also said we created this order together. We will not obey your law. You are not going to be our head. So, and they say, oh, these are dictators, these are crap, these are all lies. Because America is a reminiscence of the Roman Empire. That's what it does, that's what it is, does. So I'm gonna tell you, um, how to make how this political imperial state maintain its political structure. And you are going to see what Nigeria does. Nigeria has practiced the two styles. So in order for heat to survive, that was why they shifted to the current style. For close to 40 years of Nigeria's existence, or let me say more than um, 30 years of Nigeria's existence, it used the first style. The first style is the direct use of brute force, chaos, and conquest to maintain an empire in order to exploit the non-mineral resources and to exploit the indigenous people. So Nigeria has used direct force. And how did they use direct force during the military regime? They just do what they like. Look at what they did to the people of Ogoni. 4,000 people were wiped out. Ken Sarabiwa was killed. His neck was hanged three times. They used acid to burn his body. You know, our political assassinations left and right. People were jailed without trial. You know, this, the military boys were used to, to create state, write constitution, destroy people's land, write the land use act to seize lands from indigenous people across, across, across the left and breadth of Nigeria because the, the Fulanese that did not own any land wanted to control land. And the Europeans wanted the resources. You understand? So this was what was done, the direct use of force. So that is no longer very visible because some, some Southern intellectuals said no, because the Southern intellectuals understood, some Southern intellectuals understood that their greed will not protect them in what is about to happen, in about to happen. And um, they, so they understood that they needed 
to say they want democracy because within democracy they can still fight so the second method is the indirect control by the use of political power that is what we are currently the fullness are currently using so that's why anytime there is a time they want to go back to um there is a there is a time that there is a need to return back to democracy the first thing the fullani hegemony does is to write a, another constitution they make sure they create another Janja good constitution in that will not be the reflection of the will of the people but the will of the conquering force so when the we wanted to move you know from the first republic to the second republic i'm talking about before there was democracy between 1978 in nigeria there was a 1976-77 constitution ably supervised by the fulani in order to protect their own agenda the same thing was done you know being between 1998 to 1999 when they saw the game was up and it was going to the, the indigenous people the major ethnic bloc especially the yoruba people were going to push accurately for self-determination they knew if they responded with violence that was the end of the country so that was the end of their empire so they knew that the war can go on for 10 years but that empire will be destroyed and every other ethnic nationalities will start taking saying saying they don't want to be part of the empire again and the loss of that western bloc means that is death of the full and empire so the people said let us go back to democracy we can also they because they they are reading the the they are reading a blueprint from the british everything they do from the they are well well vast they are well taught go and read about stephen Owen, the, the empire these are ways in which you build empire so they build the indirect method and in the indirect method so use political power so rigging elections is part of the political power you can go to the supreme court and remove people you know and bring somebody that became fought and put him into the state that has the richest gas deposit in west africa because the west was already preparing for the war against russia and they needed that gas to sustain their industrialization and uh, industrialization but they didn't emphasize that mali russia was also playing, going to play hardball with mali so you are looking for how you are going to take that pipeline you know, how, you know there will be a war a lot of war in the sahel in the next um, 10 20 years so that place will become destabilized that there is simply no um, no no pipe, pipeline that will pass from that place to europe unfortunately they are war they are going to bring it to our doorstep so this is the bitter truth because he who controls africa will rule the world and they understand why africa is very very important the total the berlin west african conference and the control of africa was the basis and the foundation of european greatness your sorrow is your greatness you know you have to understand that so i want to use an example how so that the people that talk about election you are going to understand that they are they are being accomplice you know i don't want to use bad words unfortunate and complice to the destruction of their people in the Holy Roman Empire, there were imperial elections. There were elections in the Holy Roman Empire in the 13th, 14th century. There were imperial elections. People vote in order to elect the emperor. It's Nigerian, so it's, it doesn't matter the semantics. An emperor can be the Oba of Benin. An emperor can be the Alash of Oyo. An emperor can be the Shah of Iran. An emperor can be the King of Saudi Arabia. An emperor can become, but can be the, the the queen of england an emperor can be case case the case of, of german, german empire an emperor can be the chancellor of austria an emperor can be the united president of the united states of america an emperor can be the prime minister of britain it doesn't matter the time too it doesn't matter the emperor emperor, emperor can be the sultan of of, of Shokoto. The emperor can be the El Kanemi of Bonu, Cheo of Bonu. Those are emperors, acted in the position of emperors. The term is different. That is why neocolonialism is dangerous, because they have hidden neocolonialism, and you are not able to see through what is being happening. So the president of the United of the United States of America is an emperor, because United States of America is an empire. The president of Nigeria is an emperor. That is why you, that is why you see 
that no matter who gets to that position of power, every riffraff, every unfortunate people, maybe pastor, uh, even anybody that is religious, it doesn't matter, even anybody that you see that is even sane, wants to become the president of Nigeria at all costs. Because they know what it takes. That is the most powerful. Because it is a, like the United States of America that is decimating indigenous people with a centralized power that the United States of America does not even have with unlimited resources to do and undo. So that is why the, 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 the Fulanis do not joke with it. So what have they been able to do with it, this indirect power? They've, they've, they've been able to rig elections, state creations, local government creation, changing of identity. So they've changed, who did all these things. They've created Nigeria in their image and likeness. The British first created Nigeria in their own image. The Fulanis went further with what they started in 1804 to create Nigeria in their image and likeness. And they will not be in short supply of collaborators amongst us if we do not wage war against the collaborators and the Fulanis themselves. That's a bit of truth. That's a bit of truth. Leave the British. By the time we wage war against the internal collaborators and the British and the Fulani, the British will be forced to come and negotiate, negotiate with the winning team. That is what they do. They don't give a damn. Don't think the Fulani, the British are interested in um, continue, continue their support with it. If the Igbos do the same thing and become the major ethnic bloc, the major uh, imperial power in Nigeria, the, 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 the British will support them. If the Fulani wipe out 99% of Nigeria now and take it over, the Fulani will support them. In as much the oil flows, the crude oil flows, and the gas flows, the resources flow, you know, the money flows, you know, the diamonds, the gold is going to them. And they have no business. If you like, become the Islamic state of Nigeria. They don't give a damn. In as much the resources flow, they don't care about democracy or all these human rights. They don't care. The reason why they push you to practice Western democracy is that when you practice that democracy, it is very easy for you them to manipulate you any day, any time. That was why it was very easy for the West to get rid of Imran Khan in Pakistan. You think Saudi Arabia was practicing a kind of a democracy? You think they would never have gotten rid of the leader of Saudi Arabia? They would have done it very, very difficult. So, you, and you don't need 100% conquest before you totally exterminate the people. Many people don't know that 20% of the population of Yemen are black people. Do you see them on television? No. Same thing in Pakistan. Same thing in Pakistan. So it is very, very difficult. So it is very, very difficult to, to, to know that those people exist. Now, let's, um, uh, I'm trying to, I'm talking about uh, 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 the, 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 what will happen to the fate of indigenous people. I need to quickly land up because uh, other people too also, also, also would, like, would like to contribute. Nigeria was modeled like the United States of America. And don't think the Fulanis do not understand the need to practice true federalism. They understand the need. Even if Nigeria becomes a fully Fulanized, and uh, they've been able to take over Nigeria, because they are working hard towards it, we are the ones that are uh, intellectually lazy to understand uh, what is about to happen to us. They will practice true federalism. If they fully regalize the entire Middle Belt and the South, they will practice true federalism. Federalism will be practiced. And uh, let me tell you what I mean. Um, the uh, Anglo Saxon, which are the English settlers, British settlers. So when they came into America, they saw, and after they took over America, you know, and there was that fight for freedom, they understood for them to survive. They need to assimilate other Caucasian races. I'm talking about the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Germans, the, the you know, people, the French settlers in those places. So what did they do? They created a new economic racial class called the white people. So the concept of white people came from America to regard to the European white people against other people of color, which includes the Indians, the native Indians, the blacks and the Latinos. So that was what they did. 
So while promoting the English language, English culture, English identity. So it was an Anglicization or the Engl um, Anglicization or the Britishization, anything you want to call it, of England. So the British being, being very, very minority, they quickly did that. They anglicized the entire concussion rate and were able to convince them to join them. The same thing is happening in the North. The Fulani, the Hausa people have been, have been Fulanized. You know, and what did they used to do? What did they, how are they able to convince other European ethnic nationalities to join to create that white identity in America? They were able to use Christianity, Protestantism. They were able to use um, uh, what again? They, they were able to use Christianity. They were able to tell them the economic benefit, the exploitation of the indigenous people. They were able to give them land. That was how they were able to do that. The same thing is happening in Nigeria. You see many ethnic minorities, ethnic groups in the north, like the Birons, like the Domas, like the like the Muyes, like the Bachama, the Jukuns, the Danjuma, the Nupe, the Dagis, the Babangidus. They've been fulanized. And one of one of the things they used was to preach Sunni Islam. Look, Sunni Islam, we are all Muslim. Come to our side. Let us create a northern identity. They didn't call it Fulani identity, even though we know it's a Fulani hegemony. Let us create Arewa identity. So by the time they created an Arewa identity, northern first, the northernization agenda that was started extensively. They killed that a northernization agenda is not sustained by speak, speaking English to people and trying to convince them. It's killing. The guns are very, very important and the control of the federal power is very important in sustaining those three things, the guns, political control of the federal government, and the intentional uh, maneuver in controlling, uh, in controlling the minorities of the North. It's very, very important in forging them into what they want. And it worked. It worked. It doesn't matter who, who comes, whether the ethnic minority is from, is from Niger State or Adama Adamawa. It doesn't matter maybe it is a Christian or Muslim, all of them will protect the, the outer Fulani hegemony agenda against the rest of the country. So this has always been their game. Gawan did a good job. He was uh, he, he did a good job for the Fulani hegemony, extremely good job. The same thing with uh, Babangida, the same thing with uh, Abacha. They did a good job against the rest, the against the interest of the people, which is the exploitation of the of the people and the ruthless destruction of Southern Nigeria and the ruthless silencing of Middle Belt, of any form of Middle Belt nationalism. That's why you saw on Clubhouse, the, the, the children of those of the Shokoto Kaliku, they did a saw just an ordinary Middle Belt room, forum that was opened, they went beset. And they started coming and started attacking and started doing all sorts of things before they ran away. You know, because they could, they do, they see it as a conquered space, conquest. Go and look at the Abao. On, on, you see that there's always conquest of Spain, conquest of this. I'm not joking. Go and look at how these people are, think. So conquest has been legitimized. You can, those lands you own, that Igbo land you own, you are a tenant on it in their mindset. Because anything that comes, you are just an illegal occupation, occupant of that land. Anything from that land, they are coming to control it. And who will govern that land, they are coming to impose it. A Yoruba man that you are here with your uh, filler, Gobi, and you are not listening. To me, this has to know. That land that you are, you are a tenant on it in the end, in the face of these uh, conquerors, these Fulani people. They believe everything other than land, even the taxes, the aqua you drink in that space must be used to come and satisfy, satisfy their luxury. And the resources, the crude oil, the gas, more belongs to them. So this is how they think. This is what they want. So you are just an illegal occupant of that space, waiting, waiting to be destroyed. So, and it is not the person that occupies the land, that owns the land. It is those who control what comes out of that land that owns the land? 
do we actually own the land as indigenous people in the middle belt and the north and the south no because every resources from old limestone to granite to even crude oil and gas to diamond is controlled by the sons of the caliphate yeah it's gonna be the control it to the federal government they've created more local government for themselves to steal as many resources as possible and don't forget that for the first time people that's why you see that people are not intelligent i'm sorry to use this word the people that Agi Akamura spoke about a particular guy saying crap. The ethnicity should be destroyed. Pidgin English should be. That's an ethnic minority from the South South. They are the ones that are opening rooms on clubhouse saying that Pidgin English should bad people language should be banned. These are the insane. I'm sorry to use this word. These are what they are. They, that is what they are they, 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 they are talking about. And when we talk about Yoruba people thinking Yoruba first, they start getting angry that we should bring them along. You that you bring somebody like that along. So that advocates for linguistic. So they are not ready to preserve Yoruba language. They are not ready to preserve Bini language. They are not ready to preserve Asian language. If you are a Bini man, Yoruba man thinking differently, good for you. But the majority of your people and what they say everywhere, this is what they even say in conferences, not just, this is their own orientation. Everybody must be brought to their level for Nigeria to work. This is how we think. So we have to understand what we are currently facing. So the the as, as I was trying to tell you, the day, so the full are currently that, that thing is assimilating. The, a minority can assimilate a majority. It's done everywhere in the world. So that's why you see the French um uh, different ethnic uh, nationalities across the world. You see the um, the English um anglicizing millions of billions of people across the world billions of people across the world so maybe in the next 50 or 100 years people they will become the official language if they killed enough people and nothing will happen whoever thought that a day is going to come that full and will say we will not stop killing people except to give us our, our ancestral land whoever thought that it came for the past three four five years it came and the world has moved on and nothing will happen if they finally complete the mission that they want to achieve. So lastly, lastly, uh, uh, it is very, very important, very, very important that we understand why empires are created. And all empires always have one thing in common, territorial expansion. So the Fulanis cannot stay in the north. If you think under the current Nigerian arrangement, the Fulanis are going to stay in northern Nigeria, you are wasting your time. They must, they must do everything necessary. They must do everything necessary to expand, to expand. Because every empire must expand. Any empire that does not expand will die a natural death. The inability of an empire to expand means the death of that empire. That is why NATO will continue to expand. Now, they say NATO is not Atlantic Treaty Organization. Is Ukraine part of the Atlantic? Ukraine has access to the Black Sea. So it is not Atlantic. What are you doing? Why should Ukraine? join the Atlantic. But because of the agenda, they must agend. They must take over Ukraine. So because if NATO is just Dosa, if NATO does not fight wars, NATO, NATO will become rusty. And NATO will die. It must expand. The European Union, they got a very big blow due to Brexit. Because the European Union is an empire. If it does not expand and bring in Ukraine into the fold to replace Britain, the European Union will die. It must expand. So that was why America was built on two three things. America was built on the war, manifest, manifest destiny, that they must expand 
from the Atlantic to the Pacific, which they did. They, have, they, 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 they exterminated the Kumachi Empire. They exterminated it and destroyed it. They burnt it to the ground. Before, and they exterminated the, um, the civilization of a white kingdom. Before they built that, um, that thing you saw, people were kept in uh, concentration camps. That was why, the, that was why the, these people are very smart. They need to quickly do it before you come with human rights. In 2022, it will be very difficult for America, America to do what it, the, the British and European settlers to do what they did in America. America. It will be very difficult. In the next 50, 100 years, it will be difficult for the, the Fulanese to do what they are doing. That is why they will kill as many people as possible to achieve it. You see those people that are kidnapping in our bushes, those are their frontier forces that need money to continue. They are generating a high jihad. The money they are getting will not be able to sustain them in that world. So kidnapping will be part of how they are going to maintain things. Do you think it was 20, 200 years ago, 150 years ago, those that are being kidnapped, how are they going to pay? How are their family going to pay ransom? They would have kidnapped a lot of people and taken them to the Atlantic Ocean coast. There were a lot of rogue elements in the Atlantic Ocean that were selling slaves. Many of the people kidnapped would have been sold as slaves. So because you cannot, what is the difference? You kidnap one person, you ask them to bring 10 million, 50 million. That's like you are selling them as left. It's not different. So you know the, the, this ideology of using human cargo, of using slavery, human torture to raise financial power that was used to build almost the Masina Empire, the Fulani, Shogoto Caliphate, which are all Fulani empires, has always been part of the Fulani culture since they were able to since they were able to rise up militarily. So they have not changed. So the concept of the Fulanis in the use of human beings to achieve material and, uh, and uh, material wealth will not stop in 2000, uh, 2,500. They will continue to do it. Same thing as Europeans, until you fight and do what you need to do. And do what you need to do. I used to say that people, I saw people mentioning for sure about this person. These are guys that you will, that are the people in the internal collaborators in our midst with their rhetoric. They are bound. That those people must never speak for the Yoruba people, for the Igbo people, for the Ijo people. If they speak for us, we are doomed. And now will they speak for us? Continue to stay, you know, you are not concerned, be politically correct, continue to insult Yoruba people. If Yoruba people continue to insult Igbo people, Continue to play devil's advocate, advocate. Continue to say you are a minority. You are playing your game. Then you don't care if your bad people are destroyed. You don't care if the evil people are destroyed. You continue to align with the Fulanis. And because Jonathan became a president, you think your bread has been buttered. You will be destroyed. So we need to be intentional about our survival. Do you think if it was 20, 30, 40 years ago, Ruga would not have been successful? Ruga would have been successful. Ruga would have been successful. Do you see the arrogance? When they tell you, we don't, they don't care, you can continue to shout, they will do Ruga. And they are still coming back to it. Because Ruga is the ultimate goal. But the resurgence of Yoruba nationalism is a big problem. It's a big problem and they don't know what to do. Then lastly, then lastly, I said, the, the purpose of empire is to exploit resources, spread religion, spread their cultural belief, and spread their language. So that's why you speak many, still many non Awusa speaking areas in the north, they speak Awusa now. You know, that is the purpose of an empire. You know, a lot of Muslim population are pushed into Christian settlements in just not. That's the purpose of an empire. You know, with people that are not uh, Awusa, people that are not Muslim, are, uh, Awusa, they are dressed like Awusa people, including some Yoruba people with useless car. That is the purpose of empire. You are going to see a Igbo man that want to prove his one Nigeria. Young, young guys, I'm talking people in their 20s and 30s. You've seen them on Clubhouse. They put on that shiki and they start talking crap. History, yes, they know the history. They know that we are about to be exterminated. They just want to make it work. That's an empire. That is a saboteur. They are right, right.
there. And let me tell you something. The greatest weapon of the Fulani and British hegemony is the Southern, is the Igbo collaborators, Yoruba collaborators, Ijo collaborators, and these collaborators are not strong. These are the biggest weapons. The people talk about the fall of Constantinople, and now the Byzantine Empire were, it was exterminated. The fall of Constantinople cannot be possible without the role that the Oban, Hungarian Christian, played. Oban was an Hungarian scientist engineer who was who connived with the Ottoman talks in the building of the biggest cannon, which was used to conquer Constantinople. And Constantinople fell. fell. So there are always internal people there. The, the Russians did the same. When they wanted to exterminate the ethnic Siberians, some ethnic Siberians <laughs> joined in the extermination of their people. It is always there. So you, we must be heavy handed against those who destroy people in our midst. They might be Yoruba people. It's not that. We are not fighting for the same thing. Forget that crap. We are not fighting for the same thing. In as much what she do is to sabotage other nationalists and sabotage other the Yoruba nationalist movement. That is why the, the message of thinking Yoruba for convincing people that you have more to gain in a free Yoruba land all your greed, all your materialism can be achieved within a prosperous Yoruba nation, sovereign than in Nigeria. People will start calling him because he's able to, life has become about money and about material success to some people. That's why people will collect $2,000 per month to go and fight in any battle as machinery, even though they don't, keep, they don't know if they're going to come back in that war. So you need to tell them, if you join the Yoruba nation struggle, if you join the urban nationalism, your greed and your material success will still be supported, which is true in the post-war urban land. It's, it's going to work, and people are going to be are, are going to be prosperous and well to do. So we need to convince them and let them see that this thing you are doing in Nigeria, they will only give you 150 uh, 500 naira per month uh, for every election circle, give you one cup of rice, kuli kuli and gari. They are already doing it. They put it together and your life will be destroyed. So we have to understand this. And we have to understand that in, the, any, in any empire, ethnic cleansing is very important. Ethnic cleansing is very important. The Yorubanes must be destroyed. The Igbones must be destroyed. The Jones must be destroyed. The Tibnes must be destroyed. That is why we are saying we are preaching Yoruba nationalism. That is why they are afraid. Because when you preach ethnic nationalism, where people are trying to create an empire to exterminate you, you are going to counter them, you are going to destroy them, you are going to protect yourself. Thank you everybody once again for listening. You are welcome to Think Yoruba Force. If you've not followed us, follow us, ping your friends, share the share this discussion, because these are the discussions that, that should go out there, that is going to prepare us for the war to come. War is coming, it is unavoidable. It's a matter of where. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ari. That was, <laughs> yeah, everybody welcome to Think Yoruba Force. We are halfway through today's program. And for those joining up um, in the media or quite recently, we are discussing the creation of the Nigerian empire and the fate of the indigenous people that, that has been existing on that land for millennia before what is on Nigeria came to be. And Ari <clears throat> has been able to take us through history all through the present day and just give a perspective on the creation of empires, uh, what it takes to keep an empire, what it takes to cement an empire, and um, what the fate of indigenous people is within it in terms of being assimilated in, in most cases, and in most cases being ethnically genocided just for the purpose of that um, um, empire. And we took some submission of questions previously and we'd like to go back to the queue. So we are going to start from um, the people that were on stage back then that didn't get a chance to either speak or ask their question and give them the floor to be able to do that. Um, Nisama, I, I hope you're available. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Oh, I think you think you're about first. Um, um, I came up when Femi asked his question, I'm sorry, Kemi asked his question earlier and I wanted to take a swipe at it, but Are has covered most of everything um, to answer that question. But I will take I, I will take the opportunity to um, to still address it um, because I think it's a very important question. What does because I think sometimes when we talk on this app about uh, indigenous people being wiped out, people I don't know if it's a matter of denial or ignorance. People do not understand that it's actually happening. Right, a lot of Nigerians pretend that we're fine, and we're not. We're being wiped out. So um, let me start with you know when you talk about wiping out a people, there are um, people often think of war, massacres, genocides. That's what they think. And when they look around, let's say they're living in Lagos or they're living in you know one of the they're not in the Middle Belt. They're not seeing that happening. So they say, well. These people are just, you know, talking that, you know, fueling hate against blah, 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 whatever. But the thing is, the wiping out began, the wiping out began the moment we became Nigeria. That's where it began. Um, this cleansing, this erasure of who we are, this assault of our identities, of our nations, is on many fronts, and Kemi used uh, the Native Americans of America, of uh, of the United States, um, to draw a parallel, and I'll do the same. Um, so, when it comes to wiping out a people, there are two ways. There is direct, which Ira has pointed out, uh, with examples in our history, and there's indirect. So, direct would be violence, conquest, war, killing, slavery genocide, skirmishes, et cetera. What we see with Iswap, Boko Haram, that is direct. Now, people don't often recognize that even the fact that we're speaking English, that I'm talking to you in English and I don't have the accent, or at least my accent has been uh, uh, corrupted by this accent I have, is a wipeout of my people, right? Um, because let's say I have a child where I am, what do, how do I connect them back to, to where they are or, 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 or their people? How do I connect them to their, to their lands, to their culture, right? So even the fact that we've adopted English as a language is erasure, as not even just a language, because you can learn many languages, but as our main language, right? In our schools, in our way of life, that's a way of wiping us out. So that goes into assimilation. So with assimilation, if you look at the Native American context, right, what they did and which is going, which is already happening and will continue to happen and worsen as we go on as quote unquote Nigeria, if people don't wake up. So the removal of identity, I already touched on this, uh, linguicide, your language, right? That's usually the first to go. And they use the educational system to do this, all right? So it, how I would even break it down in my head is it's two fronts. You have to get the adults and then you have to get the children, the future generation. You have to stop that identity from continuing on. So you want to get the adults through war, violence, direct, reduced population. That's what you do with the adults. You reduce the population by using war, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get the children through quote unquote education. That's why those of us who are educated, quote unquote, are actually the most vulnerable to selling out our people, right? Because we're given this education as more valuable than where we come from. So that's why typically the intellectuals in any movement, whether it's uh, uh, even here in the US with African-Americans, it's always the intellectuals they use to get in, right? Uh, um, to 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 change narratives because the, your education gives you a different set of values. Typically, Western our education gives us Western values, so we indirectly work towards helping white people continue to oppress us, and by proxy, their 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 um, 
handlers here in our countries, you know, uh, the Fulanis and so on. You can go all over Africa. There's a group that the white people have put in, in charge to continue their oppression of us, right? So you have education. Now with the Native American context, what they did, they took them into boarding schools. Now these boarding schools, many of them were by the church, right? So that's another way of, of, of erasing the people. <clears throat> you disconnect them from their spirituality, right? You give them a new spiritual identity and they disconnect. Now, some people can find their way back home, but this is a tool. If you look to any books or anything that, you know, that speaks to how um, white people oppressed people of color all over the world, religion is actually a tool that they recognize and that they use, right? So uh, uh, they're taken into this bo these boarding schools. They are given a new uh, set of beliefs that disconnects you from your people. That's a wiping out of your people. Um, they also, with the Native Americans, they went as far as to do eugenics on them, right? They removed them from their homes, the children, and took them into these boarding schools, disconnected, literally disconnected them from their families. They never went back home um, and put them in English dress, um, made them lose their language and all that, right? Um, there was also mass sterilization of women, which will, I think, will happen eventually if it hasn't already started, right? Um, so a lot of these healthcare people who come in to help people with healthcare, they strategically sterilize the women so they stop having children, right? That's another way, an indirect way of wiping out people. Um, and these are things that have been used. Now let's get to land. They take your lands, right? First, the easiest way to do that is the claim for resources. We're all one nation, so we need the resources. So a lot of Native American lands don't belong to them. They've relegated them to, to reservations in certain portions of the United States. But most of their land, even the pipelines that are being argued about right now, um, are on sacred lands. Another thing, they separate you from your sacred grounds and from your ancestral. These are where our ancestors are buried. There's a connection deeper than just our just just our you know on the surface claim to land we are tied to the land spiritually so when you're disconnected from the land when you're driven off you can look at the middle belt and those people who are in idb camps and and people who are being driven away from their lands it disconnects you and your people are spread out you start to adopt things that are not yours you end up in somebody else's land you have to let go of your language so that you can get on you can get by and this is happening in a mass scale in nigeria so I think a lot of people are sitting down waiting for war to happen before they get it. But the thing is, even the fact that we don't know who we are, a lot of us don't even understand our cultures and uh, uh, the history. We don't even have our heroes are, uh, you know, la throughout last week, a lot of Africans are talking about Elon Musk. Those are our heroes. When your heroes are not people that look like you, are not from where you come from, you're already being wiped out. Right. So this whole wiping out business, it started the moment we decided to call or we didn't decide. They decided for us. But a lot of us have decided to carry this Nigeria name over who we actually are. And um, that affects us. Uh, that's wiping us out on a mass scale. Now, um, identity is key. One thing I wanted to point out for because somebody brought up an example of someone saying, oh, we should forget our ethnicities. Here's the thing, those people, they try to sell it to you as, oh no, it's unity, it's human, it, how do they say, humanism, it's uh, humanity, blah, blah, blah. The truth of the matter is, there is no part in the world that identity is not crucial. Even the people who are telling you to forget your identity, by telling you that they're, they're, they're promoting another identity. So by saying, oh, don't be Yoruba, don't be Ijo, don't be Igbo, don't be, you know, whatever. They're telling you to embrace another identity, right? And that identity, in this case, Nigeria, does not benefit you as a Ijaw person, as a Yoruba person, as the Igbo person. We've seen it. It does not benefit you at all. So those people who come to you and say, oh, it's hate. It's, uh, it's what, they, what they call it. It's tribalism. It's all of this nonsense. All of it is nonsense. 
because they are promoting the new identity that will benefit them and not you. So I just wanted to add those things. Um, thank you for the opportunity. And um, let me see, did I forget anything? That's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just move on? Because I want to encourage my African brothers from Nigeria. No, hold, 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 uh, hold on. Hold on, please. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, Mr. Gunka, please, you can go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Mm. I'm going to try to be as fast as possible, <clears throat> but I want to go on a quick historical lean as well and um, to, to just support what uh, Mare Kurumi has been talking about. Uh, so, you know, we've always had our own concept of empires. I, I hope people can hear me well. Can you hear me well? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Loud and clear. Okay. Loud and clear. All right. So we, we've always had the concept of our own empires. And now the empires that we built was not for fame. It wasn't for glory. It wasn't for wealth. The empires that we built were, were built on necessities. So let me just give a quick example. I would have loved to give Oyo and Benin, but I'll give Oyo alone to save time. You see, Oyo was created as a buffer zone to stop northern infiltration. Because you see, our, our ancestors were diviners. They do a lot of divination. So as they're building the land, the, the, the divination tells them a lot of things that were going to happen in future. So you see all those things, all those tensions that were happening in the north. The 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 um uh, or Romeo did not, not just wake up one day and say, oh, yeah, I will go here and then I will set up uh, a, a a kingdom. No, 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 no. These are things that were divinely done. He he had divine missions as he was doing these things. So you see all these new people trying to invade. But good people did not invade because Romeo was able to win their friendship. He was able to cut their friendship. And so people that could have been a potential enemy, they became friends. Right? So all these, all these then eventually full of people invading. If Oyo was not strategically positioned where it was at the time these things were happening, your black country will be history today. That that is so they, they, these these were things that so that's why when people start to talk against divination and you start to embrace a, a new religious philosophy that does not help you prepare for the future but paints you as this weak person that must always depend on on heavenly beings it's 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 a it's a reckless and dangerous mindset but I mean until I learn how to how to navigate that topic with wisdom, I would always kind of shy away from, from it from now. But it's a topic that will be had at some point and 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 um and and and, and in a in, in a matured way with matured mind. So you see, Oyo started around the 1200s, but Oyo did not build the empire until like 400 years later, the 1600s. And if you notice what Oyo was doing, Oyo, Oyo helped build the Igomino lands and annexed it into the empire. Why? It was to protect Igomina from being raided. It took the coast, Adjashe and all these places. Why? It was to get um, access to the coasts so that they can expand and do the things they need to do, trade the things they needed to trade. And after that, you did not see or you're expanding. It's not like they didn't have what it takes to go all the way to Ghana. It's not that they didn't have all, <clears throat> what it takes to cross into Benin and even stand up to 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 the uh, to the other power block that was there, but these these were people that understand the natural order of things and in our spirituality and our teachings. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Our spirituality and our teaching does not encourage you kind of just doing things for fame and glory and things like that. They they were necessities. Now, the 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 concept. The the empire building in the days of the past is very different. They were, if you look at Genghis Khan, if you look at um the Vikings, you will see that all they wanted was expansion, fame, and glory. And this the first empire builder in the world that we know was a man called Tiglat Pileser. Uh, Tiglat Pileser was building empires from the Middle Middle East region. He was the first to to consolidate the two important rivers where the civilizations of that region um um came from right but now 
it got expanded and then people built a concept of disconnecting people from their lands. They realized that for so long as people are connected to their land, you can never conquer them. There's a spiritual connection that people have to their lands. And in our Yoruba words, you will see it when you start talking of people say alale. Eh, eh, onile. There, there's so much that you see that um, uh, or, or, or ile. I'm not good with Yoruba, but if you start looking at Yoruba words, you will see the very important situations that connect people to their lands. So now, the, the Assyrians were the first to start doing that, and, and there was actually an Assyrian king, Sennacherib, who actually went into northern Israel. You know, there was a time Israel was two. There was northern and southern Israel. He went into northern Israel and, and chased all of them away into exile and then resettled people there. That is the way they controlled their empires at that time. Uh, the Babylonians still did it. And Nebuchadnezzar, you would remember that he, he went into, into Jerusalem and also took all the people. And then they would take the, the princes, the nobility and all those. And then they would infuse them into their own elite class. So that's what they were doing to people like Daniel, like uh, Meshach. I'm not a preacher, but <laughs> I'm just trying. I'm trying to use examples where people people are familiar with. So these guys, they came from nobility where they came from, and they were infused into the nobility of um of Babylon. So it was the exile that brought that song by Bonnie M. All of us that are old school would know uh, by the rivers of Babylon. That was that was their exile song when they took them away from, from their land. So that's the concept. Now, the Greeks came, which I read spoke about, and then they started doing what we call cultural infusion. So you can see the, 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 the way these things evolved when it comes to land. Cultural infusion is a way of now kind of saying that, okay, we're Hausa Fulani, we're... we're and Yoruba Northerners. Those are those are examples of cultural infusions. They, it, it's designed to confuse you. It's designed to distract you, and it's designed to make you feel like there's a new order in town, and you need to kind of uh, throw away the old order, a very reckless and dangerous way to 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 kind of catch you off guard. And this man started a concept called Hellenism. So Hellenism. Is, is an Alexander concept where he would take the, 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 the laws of those natives and then he would look at the Greek laws and then he would, he would merge them together. And one of the places, that was where the corruption of the very, very powerful Egyptian civilization started to happen, which the Romans would eventually kind of complete on. So uh, in all these empires, like we always say, there's always rivers important. And the reason why I want to talk about rivers is because you will notice that there was a time the Fulani people were still saying they wanted the federal government to have the waterways. If you look at almost any empire, you would always see that there's an important river connected to that empire. Starting from the Middle Eastern empires, you will notice that there was the river Euphrates and the river Tigris. Now, to the, to the northern part of, um, of, of Africa, where the biggest civilization celebrated across the world came from, there was, there was the Nile. And this Nile had three important civilizations. One is the Egyptian civilization, two is the Nubian civilization, and three is the Axum civilization. That's um, um, Ethiopia. All that are connected to the Nile, right? Now, so now, in our region, when the, the, the Fulani people came, they were also connecting rivers. And there were two very important rivers that they were trying to work on. One was the River Niger, and two is the River Benue. So you, you will notice that uh, the Shonge Empire was built across the River Niger. And when the Fulani people started building their empires, Every empire they built had a river connected to it. There was the Futajalon Empire that was connected to the to the source of the river Nile in the in the Guinea region. There was the Futatoro Empire that was connected to the San Gambia River. There was the Shokoto Empire that was connected to the Gobia River. There was the uh, Marcina Empire connected to to the to the to the to the. It's also 
it's I've forgotten the the river. It's not really river. It's like um an it's old piece of Niger. water. It's river Niger. It's also river Niger, but there was the Masina waterways in that region where mm -hmm. Amadou Sheko consolidated together at a place called Jena. Yes, those you're correct. It's also river Niger. Those are mm -hmm. tributes. River Niger. Yes, yes. So you can see that it's all rivers that are being connected and put together in those regions. Now, shortly before Usman Danfodio died, he divided. You see this region that you see called Nigeria. It was not a British idea. It was a Fulani idea, and it was it was designed by Usman Danfodio, his son, and brother, and a guy called Madibo Adama. So the, this is how they divided it. They, they did three capitals. So one capital is the Shokoto capital, and its mission was supposed to take the Fausa states and the Middle Belgian states. They used to call it the, mm, let me not use the word, out of respect for, for Patrick on stage, but it was a derogatory word they called it, the, the something something states. So they wanted it to be a part of the of the Shokoto Caliphate, but that was unsuccessful. Now, the, the, the brother now had a capital at Guandu that was supposed to take and conquer to the coastal regions, take all the Gala regions, take all the Bini regions. The Bini people fought back because they had musket guns with the help of the Portuguese. The Igala people were very smart. They let them bring in their cavalry and horses, and they just lured them in. And they did what you call the... Um, 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 Fabian strategy. The, the Fabian strategy is the strategy that was used on this man from Carthage. His name escaped my head now. He, he, he marched in elephants into Rome and was trying to conquer Roman Empire. Hannibal. And, um, sir, sir? Hannibal. 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 Thank you. Yeah. So they, 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 they lured him in, pushed him in, and, and exhausted him in the empire before the now so it's it's a way of weakening the enemy by not directly attacking but letting him just come in come in um, um this man also did it in russia stalin when the german forces were coming in so that, those are examples of Fabian. he let them come into the heartland but they were destroying all the grains and all any kind of things they can do there for so by the time they got there they they had been worn out so this was what the Gala people did. They let them bring in the cavalry and all that, and then they waited on the decessor fly, started to kill all their horses. Then by that time, they lost their cavalry advantage and they were able to attack. But they, they, they didn't give up on this strategy. So they said, we were going to divide it into three. Now, the, the, the guy that would take the north, the brother would take the south, and then the eastern region, which is the river Benue region, was going to be taken by Madibo Adama, who was also another kind of independent bloc of not popularly spoken about, but he also stood independently and built the Eastern Bloc, a, a very brutal, brutal um, takeover of those regions. So you see that map of Nigeria, when the British came, that was why they were able to work successfully with the Fulani people, because they had the same blueprint. They had the same mission. It was to, to exploit. And you will know that when the British, um, this is what the British call the dual mandate, right? The Fulani people will get the power. They will get the resources. They didn't need power. They didn't come to Nigeria for power. They came for resources. And you know, I'm going to shock people about something. Big as this whole world is, it's just 13 families that rule the whole world. And there's going to be a topic about this someday, not for today, but just starting families. See, all the resources, all the banking system, all the all the all the wealth, all the manufacturing, it's connected. These starting families decide which company stays and which company goes. These starting families decide which country is stable and which country is not. So you know, so they, they've they've built Nigeria into that block, and they are a part of this system of neocolonialism. Now, where did the problem come from? The people of southern Nigeria, over many, many, many centuries, have always been free, independent-minded people. They didn't belong to the feudal structure. They, didn't, they were not the kind of people that were built to be exploited, because that is not how our ancestors treated us. That is not how the society treated us. So it's alien to us. 
for people to think that they can come and exploit us both male and female and that was what was leading to those resistance you were seeing at those times in abba in in Egba, in lagos you know all those all those reasons because the system to exploit is alien now what happens the british realize that every time they try to exploit southerners the southerners know how to fight back in a way that embarrasses them Guess what they did? They went back to the Fulani people and then used them as their decoy to do the atrocities they, they would love to do. And that started after the Enugu coal, coal massacre. You remember that um, when the Zikist NCNC movement started, the intention was to use labor unions to hold the country hostage. And they wanted to start with the Enugu coal, coal workers. So there was a massacre on them which backfired greatly on the British. And after that time, the British realized that they would never get involved in direct um, um, brutal silencing of native Nigerians anymore. That was when the Fulani um, militant movement emerged. And that was what happened in Jos in the 1940s. That was what happened in, in Kano in the 1950s. That was the British using their friend to silence people through proxy but they remain their hands remain clean it's it's a machiavelli way of doing things where you will stay behind and you will push other people to do to the bad work but you will now still kind of stay on top and act like you're the good guy you're not and everybody's looking at you and saying oh no this guy's a good guy oh these guys are good guys you know that's not so you see when we understand history a lot a lot of things, you will see it clearly. And when it seems like you're getting aggressive, people will not understand. <laughs> but I think that was, a, that was a slight deviation. So the social engineering started becoming very bad. When, shortly before independence, they noticed that the South was trying to break away from the structure that the British wanted to leave behind that when they leave, they will still be able to exploit that region. Awolowo did two things. First, he, he started to industrialize his region. And, and as he was industrializing, he was bringing these companies from abroad. And as he was bringing them, he was forcing them to use the raw materials on ground. You can't, you can't import raw materials. And then as those companies were growing, he was building parallel local industries. So for example, there's Bonvita, which was, which was uh, um, I think it was Cadbury. He also now started doing Ovaltine, which is local. That was our lowest philosophy. So that is, they will bring in Guinness, but then they will create Nigerian breweries. That was how they started to industrialize. So it started becoming very, yeah, please, please mute her. It started becoming a very uncomfortable um, idea for, for them. Now, Awolowo also started to give his people education. Two, three, Awolowo started to shift away from neocolonialist um, people and started to embrace another group of also very, very bright minds. And these were the Jewish people. That was when they started to bring in Solebone. That was when they started to now bring in those Jewish guys in construction, in agriculture, and all those things. That was when Western regions started to really expand outside the, the European bloc perception. And this was why they did everything in their power to make sure that power did not come to the South. Because even the Eastern region was seeing this. And one thing about the East is that they know how to look at what you're doing. And then to now kind of expand on it above you. That's, that's their skill. And so, I mean, Z concentrated more on education, but by the time Okpara came, it was a whole new ball game. Now, he was the one that started the concept of African socialism. And you can see the things it did in the in the in the eastern region. So now, when the British left and handed over power to Fulani people. The job was to make sure that this progress going on was totally reversed. And you can see over the years how they did that. All the things we negotiated that independence had gone, um, all the attempt of regional blocks to be able to hold their future and destiny together has been prescribed. Every, the Abuja decides the fate of everybody now. And um, the constitutions was changed with an excuse of the things that they could have fixed. And then they 
totally now kind of broke Nigeria into um, overrated, um, um, what you call local governments that they call states, so that we can speak the way Ojuku was able to put the Eastern region together to speak as one, the way Aolowo was able to put the Western region to speak as one block and stand against the in a formidable way, the way they were able to kind of help the Middle Belt come in as a block, that was what creation of states did, to destroy that. And I'm sure Are spoke about it earlier, how they will take you and then divide you into different states. So we've gone so far now. So that's why if you're seeing that, we're saying the only solution is to break away and just now be able to determine our fate. We know why we're saying it. It's all a package. This is where I want to yield so that I don't hold the mic too much, but um, it's always a pleasure to be here on this platform and hear Bright Minds talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Gunka. That was uh, that was a nice uh, on the cake because uh, you broke down so many so many things. I don't know if anyone is still on the is still on the platform that one who's um, uh, um, yeah, I'm yeah. here. Can you bring me up my browser, please? I want to participate, please. Okay, you can go ahead. Okay, well, like I'm African. I'm African. Oh, so, sorry, uh, Pan African sorry, Jack. sorry, Jack. But uh, can okay, sorry, to, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry to sorry to interpret. Sorry to uh, cut him short. I think and there was a uh, PB Ijele and J on the on the queue, so that maybe we just give them the privilege because I think he's just jumping on the stage now. So maybe we we'll just give people the priority that have been on the stage. Then our, our Pan Africanist brother can come in later. So PB, please, are you there? Ijele, are you there? Uh, Mr. Oluwatosin, are you there also? Okay, since uh, we've done, we've been uh, just and fair to you since they're not there. Mr. Jack, please, you have the floor, please. Mr. Okay, okay. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, brother. Because I want to in, to give like some input as like Africans. I'm African. I'm African Liz. I'm too young to do this. This is not about politics, it's about Nigerian. And then I'm proud. I have Nigerian brothers and sisters. So what we want to say it is like this. This one should be like politically like a topic today. So what happened is because I don't like politics. We we have been slave. Nigeria is the big country. We they have very good resources. As I'm speaking now, I'm in Sweden. I have like Nigerian. I'm in Europe, but originally in Kenya. So I want to say like Nigerian, like the young, the young people, the young generation. We have like the previous topic before what's happening about the slave trade we respect like the white man we respect the people who have the money we respect the people who have the position in the government but we don't respect has we has the young generation because africa i even cry like almost several times why i cry is like this we africa we are so strong more than like europe america canada we, wherever it is on this planet we are but we are not united why we are not united we are being slave mentally physically socially emotionally because we respect people who came in the country and then those people who came in the country they don't know about the culture so when it came like uh like I wish like one day there's one young person can speak up his mind and then he have to say it. We don't have to respect this person because of his money, his color, his race. It's okay, but we are mentally in a prison. The prisoner we have as we Africa is like this. Like before, we have a very bad story. There's nobody respect us. There's nobody see us like we African but we are not united we are not united just the same in nigeria just the same in kenya just the same in any part of any african country so i want to talk like uh i'm african is it's okay like we have to talk something can help young generation we have to change the mind speak up wait, wait jack we have a topic here oh god <laughs> the topic yeah, says 
I wait, understand wait, the topic. Wait, the topic wait, is about Nigerian wait, empire. Wait, That's wait, exactly. no. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Jack. Just hold on Mr. for a while, Kemi, please. Mr. Kemi, let me let me handle this. You see, when you come on clubhouse and you see people that are here, you have to be very careful that you are talking with people that their IQ is above average. And some people might be very, very calm to listen to you, while some people might be a little bit brash and say, no, excuse me, brother, you are going off topic. The topic says, creation of a Nigerian empire and the fate of the indigenous people. You are here telling me us, you are an African, you are an African. Nobody cares if you are European. Exactly. I'm not European, I'm a so pan African. Africa is not the country. Are you getting the fuck out of the state, please? This is not for you. This is your bad nation. Yeah, this is your bad boss or whatever. Mr. Please, Shuleke, we don't need Mr. you. Mr. We can't come, we can't come to your state and start Mr. Shuleke, please, 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 let's, let's be calm, please. Yeah. Mr. Shuleke, you need to Yeah, thank you. Um, there is one thing I want you to know, Jack. Africa is not a country, it is a continent and the most ethnic diverse continent on the surface of the earth. <clears throat> In fact, the genetic diversity, heterogeneity amongst the African people is one of the highest ever in any geopolitical continent in the world. So Africa is not a country. Okay, oh, thank you, thank you. Can you allow me to speak? Calm down, calm down. You need to do more of listening. People spoke eloquently, different, and you went off topic just to derail the room. Maybe you did it innocently. I'm going to redirect you. And I think uh, I have a level of um, ability to engage you. You are from South Sudan, I think. I want to ask you just one single question. Why did South Sudan secede from Northern Sudan, Arab Sudan? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Can I answer you, please? Can I answer you, please? Like, it should be like me, like South Sudan is, it is under East African community. So when it came, like, I, I was not up, uh, up the topic. The topic is about the indigenous Nigeria. I asked you a question. Oh, okay, okay. So, so Sudan, South Sudan, they break Sudan? away because there's no unity. There's no understanding between themselves. Okay. So, do you are you proud to be South Sudan? Why should I be proud? Because we are mentally socialized with outsiders to control us when we okay, leave I'm coming, our I'm coming, I'm coming. so you you prefer to be under arab sudan right i should prepare where i'm comfortable but i will not prepare where the people doesn't respect me they don't know like the thank reality you thank you very much jack this is what we call hypocrisy what you came here to do is hypocrisy and let this be the last time you come to think you're about platform to preach that poison called Pan-Africanism here anymore, again. Your people fought for more than 40 years to get out of Arab North in order to flee from the Arabization policies. But because maybe you suffer, you're suffering from cognitive dissonance, and you do not, because I've seen what you think has do all over global saying crap. Because you've become the new Arabs of South Sudan. You now have the gut, you have the audacity to tell people that are enslaved, tell us that we that have been enslaved within Nigeria to continue to stay under the Fulani Arabs. Exactly, you I got your point. Can you, listen to me? Can you listen to me? You now have the gut to continue to romanticize a Nigerian identity you have no understanding about. You have no understanding of what we are talking about. What you guys went through from the Arab North is not different from what we guys are also passing through from the Fulani North in Nigeria, where a particular section of the country believe they are racial and politically superior than the rest of us. 
please you are going we are going to move to somebody else that has somebody else to contribute to this show to to this conversation if you guys can be viewed selfish this is why you, people of color need to be wise that somebody is a black person does not mean it's your brother they are not can i re reply to your question please can, if, if um please can you go down please yeah um the more good candidate thank you uh, uh please Ari, just a just a penny yeah me, you know me, yeah. you're going to talk now you're going to okay. talk okay. let me complete my thoughts it's it's unfortunate that people who fought for 40 years and many of us who believe in self-determination struggle the day the people of south sudan had their referendum it's um uh, sorry bro uh it's uh please don't we, we are not going to be calm for dinkas please if you have any form of an exploitative behavior all over africa we will call you out from the amaras to the arabs what they are doing against the babas to what the arabs are doing against the babas in western sahara we will call you out you guys will not hide because you have black color and be per perpetrating black on black colonialism we will call you out so nobody should tell me we should no 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 this is not we've gone past that level so if you want to continue you should have known and smell the coffee that that madness needs to stop you fought for 40 years to get out of arab slavery the term janjaweed was a terminology that came out from that brutal civil war where the Arab North was sponsoring non-state terrorists to enslave and kill indigenous people. They were like militias. Fulani, were, Fulani and other nomadic tribes were also part of those Janjaweed. They were on horses. It is not different from bandits and Fulani militias on motorbike motorcycles. It is still the same <clears throat> two-legged move system of locomotion. So we understand. What is happening? You fought wars. Millions of people died. You got South Sudan. What are you doing in South Sudan? What are the Dinkas are doing in South Sudan? They've literally hijacked, it's called state capture. And the Noah, the Shimluk, the Equitarians, you, their, their voice does not matter anymore. You guys have become the new hegemons. Instead of preaching justice, you guys continue to preach peace. And anywhere you see nationalist tendencies, where you see Yoruba speaking as Yorubas, what is even the population of you Dinkas that you have the audacity to be lecturing Yorubas on how we get out of a Nigerian contraption, if not for British? Why are you to come here and talk to us that way? That's the bitter truth. So this is the age of nationalism. I don't think I'm going to spare any prisoner when you continue to perpetrate this news, this nonsense. I don't, do, I don't go to Dinka room because I know you guys are going to throw me out. You guys are deceiving yourself. And the day South Sudan is going to balkanize and disintegrate, we'll all be here and be, and be zipping vodka and be pumping champagne. Because you guys have refused to learn. You guys are, are behaving like the Fulanis. You guys have the same thing anyway, invading lands and seizing indigenous spaces. So we will treat you like the Fulanis you have. So we are not, we are people that are highly lettered, that have traveled all over the world. So there is no Nigerian. It is a colonial identity. So we are Yoruba first. So don't come here and continue to preach and romanticize that identity on this platform. Because the Jews will not allow you to even rationalize Holocaust. So why should you come and rationalize our Nigerianization when it has been a source of, of agony and devastation to us as a people since 1884? How dare you? If the Jews will not accept you to even make fun or make comedy about the Holocaust, you don't dare talk about how you want to romanticize the Nigerian identity that has turned us to top class citizens. It is because we tell people that there are some things you don't cross. That is why they continue to repeat this madness in our face. That's why people will be justified in the Nigerian sovereignty to steal your resources, to steal your gold, to steal your land and be asking for Luka and your waterways. Please, enough of this madness. The mod, please over to you, sir. Um, treason, maybe treason can also have something he wants to. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, okay, sorry, I just wanted to respond to the gentleman that came up there. 
that has a, a little or no education at all the those actually don't even actually understand what he's saying because there's no sense out of what he's saying you know he just want to talk because he had people talking he virtually don't have any knowledge of his own country where he came from and beside his tribe they are known to be those who are used as the willing to to destroy that that made that war to last for that long the dimka they are not actually the fighting force they look like as if they are the major, the major ethnic group you have there in South Sudan. Why the uh, the Silic and the Buri people were the, actually the ones that did all the fighting. They have been sabotaging that war for a very long time, you know. And until today, they are still there sabotaging the country because they have been brainwashed. They have no education. They are lazy like Fulanese. Okay, so he don't he don't even know his country. And go to their go to their rooms and hear them talk. You know that they are not even short of a, a Pulani tribe. So he, he just came here, try to destroy ethnic nationality. People are here talking about how to preserve their identity, how to preserve their culture, and how to preserve their value system. He is here talking about uh, Pan Africanism that has never that's nothing. To, what has Pan Africanism ever achieved? Your own nation, your own nation is in disaster. They are trying to revive their culture, try to revive their ethnic nationality, and you're here talking about the Pan Africanism. That in that is a disaster, you know. So I, that, that's what I was trying to I trying to. Um, but luckily enough, people will stop him before I I got provoked because I I have calmed myself down because he has been thrown out. I didn't want to say much on that because he don't he don't really know. I don't know where he came from. But besides his, his ethnic neutrality, there are a bunch of uh, criminals, you know, who actually destroyed the whole fight and made it prolong it because they are benefiting from it. Just like uh, the way they are using other ethnic minority, ethnic nationalities in Nigeria to benefit from the war and the destruction of their identity. That's what they are, they are there in South Sudan. So, thank you. I will back in a minute. I will back and uh, I will have other things to add up, please. <laughs> Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Mr. Truest Tourism, uh, for your contribution, uh, highly valued. Uh, Mr. Shuleke, please, and you can kindly uh, come back up. It was just in the midst of the, the heat of the moment so that we could just put some order. I think, uh, yes, he has got his reply, but it's just that uh, we just have to try to just don't use some kind of um, very vulgar words and just to just control our temperament and in the heat of the moment. Please, I've sent the invite to you. Please kindly come up. Uh, we are all one here, and uh, please. So we'll just uh, move on. I see we'll just uh, take the PTR order before we go back to the discussion. We have Babalao, we have Queen Sheba. Uh, I think the two have spoken. So Babalao, please, are you there? Yes, I'm here. OK, please, uh, you just have three to five minutes, either your question or your submission, then we move to okay. Queen Sheba. Thank, Thank you, you guys for uh, having this conversation. Um, I think it's high time for us to um, I, as a matter of fact, let me just commend you guys for throwing that guy out right right away. I was going to jump in and say something real quick, but it's a good thing you are kicking him out. Um, we've been on this uh, platform, uh, this clubhouse, for a couple, uh, I'll say, months now, if not years. And um, I believe with this, um, the, with how much minds rubbing that we've been doing all this time, uh, people need to understand that we are in a big danger and it's time for us to um, start taking actions and putting all this learning, you know, all this knowledge into, into action because we can't continue to allow our people to be to be wiped out and uh, civilization to to go into extinction and uh, we, we, you know, we, we try to be politically correct. So I'm saying this for some of us that still believe that Nigeria nation will work. Because unfortunately, as we're talking right, right now, some of us still believe that Nigeria nation will work. But it's either something is wrong with you or you just deliberately act like you, um, you're ignorant. If you if you try to tell me right now that Nigeria nation has hope because for over, what, 60 years, nothing has happened always um hope and hope and hope and hope and um nothing has happened yet 
So I just want to continue. To, I, I want to commend you guys to continue to have this conversation as people are joining because we're beginning. We're having new people joining the clubhouse, and um, as they as our people are coming in, they are getting this information, and I know some of us are putting action, our words into action. So thank you guys for continue to educate our people. And I just want to let our people know that if we don't take action now, nobody else is going to do it for us. It's our time to do it. Our ancestors, they did what they have to do. And that is why we have what we have right now. Our civilization as Yoruba people is here and we're able to um, have something to, to, to build on because our civil, our, our um, ancestor did something. So it's on us now to do something so our children, you know, can have something to come to, to live by. Let me quickly say something, right? When I was in Yola, um, I went to school in Yola and I went to Zaria, right? Um, that year when I was in Yola, I was a Muslim and um, I'm the one that called prayers in the mosque and all that. So at some point I was in a library, this... Um, Fulani girl approached me. This is a girl that don't. Um, she's she's from the um, um, Ali Mustafa's um, family. Ali Mustafa happens to be the um, Emir. I don't know, maybe maybe he's still the Emir now of of Yola, right? And um, we became friends, right? And uh, as a matter of fact, we we're boyfriend and girlfriend for a long time. Now. It's beginning to occur to me now that she, um, as against the impression I used to have that um, the Fulanis or the not the houses, the real core houses or Northerners, they stay within their circle when it comes to marriage and relationship and all that. But I was wrong. So when I was dating this girl, I was surprised that she was she would date me because I wasn't. Me being a full honey girl, you know, now it's beginning to come to me now that um, the full honeys have the intention of having their people, especially their females, mingle with other man, uh, ethnic minority, I mean, ethnic, ethnic uh, uh, nations, so they can create different identity out of them. And we're seeing this thing from somebody like Olu Womari in. A Fulani girl and uh, Saeed um, Kengushi of uh, Ekate land marrying a Fulani girl. And um, so when I graduated from Yola, right, and I went to Zaria, and she went to another school, we lost, we lost touch, right? So after I went back to get some paperwork for my, you know, to move on in life, I heard that even when I was, when our relationship ended, the next person he actually eventually got married to is another Yoruba man, right? And her cousins, a couple of her cousins also do the same thing. So it's something that is going on right now that the Fulanis, they're actually trying to, you know, um, in, uh, bring their women and their men into marrying other other ethnic ethnic nations so that they can create a different identity out of this, you know, out of these um, cultures. So, and I have friends that have that live in Lagos that, that you know, because after my experience, then I start investigating, I, I start talking to people. Then I realized that in some areas in Lagos, we have Fulani men that are actually marrying Nigerian women, I mean, I'm sorry, Yoruba women now and creating you know a different kind of um uh, identity but what they do is they maintain when they marry you or they come with you and be with you they make sure they maintain their full and their identity because that was what the girl did you know she took me to her family and everything but i wasn't ready to continue the relationship and that is why it ended and i had to move on in life as a young man so I'm just sharing this experience just for us to know that it's real, it's happening. You know, the Fulanis don't have no nation. They have, they're everywhere. So they're looking for a place where they can call their home. And that is why 
the trying to come into our line and now it's coming it's beginning to come to everybody we can see it playing out in our life right now as they're taking our lines and trying to you know subjugate us physically you know so these things that is happening now is been going on for years and thank you uh, thank you so much uh, mr babala well, you can't have been said uh, any better and uh, the fact is, if we just look at the Hausa people today, uh, they, they were subjugated physically, militarily, but eventually, what weapon was used to finally destroy them as a people? Assimilation. We can even come up south now and see what has happened to you know places like Ilori and the re uh, reemergence of a new kind of identity. And that is exactly what uh, this Ruga, tend this is the ultimate aim of Ruga, Except if one wants to, you know, lie to him, his or herself. Look at look at Plateau State today. Look at how they've somehow changed the demography of that state. Look at what is happening in Kaduna. Look at what has happened in Bauchi. You see demographics being changed in less than 100 years. And it's just that people don't even have a sense of history of who they are as a people. And they just try to just defend this identity and... Uh, the Nigeria identity is created to just exterminate the indigenous people. And we, the fact still remains that post-colonization post and all of all this, the hegemonies that were created was based on the continued exploitation of, indigen of indigenous people. And even in history of the world, it had always been a fight against the indigenous people to exploit their land and their resources because at the end of the day, it's all about land. It's all about land and what is in the land. If you can defend your land and make use of what is in your land for your own benefit, then you are nothing just more than a slave. We'll just continue. Um, I see there are a lot of people on the set that have not spoken before. So please, if you have any kind of contribution or you have a question, just kindly uh, blink your mic so that we can just uh, take a cue and from there we can move on the conversation. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Mr. CPI, are you there? I don't know if you are not there. Dr. Paul? Aegis, Rewaju? Hey, comrade, comrade, I'm here. Ah, okay, Mr. CPI, you are welcome. You are from where? Uh, this is General Charles. Ah, General Charles, what happened to, what happened to your profile? Welcome back. Uh, something changed. Ah, okay, it's, ni it's nice to have you back on Think You're About First. Uh, you have How the floor, you? please. How are you, our what, freedom what, fighters? I'm fine, thank you. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, thank you. Uh, my greeting to all. Well, I see Chris Ibai here, where all of you, our freedom fighters from Yoruba Nation. Uh, you know, it is a struggle. Don't waste time when you bring this uh, Fulani of South Sudan. Those Fulani of South Sudan, they are the same thing. Uh, he was trying to teach you about Africanism, but he don't know even history. Unfortunate. That's how they are arrogant. You know? Um, you know, this policy, just uh, our comrades say here about uh, assimilation policy, the new policy of assimilation by Fulani, is also the policy that they think are now doing in Equatoria. And the demographic of Equatoria has changed. It has changed. Why? Because they make an excuse that oh we are your in-laws they kick the men out they kill some of the men and people go to the refugee camp and they occupy the land they marry the women those who are resisting they kill them imagine this if it just live alone a hundred years this is just within 17 years when they come to power Every, every a bomber, a bomber is the lowest administrative area. They are all there. All the villages, they're there. Imagine if you allow this for 10 years. That means there's no local anymore. People will be assimilated. You'll be speaking their language. You'll be uh, like now. In the, in, in the, in the so-called South Sudan. The TV programs are for Dinka. Dances for Dinka. And every people now are trying to assimilate 
try to copy the same thing the culture that's unfortunate and that's what the europe uh the fulani are doing on Yoruba nation and other uh, communities other, other other nations like Igbo. the resistance like my brother say our parents have done their part our grand grandparents have done their part what about us should you the Yoruba nation allow this to continue there will be no Yoruba resistance is the only option creating awareness among the Yoruba nation and other freedom fighters within Nigeria who want to decolonize Nigeria so that they the the Fulani let the Fulani live in peace with the neighbors of the Yoruba nation right you're not going to claim the you the planning land your own land you're the one that we want they cannot come you know and come and come and come and come at the end of the day there will be no yoruba people will be starting living like a fly this is dangerous it is very very dangerous we make that mistake that's why the dinka today you know are uh, are uh, the rulers in South Sudan are the colonizers of Equatoria. We we are not going to accept that. We say no, and that's why we're now calling for independence of Equatoria. We don't want to be, you know, assimilated. Our resources. Someone just say. If you are there, they exploit the resources from your own land for the benefit of the Dinka. Who are you now? You are just a slave. You know, when you enter South Sudan now, borders, you have to say you are Dinka. Imagine that you deny your own identity, your own culture, your own even sacrifice that your, your fathers and brothers and sisters contribute during the liberation struggle. And both of these thinkers were in the refugee camp. They were cowards. During the 1991, the, the Nazi faction would have finished them. You know, but it was the Equatorial that rescued them. And today, you know, they are just, we are just nothing. We become slaves to them. You have to be, be, be a friend to a Dinka in order to get job. Or you sell your sister or your daughter to marry a Dinka, then you get a, go, a job. What a life. What a life. The Yoruba nation stand tall. Nobody should colonize Yoruba. You should unite for the freedom of future generation. This is what you can do today. Your children or your grand grandchildren will be proud of you. Those who are standing firm here, those who are calling for independence of Yoruba nation, those who are calling that that land belongs to Yoruba and it is for Yoruba people. It does not belong to Fulani. The Fulani have their own land. I'm really proud of you guys. I'm very proud of you, the freedom fighters. Continue. Don't give up. Any animal that come here with nonsense, don't waste time. Don't make even him to talk two minutes or whatever. Like Just drop him down. This is a liberation stage. We are not joking here. We are fighting oppressors. That Jack who came here, that oh African, he says he's in Sweden. Why did he go to Sweden to be colonized by white people? Should be in Africa. Bullshit. Thank you, comrades. Thank, Sorry thank if you I so much. Using the wrong language. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Charles. It's always now uh, nice to. To have you come on the stage and uh, support uh, the Yoruba Nation, the Yoruba cause. Thank you so much. We are all. Uh, Can you speak up a little bit? But can, can you hear me? 
Very good, very good. Ah, okay. Okay, maybe I was kind of far off. Uh, it's always nice for you to come on stage and, uh, you know, give us your, your support. Thank you so much. We are brothers in struggle and uh, in the freedom of Africa. To break down this uh, Berlin conference, 1884 conference, 1884 Berlin West African conference that have made us be where we are today as, uh, you know, enslaved indigenous people of Africa. I just want to say a big thank you to you. I uh, will take uh, Dr. Paul, then we go back uh, to our uh, to continue the, the discussion. Dr. Paul, please, are you there? Yes, thank you very much. Um, okay, please, you have the floor, Dr. Paul. Thanks a lot. I uh, salute every wonderful people here today and I've been following every meaningful conversation and I say we are doing great. I am a Yoruba man and i identify with the uh the struggle the progress and the success of the one spirit that we have together uh, but i have a quick question which i i want to put forward um one speaker i think uh, the, before the last two speakers actually mentioned something uh which kind of still divides our ambitions today when you talk about the unified purpose of the Southern Nigeria or the Yoruba nation or the uh, singular or multiple objective of unity that we have in the South, whichever way you want to put it. There are still people among us that even though they believe in the objective of the Yoruba nation and they believe that the Nigerian state has actually reached a state of anarchy and is moving towards a complete state failure from everything we've seen. Yet these people still will not confront the truth that they have ahead of them. Rather, they bury the truth by politicizing every movement that we have. What is our advice to this kind of people? We have people on this platform. We have people that we share the same ideology together. But because they are supporting one political party or the other, they still push the agenda of a one Nigeria. Because on one part of their heart, they believe and accept that the Nigeria is already a failed state. And on the other part of their heart, they still believe that we can still forge ahead with the country, with one Nigeria. What sincere advice do you have for these kind of people? Or how do we approach this kind of double belief or double position? Are you? Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Paul. Uh, Are I don't know if you want to take on um, Dr. Paul's uh, question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paul. Uh, with my proceed, sir, with all due respect, sir. Dr. Paul, what's your Yoruba uh, name? I would like to address you by your Yoruba name. Adeleke. Okay, Dr. Adeleke. It's better. Um, because I've never seen a a British or a French man be a Adeleke. So, and that is, Adeleke is more beautiful, more fantastic than any english or judeo-christian name no apologies for certainly. saying that certainly certainly yes thank you sir so um till the day the referendum we the, the referendum date is going to be scheduled till the day till the minute that yoruba nation will be announced till the minutes that the flag of Yoruba independence will be flown sky high. We will still have many Yoruba people in our midst, 
that will still be working against Yoruba interests. There is nothing we are going to do about that. Do you know, Mr. Deliki, that there were, there were some Jews who collaborated with the Jewish, um, with the Nazi, Nazi Germany in the destruction of their fellow Jews? Do you know yeah. that when Germany invaded France, there were a lot of French collaborators who collaborated with Germany in the destruction of France. They were also French, ethnic French. Do you also know that it doesn't matter, maybe it is white, black, blue, there will always be internal collaborators that help the external invaders to destroy their own people. If the Yoruba people amass and harm me today, and we march straight, or we navigate the Atlantic Ocean, and we land in London today, and we take over London, you know there will be a lot of white British, English, that will join the Yoruba people in destruction of England? That has always been the case in every civilization of the world. So it's not a Yoruba thing. That is why there is a popular saying that says, there are different trinities of civilization. There are those who build civilization. There are three trinities of civilization. There are those who build civilization. There are those who nurture civilization. And there are those who destroy civilization. Now, Yoruba civilization was built by our ancestors. And we have two camps within the Yoruba people. Those who want to destroy Yoruba civilization are many of us that are trying to preserve Yoruba civilization, nurture it and preserve it. Is it going? Is it has always been a brutal war? The Chinese fought that war. The Vietnamese fought that war. That's why you have the North Vietnam, South South Vietnam, South Vietnam. They wanted French American colonialism. The v, North Vietnam, they said, no, we are Vietnamese. We will protect the Vietnamese identity. So it has always been this war, this inter, this clash of civilizations between the destroyers and the preservers. You see those who continually malign Yoruba identity, Yoruba interests, Yoruba values, and they call themselves Yoruba people. Those are the destroyers of Yoruba civilization. And these are the people that the French, the Europeans used to like to work with. These are the people that the Fulanists like to work with. Now, how are we going to neutralize their toxicity? We are going to neutralize their toxicity by making sure that those of us that are preservers of this civilization, we are as resilient and as brutal as them. I'm not going to take that word brutal back. You see, those who want to destroy Yoruba civilization, they are ready to lie to get it done. They are ready to destroy. They are ready to defame. They are ready to involve in character assassination. They are ready to kill. They are ready to do everything necessary to destroy Yoruba nationalists and Yoruba civilization. They do that without blinking twice. And these are not just people in APC, PDP politics. There are many people in different Yoruba nationalist organizations that are destroyers of Yoruba civilizations. They're amongst us. They're in churches, they're in mosques, they're in your brothers, they're your mother, they're everywhere. So that is why this particular, I thought I said war is coming, it's gonna happen. It's my, because war is not just the use of violence. It can be political, can be diplomatic war. That's why there's called war. You know, that's why that's why there's economic war. So this matter, this case, this juncture that we reach is a very crucial. If we miss it, that's the end of Yoruba people. So all of us, it doesn't matter where you are. You don't need to come out and publicly be speaking like many of us are doing. Support the movement. Tell your congregation in mosque. Call them during your sermon. Promote Yoruba identity in your in your wasi, in your in your mosques, in your churches. Do the same thing. Promote Yoruba identity. When people bring um, want to give their children names, and you are a pastor, all the names you are giving is Cinderella, 
Annabella, Anastasia, and I say, all sort of uh, Jack Bauer, Jack Bauer. Start seeing, ask them, brothers and sisters, daddy and mommy, where is Oluwatosin? Where is Adeleke? You know, where is name? Where are names like Ayo, Ayo Deji? Where are names like uh, uh, Ife, Ife Oluwa? Those are names. And you are also an Afar. They want to do sooner. They come and came on the seventh day, on the eighth day. And all the name is Abdul Deli, Abdul Wasiu, Abdul Mumi, Abu Bakar. Abu, huh? And there's no single Yoruba name. Tell them, excuse me. Tell say Yoruba money. Are you not a Yoruba person? Give them Yoruba names. Tell them to speak Yoruba in churches. Tell the choristers. Not every day you want to sing like. Uh, like uh, Cinderella, you want to sing like them well. Sundays, some minutes they must be singing in Yoruba. Some minutes they must speak in Yoruba. Promote the use of uh, Yoruba language instead of Arabic language. If you are an Islamic cleric and you are a Yoruba man, those are the way you preserve. That was what our ancestors did. We have to understand. We have, if they bring anything to us, we must Yorubanize it. We must urbanize everything they bring to us. This is how we stand the chance to survive these monsters. I don't want to start mentioning names. Yoruba civilization should have been destroyed 30, 40 years ago. We survived. The moment they arrested and incarcerated Chief Obafemi Awolowo and destroyed the Western region, that should have been the end of the Yoruba civilization. That's happened to many people across the world. But we found a way to survive. The emergence of Obasanjo as the head of state of Nigeria should have been the end of the Yoruba nation because he waged a war against the Yoruba people. Then we survived. He came the first time we survived him. He came the second time we survived him. So we cannot continue to ride on our luck before a bigger monster comes in our midst. That is why high and economy will never be a party to those who wear, who are wolves, burning sheep, blossoms. So we need to do the needful. So many of those guys that are doing APC, PDP politics, many of them will finally come home. That's the bitter truth. Look at what happened during June 12. Many of those who were campaigning for Abiola never believed in Yoruba freedom. They were never believed in Yoruba nationalism. They were good Nigerians until the North showed them the true color. Under the North showed them they are the rulers and the principality of Nigeria which led to that brutal civil rights movement, civil movement called Nadeko. But immediately the smelt power, the greedy ones jumped, they left Yoruba nationalism and they embraced politics. That is why we are not going to make that mistake. If you don't want to make that mistake, the true Omolu Abis, the true patriotic Yoruba people must be more than the sellout in our midst. If that's, so that's why I told you it's not even Yoruba PDP APC, right within Yoruba self-determination groups, there are a lot of bastards within us. So if we don't, if we want to neutralize them, those of us with the right mindset, with the right mission, must join the struggle, ASAP, so that the struggle will not be in bad hands. So when we are, when we are supposed to be negotiating for freedom, we will not be negotiating, negotiating for regional system of government. There's nothing wrong with doing everything necessary to have gone be sick. It doesn't matter, even face the British before independence. Done everything necessary possible. Pay the ultimate price. Not to get into Nigeria before 1960. When we saw all the signs, damn Azikwe, we should have damned all those elites, the fathers of Femi and all the rest, all these arrows, H.O. Davis and the rest, that sold us out into this nonsense. We should have not, we should have been unapologetic and called out Azikwe and say, go back to the East and develop the East. Get out of Lagos. This is the bitter truth. There's the bitter truth. Don't come here. We should have been that bad vociferous. Because, because we did not become that vociferous and be very ruthless. Look at what he did. Azikwe led to the death of the death of the of, of, of innocent Higos because of his greed. When the likes of Michael Okwara, very fantastic people, patriotic egos came, it was too late. Because Azikwe has started a chain reaction. Of a chain reaction. Because the British already used him. And five million Igbo. Do you know what that means? 
It's like wiping out the entire Finnish people, nation. It's like wiping out the entire, if the Igbos were just an ethnic minority, that would have been the end of the Igbo people as a people, as a whole. Until date, they've not even recovered from that because of the stupidity and madness of a man. So that is the fault of we Yoruba people. We should have been more radical. We should have been more radical. That is why when somebody said we shouldn't throw somebody out. Why, should we, why won't you throw somebody out? If we had thrown the nuisance in our midst out in 1951, we would not be here. We will not be here. So sometimes if you are too nice to people that want to destroy you, you are going to be consumed. And this opportunity of, of, that we have might not happen. The Fulani saw Buari as an opportunity for them to fully Fulanize Nigeria. They've forgotten that we saw Buari as an opportunity to get out of Nigeria and destroy this Nigerian empire, British by the British. So it's going to happen. So join us. Join us in TYF. We need a lot of ends. There's a lot of things to do. There's a lot of projects ongoing because we do want to do what other people have not done. We want to do it. We just don't want to talk. Clubhouse is just one of the avenues where we reach out to people. There's a lot of things we do on ground. Go to Twitter, go to Facebook, we go everything we want to do even on ground. So please join us. Mr. Adeleke, join us. You can reach out to any of the mobs or you can reach out to me. So we can, so that we can do something very powerful. Please. This is the job of everybody. We must not leave this job for the next coming generation. This has to be done. And when we think, we must think about Yorubas across the world, not just Yorubas in Nigeria, because Yorubas outside Nigeria, they are more patriotic to the Yorubas nation struggle than the Yorubas of Nigeria. That is the bitter truth. That is the bitter truth. Just like the way you, the Jews, the Jews in Eastern Europe, are more patriotic to Jewish interest than the Jews in Western Europe. That's the bitter truth. The Jews in Western Europe have been westernized, while the Jews in Eastern Europe have more interest in freedom of their people. And the Jews that lived in the Ottoman Empire, in the former Ottoman Empire, in Hungary and all those, all those places. That's why you saw Theodor Herzl. He was from the former Ottoman root area of, 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 the, of Europe. So we have to realize that. That it, our, many Yorubans of Nigeria need help, mental help, to save them from themselves. And if you go to Benin Republic, you see the way the Yorubans in Benin Republic are so proud to the Yorubans. Very trustworthy, very, same, same thing in Togo. Go to Brazil, same thing in Togo, in Brazil, same thing in Cuba. But you see the Yorubans of Nigeria, there's a kind of problem. And I know why. Because of the unitary system of government, there's a lot of I don't want to start Sunday, Sunday immigrating. We've not been preserved. So there's a lot of things going on. So we, 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 we have a lot of work to do. A lot, a lot, a lot of work to do. Did that answer your question, Mr. Adeleke? Mr. Adeleke, are you there? Very well, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I think that, that was the next one. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Mr. Ashango. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Are. It's as if uh, you were in my mind because all I wanted to say is what you've actually pulled out. But I will just say this. Our case is similar to that of uh, Jews, but unfortunately, ours is deeper. Because uh, the Jewish, they were never trying to be any other person. And uh, most of this in Westernization, part of history, uh, help them in preserving uh, their own. But in our own case, we need to fight a different, fight from different angle. And like you said, we still have a very long way to go. We have a long battle to fight because as we are fighting westernization, the same way we need to start fighting our fullernization as well. And this, and at the same time, or let me say, in, in, the, in the process, still fighting for our freedom as well. I was on Facebook and I had this, a friend of mine saying, oh, next time you want to speak English, speak English properly. And I begin to question. For And these are well-educated set of human beings, whereby we've uh, thought that speaking English and having this uh, fluent accent of speaking English is equivalent or has anything to do with uh, intelligence. Not knowing that in the process of doing this, 
we are indirectly exterminating ourselves. We are indirectly uh, selling ourselves out and saying we don't want to exist again. We want to, uh, and unfortunately, if anything happens to us, Fulani will not even make that attempt to put us in any uh, museum. The only museum that you will still be able to see us, maybe it's probably when you travel to Europe or probably when you travel to uh, America. I think those are the places where you can actually find Yoruba people uh, in a in a museum. So we really have a lot uh, to do to, I mean, from now on, because we just have to be unapologetic and be very, very intentional about our Yoruba news. Like, uh, we, like I used to say, these issues of names, speaking of English, yes, it is good we speak English as many English as possible. But yet, at the same time, we should try as much as possible to make sure that we keep speaking our, our Yoruba as well. Because that is where you start. Now I'm beginning to see reasons. When I was serving, uh, when I was doing my uh, internship at, N at Napiums then in Lagos, it was then I began to have this idea like that, is that you're a Muslim or you have a friend from the North? I never understood. I mean, I, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't have the clear picture of it. Just like Babala who said, the Fulani lady coming to, to, to him as a person, he doesn't know the intention. But thanks to Olodumori, in one way or the other, he was able to escape that. So it is not as beginning, I mean, that I have the clear picture of what is actually going on. So in the process of me trying to have a friend of uh, a full and new or whatever, then I may be arabizing to marry any, marry any one of them. And today I will not be speaking for Yoruba people. I'll be speaking from both men because I don't know where I belong. And that is why we have to be intentional this time around. And unfortunately, in the process of we be, some of us being intentional, some of us are telling us you are, you are being tribalistic. You are being this, you are being that. So to anybody that is still on this platform, and to Dr. Paul and anybody around you, this process of decolonization starts with each and every one of us. The name, if any of um, family members give, their, give any English name or whichever other name that is not Yoruba, to their to their children, we should start fighting it from there. Charity starts from home. Because these are the process. Because by the time I because when when my when my head brother gave his children Gerard, is one of his child, I begin to like Gerard. I went to the internet, I saw the meaning of Gerard, and I asked him one question: Are you German? And was asking me a question, why would everybody is giving English name? And I begin to like, okay, this is where it goes. This is what happens. This is the root of, of I mean, of the name. And I give glory to a little more because today he's not speaking the way he used to speak. I've been able to pass that message. So if anybody comes tomorrow and give him the same message, everything begins to walk in one way or the other. A thousand mile of journey begins with a step. So the process of decolonization is a must, and we must be intentional about our Yoruba this time around. Okay, I remember a friend that was telling me, ah, you are even abroad, your accent has not changed. I said, how much should I put into my pocket? I'm not interested. I am Yoruba. I am very intentional about it. So because when people believe you're outside of Yoruba, Yoruba land, everything about you should change. And unfortunately, the Yoruba land where we are, we don't even want to speak that Yoruba anymore. We begin to pay money to, I mean, to, 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 to learn other assets. So the process has to be complete in the, in the sense that every one of us, our ends must be dirty in this, in the, I mean, in this, in this fight. We may not necessarily carry going, we may not necessarily do anything, but the word of your mouth goes a long way for liberation. I yield for now. Thank you. Uh, oh, I, 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 I gave my submission. I've, I've been quiet. I don't no, know no, no, I'm, 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 no, I'm calling your senior brother, I can't control. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, mm. Well, anyways, um, this is what I wanted to uh, have and um someone is unmuting someone is unmuted who is that please kindly have to mute for now 
I won't be long. Uh, but um, me, I'm glad with that's why I decided to listen a lot with all the submissions of Patrick, Bunka, Are, and the so many things that I've had this afternoon. Again, and I use the word again, not because I have not had them before, but or I don't know. I've been able to put some things together from the different discourse that we have had so far. And uh, at this point, and at this stage of um, this um, struggle, I, for one, I'm not going to stop talking, but I'm more interested in putting two things together. This is the reason why I decided to join TYF and um, be part of the batting of something. Because uh, there's a lot to do out there. And if there are a common group of people who at some point decide that they want to shoot off to do something together, it makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, but what I'm trying to point out with that I said is because I'm encouraging everybody, if you are two in number, if it's three, if it's four, if it's five, if there's something you guys can do together to save us from that contrapment, it's very, very important. Just like Kemi said, which I'm taking from his last statement, most people, and I've always been saying this, believe that um, self-determination is about carrying that placard, carrying that gun, being in that bush to go and fight. Everybody has his own strengths or areas of what they can do. But your self-determination starts from the corridors of your house. Is your child thinking Yoruba first? Is the thought process of your child from the thought process of being Yoruba? Is the thought process of yourself Yoruba? Because I listened to something recently in the room of Akara Ogun, a lady defining the phrases that form Yoruba, but that's not the most important thing. She talked about a lot of languages, um, not languages as in phrases, words in Yoruba that are dead already. Why did I use dead? Is because many of us don't know them today. She even made me know the name of Alubosa. And before, I thought we don't have a name for Alubosa. But Alubosa is an imported word from somewhere. I don't know. But she called it Alade or something like that. I don't know. That's what she called you, uh, um, that onion. Many of us don't know. So if we are not careful with all that they are, they, uh, are and everybody is analyzing here, and we don't take this to soul to conscientize ourselves, and make sure that we that we uh, that sorry pardon me if we if we don't if we are not careful to conscientize ourselves and be part of the struggle in whatever way we can do it believe me we will regret it tomorrow the foundation of your struggle starts with your word whatever way they might, whatever way you call it it's not too late. There's no time that we cannot do it. Because the this empire that uh, somebody was mistaken, and this is where I'm going to round off. Somebody wrote something in the chat, and the person was saying, um, maybe, if, I don't know, maybe he wrote it wrongly, or maybe he meant something else, but saying that Christianization was um, uh, the reason why they have not been able to build the Nigerian empire or something like that. But I wrote that in the chat to answer that. In fact, it's because of that Christian, those religious, I don't know, let's just make, let's not just go there unnecessary. But what I'm just trying to say is that be awoke to know that the Nigerian empire is already existing. It's not something they want to build. What they are doing now is to solidify what they have built, to make sure that they erase you entirely stylishly. And that is what broadens all the arguments that are and many people have put into their submission. So my own is that, please, I beg those of you who, if you don't know, please ask questions. Even the Bible we read says, ask and it shall be given. Something like that. Any? Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, 
when you ask, you will know. You realize that all your life you have been living in a con in, in a contraptment, not just the Nigerian contraptment, but inside your consciousness. There's a contraptment inside your consciousness that you are not that is not meant for you, that you are not supposed to be in. We need to get out of it. When you get out of it and you see clearly, you'll be so pro Yoruba. You carry your if it's possible, you will. If it's possible for me or me, Aki Kanji, I will write Yoruba in the four in my in fact, I will write Omolua B in my forehead as a tattoo. I will write it there. So that when I go anywhere, when you see me, before I say anything, you know that this guy is a tribalist. By God, whatever language you want to use to they use to calling anybody. But I carry that my my that spirit of Omolua B, that blood. Of uh, I carry it in me and I always carry it forever. And it will be my first point of talk anytime, any day, argument anytime, any day. Nothing else is superior more than me. And I would never accept inferiority, but I will not preach that I'm better than you, but you are not better than me. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much, Aki Konji. Thank you so much um, for your input. Uh, I just want to say, you know what? What we even call them tribalist and bigot is just again the miseducation, because you see always British fighting for British interests. You see the Spanish fighting for Spanish interests. Even within the, within the EU, they all have their political and economic interests within the same EU. Then uh, <laughs> in the contraption called Nigeria. Because I want to have a Yoruba interest, you want to call me a, a, a tribalist? Well, uh, if it's a tribalist, then so be it. Like you said, I will wear like a badge of honor. It's about self-interest, about self-love. Nothing more than that. I see a lot of people on the stage. And welcome, uh, Femi. Welcome, Mojo. Welcome, Think Tank. Uh, uh, Yoruba goddess, welcome also. Uh, please, if you have something to say, uh, please kindly uh, blink your mic. Uh. Okay. Okay. Uh, We'll just we'll, we'll take uh, Awoko and I will take Awoko, Awoko. We'll take Awoko and then we'll take Ijele. Then uh, Charles will come back to you. Then we'll take uh, Mr. Ojo. Then uh, Baba Wala Inkashe, you want to speak, sir? Okay. Then uh, Ifeluwa. Baba, you there? Yeah, Eshin Wekwetu. Toba di Kowa, Eje Kasoro. Okay, 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 sir. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, then we we'll take um after that we we'll go to Mr. Lion Kana uh, if you I think and Yoruba. So uh, I will call, please uh, you have the mic, please. Yeah, good afternoon, all Homoloabis. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk this afternoon. Well, from where I am is um well evening actually, but wherever you are, I say good morning, good evening, and um good afternoon. Um, the moderators, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Uh, actually, it's more of um, appreciating Arekumi and, uh, and a question for him. Arekumi, good evening, sir. Mudupe um, Forimi, and I appreciate Olodumare in your life that came across you the day you presented on how to lose your land. You spoke with so much passion, with so much anger, a very positive anger that was exhibited in that submission that day. And I thought, I said, wow. So really, we still have this sort and uh, people among the Omoluabis that have so much love for his people. Um, I will say you are one of the rare gems that I've came across in um, Clubhouse. And hence why I said, I appreciate Olodumare in your life. Mude Tupelorimi that came across people like you. And few others as well that have came across on Clubhouse that you said a lot. But I appreciate Ododumare that we are all Omalade. None of us that is a bastard, we are Omoluabe. But however, how well and how deep, and this is for all of us, 
and I'm not excluding myself. How well and how deep is our Omoluabi? And everything that we're taught that day, are we really sit down and think about it? My late mom, my so pa mo ro te man go te ma fi so wo si te o ni fi je on la ye la ye ni. A lot was said, but I'm not digressing from the topic of the day: creation of Nigeria Empire, the fate of indigenous people. What is our fate? If we don't know our fate, we can move forward. Let's be realistic. And again, I don't want to repeat what people have said. The Western education, either we like it or not, got, where, got us to where we are today. It's part of our major problems. And it's high time we recognize that. I know we have a lot of scholars on this platform. Hence why I ensured that I tagged it, I pinged a lot of people in to come and listen to word of wisdom from this platform. How deep is our omoluabi? We do use such words, but how deep are we really? Are we allowed <laughs> Western education? to erode our Omoluabi, because talk is cheap. But when reality is down, how far can we go? Do we allow our Western education to erode us or to cloud us from the reality of things? People will write a lot of things in the chat and you wonder, these are well-educated people but in between those things, the submissions, you sit down and wonder what is really, really wrong with us. I know a lot has been written. We've read wide and far. But however, like one of my father, one of my mentor, a secret mentor, he never knew. But I will mention him here. <laughs> Baba Ujo Yebisi, he said a lot. And I took sit down and think about his submission. He said, <laughs> for the far things he's written, that does not mean it's the true picture of what happened. That is deep. For the far that you are an historian, you, you've done a lot of research and it's all out there, written by scholars. But what is important, let's pick the ones that favors us, not the one that will be slapping us on the face that you're stupid self of you one being. I will bring it to reality. We're making it to be our reality. Is that who you are, Somolo Abi, for real? We are the image of our ancestors. And again, one of my father in Clubhouse said, <laughs> and I quote, he said, if care is not taken, we, this generation, will be one of the worst ancestors. And that blew my mind up. We use the word ancestors, which means definitely we will, we will become one. But what are we leaving? What are we going to leave for the generation to come? I, Awoko, will not be a worst ancestor. And I believe a lot of us will not be. But how far and how well are we working on that positively? And it's a shame, I'm sorry to say this, when you hear people come around vomit. I'm sorry to use this word. They vomit their areas based on what they've been taught in class, based on what they've researched and they believe such narration. I don't even want to dive into religion. Religion has locked a lot of brilliant people. You know that they're brilliant, but religion has locked their thinking cap. I'm sorry to use the word that they be actually educated but brainless. They're well educated but brainless. Into real you want it for. 
lakaye is a spirit. Unju lakaye want it for, emi lakaye want it for. For what? Because they've been westernized. They've become a coconut. Dudu ni wanita, fufu ni wano. But they didn't realize that. For how long are we going to live like that? Eche kaburu no arawa. It's time and effort. People coming together to discuss forward thinking. And you see a lot of people still come around and derail themselves. It's high time. Eche kaburu no If we are not one, we can move forward. It's in togetherness that we can win this race. It's a race. And it's a difficult one, but it is very easy. Timo Waba Shekon. In oneness, you can win anything. Let's be one. Let's love each other. So, please, please. I'm talking to even me, I will as well. I'm not exonerating me. Whatever it is, talk to your family members. Talk to everybody. Even talk to dogs and cats. You'll be shocked. We are the veg. It. It. I wish I. I have been here for you for 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 when uh, clubhouse started. But you know what? Time in on and took me. So I recommend, I appreciate that I came across you. But my question, sir, is how well are we doing out there in Nigeria to communicate this good gospel, good, good gospel, sir, for, to educate our people? I speak to my people in Nigeria, but I can tell you from my own side, <coughs> I might be wrong, though. It, it seems the awareness is not really there. Their thinking is totally different from all, some of us abroad. I can tell you on Clubhouse, maybe probably the percentage of people living abroad might be, um, let's say, 70, 75. In fact, if it's not even higher than that, it's just because we don't have to buy data on a daily basis. Once you have internet in there in your home, it becomes free directly or indirectly. But for those living in Nigeria, it's very few that can actually afford to buy and to stay on this type of educative platform. So what can we do? Or what are we doing in that area, sir? Because there, there, there seems to be a lot in, in our people's brain already that that needs to we first they need to de detox, and again they, their brain needs to go back to factory setting for us to be able to move forward, sir. What are we doing in that area? I'm not changing the topic, but these are the questions in my mind, and I keep asking, what can we do? How can we go about it? Thank you, sir, and thank you everyone for allowing me to talk. I mute my mic. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, well, I will... uh, are, are, do you want to take the question after we take other people me, so that you take okay me, two minutes are because and we run uh, on time two minutes yeah. are please you go okay, um i greet you in the name of Mary, madam Abuk Awoko. I uh, thank you. everybody have a lot of work to do this work like you said it's a very hard journey many will fall by the wayside Many we leave, many we turn back, many we sabotage, but we will never give up. A lot of work is currently being done by a lot of Yoruba nationalists, both living and dead. And what I what I just said, I really mean it. But. Uh, I'm not going to be arrogant with the question you asked. Do we have a lot of work to do? Actually, yes. I was in Yoruba land last year. Uh, 
That was uh, in the beginning of last year. And I was uh, working in a very remote area, very close to my house. Very remote area. Just walking, sightseeing with two of my friends. And I saw in a particular corner where I saw Yoruba Nation poster. In somewhere I never thought I would never see it. And my friends were busy mocking, like, look at these people, they've been disturbing us left and right. I said, which people? I said, this Yoruba Nation. I just said, hey, Yoruba Nation. I said, what is Yoruba Nation about? That they should tell me. He said, these people, they are the one, they are country. I never told it. I just came. I said, oh, that's nice. I didn't let them know anything about me or that I'm a, <laughs> that I'm a or anything. I just kept quiet. And I was shocked. And I went to so many places. I saw leaflets of Yoruba freedom in different places across Yoruba land. People are working. And people are doing the job. And the message is, is very far, has gotten far than we think. I was telling somebody, a very good comrade, he's on this stage, of what happened to me when I landed and I was being like in the taxi I took. And um, it was a personal taxi, a cab. Um, and the person was telling me, I was back home, you know, I moved around a lot. And the person was telling me, am I Yoruba? I said, I said my face, I said, because he said my face does not look to, I said, yes, I'm Yoruba. Okay, I said, okay, good. He started telling me, do I know about the Yoruba nation? And I was in that taxi for close to two hours. And this man was telling me in his own little way on why I need to join the Yoruba nation struggle. And I was laughing deep down in me. And I was saying, Baba, oh, that's fantastic, that's very good. The man is close to 60. And he was sweating passionately and telling me why there must be a Yoruba nation. You won't believe it, random people. But this happened in Lagos. He took the time to look at me before spreading that gospel. And I was like, wow, this has gotten far. And that man, I only gave him more money as a tip. I said, Baba, the man did not know why I did that. But he was preaching to the general overseer <laughs> about Jesus. But I didn't say anything. I just laughed. And I never disclosed anything. I just asked him to continue doing what he was doing. That the, the Baba should not lose hope that the Yoruba nation will be free. What am I saying, Nessie? Yeah. The freedom, the gospel for Yoruba nation struggle is being discussed amongst the elite class in Yoruba land. It's being discussed amongst the political class of Yoruba land. It's being discussed amongst the Talakawas of the Yoruba land. Do we need to do more? Yes. If the Oluban of Iladan Obadon can come publicly to say I support Yoruba uh, freedom from Nigeria openly. He came here yesterday to also say that. So we should know there is anybody, any, any conscious person should know something is cooking up. But we need to do more. We need to do more. And I believe there are different techniques that we can do use. Social media is there, and the normal orthodox media is also there. And rural, I call it rural evangelism of the Yoruba nation struggle should also be an option on the table where we are going to go to doors to doors, all to all. And how do we go to that? We are going to do health care outreaches, you know, all sorts of things, sports, to make sure that we do what we need to do and spread these words five, five minute step, two, two minute step, three, three minute step and share it so that people can listen to it. So I agree with you, uh, Madam Awoko, that we have a lot to do. And hopefully we are going to do that to ensure we spread the gospel. And hopefully we would like to work together and we can talk offline, because we must not discuss this openly. Our enemies are also listening. I Definitely. think you agree with me, ma'am. Definitely, yeah, 1,000%. Yeah. Thank you so we much, can, sir. We can talk behind, um, behind the scene. Thank you. No problem, sir. I appreciate you, sir. Thanks. And I appreciate everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Again, uh, thank you, thank you so much, Are, uh, thank you, Mr. Obri Awoko, for your you know reflection and positivity. Are you, been... uh, 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 are you sure you're not the only one that is not hearing me? Because uh, uh, oh, uh, it's better now. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say and uh, welcome everybody to Think Yoruba First. This is a Yoruba nationalist um, platform. Today we are talking about uh, the creation of a Nigerian empire, the fate of the indigenous people uh, within that contraption called Nigeria. And I uh, will just uh, move the discussion forward. We have uh, people on the list that have not spoken. Uh, Ijele, please, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, please, you do have yeah. the floor, please. Okay, I would say in Corona, I know that I hope that's the right Britain. Now speak in English, if you guys don't mind. You've done exceptionally well. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so whenever I come to this club or a room that's hosted, I always stay with the audience. But today I decided to come up. Um, I have to say that whenever I come, there's always something new to learn, and I appreciate the room. And um, on a lighter note, there was something someone said some hours ago about something somebody said on Twitter, what to do to unite Nigeria. You know, he mentioned different things. So I would say there are th three things, in my opinion, that would... Um, you know, make that unity a reality. But unfortunately, those things can never happen. And number one is um, football. Well, after the match, everybody still goes back to where they're coming from. Secondly, um, a dangerous, a very, 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 very uh, terrible disease like Ebola. I remember when Ebola came. In fact, Nigerians were temporary temporarily united. And the third is an invasion by extraterrestrials, which is less likely. So because of the mess that the Western world has um, created on this continent, especially Nigeria, I don't think Nigeria can ever be united. The truth of the matter is, it is a wonderful thing that people are aware of where they come from. And they are also aware of what is happening. And I'm not against self-preservation. So it's a good thing that people are realizing what they did not realize some years ago. So it's a good thing you are doing on this platform. And that's all I want to say. Thank you for having me. No, th th thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you've, uh, you've spoken uh, very well. And I think uh, you bring, you brought another perspective also to the conversation, which is uh, always very welcome uh, for us to see things and from all angles and at least f make judgment from what we listen to. And I uh, just want to say thank you so much uh, for being uh, on the platform. And please kindly also come and, you know, as often as you can to bring your own contribution to this kind of discussions. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Ojo, please, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, please, you have the floor, sir. All right. Uh, I'll say uh, I borrow a boy to everybody. Uh, thank you for having me this afternoon. Uh, basically, what I want to say, first off, um, we have to understand that nearly all African countries today are Europe engineer conglomerates, right? In 1884, Western European leaders came together in a Berlin conference to petition indigenous African kingdoms without regard for their ethno-linguistic reality. We all know this. So um, the Berlin conference, as we know it, was chaired by Otto von Bismarck, um, the man who single-handedly uh, introduced the ethno-linguistic homogeneous model into Western Europe. What do I mean by ethno-linguistic homogeneous model? It's a model where you build a nation based on your ethno-linguistic reality. You build a nation based on a common language, a common history, a common descent,
common culture, common philosophy, common mythology. That is how you build a nation. So uh, Otto von Bismarck did this uh, in Western Europe with the unification of German-speaking people into one. Uh, the same person introduced the opposite in Africa uh, with the introduction of the heter heter heterogeneous model, um, which is the partitioning of indigenous kingdoms and amalgamation of disparate ethnic nations into one. You know, these nations, they have nothing in common, but you, um, you know, put them together. First, you partition, and second, you amalgamate uh, disparate nations into one. Uh, that's clearly, um, you know, what happened uh, in the case of Nigeria. As a Yoruba nationalist, I'll focus on Yoruba nation and I'll use Nigeria as a microcosm of, of Africa. Um, in, in Africa, Yoruba land have been partitioned and amalgamated with, um, you know, different artificially created, you know, countries. Um, and as we know, the internal uh, imperialist, they borrow from the book of the external imperialists, the uh, Western European leaders, uh, that is, uh, by further partitioning Yoruba land um, and amalgamating, um, you know, Yoruba land with, um, you know, for example, if you if you look at uh, Kwara and and Kogi, uh, the Yoruba land in Kwara uh, and in Kogi, um, you know, Yoruba land uh, was partitioned, and then they took Kwara and Kogi to be part of the north. So it's the same uh, scheme. You divide, you partition, and then you amalgamate. So the you look at Nigeria, you have, they say, oh, Yoruba land, they created these artificial states. They say Yoruba land had, um, you know, six, uh, what is it called, six states, they call it Southwest. And they took Kogi, part of Kogi and Kwara, um, you know, those are Yoruba lands, and then they amalgamated those with what they call Nigeria. So, so you, you now understand it's the same scheme. Why um, Why did they do this? It's, they, they, can you guys hear me? Okay. So they, this was done in order to divide Yoruba people, because if you partition people and then you later amalgamate them, they will never be able to unite if you if you look at yoruba people in nigeria they don't even look at yoruba people in togo and Benin republic as their you know brothers and sisters they don't look at it that way the same way um someone from kwara would think is not from you know the southwest is from the north so it's the same you know playbook it's just divide and conquer uh so to speak so um, to those who want to, um, to those who want to obtain uh, their poverty uh, verification card <laughs> uh, and participate in the sham election in 2023, I ask them. I often ask them that who are the Yoruba representatives that ratified the 1999 uh, military decree, Miss Norma Constitution? Um, if if you can tell me those representatives then you can go ahead and participate in that election. Because to me, for the life of me, I will never understand why you want to participate in a system that, you know, that was not designed for you. That system was not designed for you and you want to participate in it. So whatever you get from me, you deserve it. So, and, um, and I also asked them that, um, why, would you, why would you want to do that? What, 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 what do you want to gain? from from that process because it's not of your design you didn't create it but then you keep trying to participate you know in that reckless transition anyways um there's something called the sequential order in the evolution of, uh, of a federation which dictates that a constitution must be written before a federation um uh, is established uh in nigeria the 36 federating units, which they call states, um, had been established before the 1999 SOAP constitution was written. So that right there should tell you that the Nigerian so-called federation is out of sequence. In the sequence, constitution is written and the federation is established because it's the constitution that sets the meets and bounds of the federation. So it's within the constitution that you say, okay, this is the kind of federation I want to have. 
But in Nigeria, <laughs> the federating units, the federation had already been established, right? The 36 federating units have been established before that constitution was written. So it's out of sequence. I mean, it's fraudulent. So why would you want to participate in a fraudulent federation, in a you know fraudulent um, constitution? Why do you want to participate in that kind of um, process? But some of our people, they, they don't reason from the for, uh, first principle. I, I think it's a, a mental limitation. Um, so, but for us, you're by nationalists, we are not participating in it because we did not design that system. We understand, we fully understand that that system, um, you know, uh, was not design, designed for us. So that's why we would not participate in it. So the Nigerian Federation is out of sequence. The 1999 uh, military decree, Ms. Noah Constitution, is a sham. So, I mean, we, we, we have to really, really, really understand that. So what I'm proposing is what I call uh, ethno-aggregation, which is the Yoruba nationalists coming together to fight forcefully and strongly for Yoruba self-determination. And the only way we can do that is by focusing on vertical integration and not horizontal integration. Uh, let me, what are horizontal integration? Horizontal integration are issues that affect everybody. Issues like religion, humanity, sexuality, feminism, pan-Africanism. Don't ever debate or focus on those issues because they are, you know, you know English um, humanists, they are English Christians, they are English feminists, they are American, you know, feminist, you have Pan-Africanists from Sudan, you have Pan-Africanists from, you know, all these different places, because these are issues that are horizontal issues, issues that affect everybody. Whenever you focus on issues that affect everybody, you don't have the time to focus on your own issue, right? So don't ever focus on horizontal issues. They are there, just let people that love to talk about that, let them talk about it, because they don't understand uh, the fundamentals. What you, what we have to focus on uh, to achieve ethnic aggregation is vertical um, integration, vertical issues, and those are issues that are peculiar to Yoruba people. Uh, for example, Yoruba language, uh, Yoruba culture, Yoruba customary law, Yoruba mythology, Yoruba natural philosophy, Yoruba spiritual philosophy, and Yoruba moral philosophy, and Yoruba self-determination. Those are issues that we need to focus on. And lastly, I'll round off by saying that um, when I go to some rooms, um, you know, mostly rooms um, of people that are trying to um, vote in 2023 or one Nigerian um, uh, rooms, they talk about, they tend to not understand what Nigeria's fundamental issue is. They want to reduce this to poverty. They want to reduce the corruption. Those are not the fundamental issues. Those are symptoms of the fundamental issues. The fundamental issue has to be self-determination. If you want Nigeria to survive, de-amalgamate Nigeria. You have to de-amalgamate along ethno-linguistic lines. That is the only way. Those that want, want Nigeria are the ones that are driving Nigeria to the precipice of self-immolation. Those are the ones that will make Yoruba people go extinct. Those are the ones that want to destroy Yoruba civilization. How can you, as a human being, a civilized person, want to live in a contraption where you cannot even use your own language as a medium of instruction in your own land? How can you want to live in a nation where your rule of law is not based on your customary law, it's based on the customary law of those who enslaved you, who colonized you. How can you, as a civilized person on this planet, want to live in a nation where your capital market, you don't even have any say in your capital market. Your central banking system was not designed by you. All of these things were designed by the British. So we Yoruba nationalists, we want to build our nation on our ethnic fundamentals, language, culture, customary law, moral, spiritual, natural philosophy. That's the, you have to do that first before you can even talk about economy. 
that is why you are poor you are poor because you don't have anything that holds there's no soul like your your nation has no soul there's no national soul it's unnatural one nigeria is not ontological it's unnatural and that unnaturalness is what creates all the symptoms that people think are the fundamental issues like you know um the conflict the ethnolinguistic i mean the ethnic conflict uh the corruption um the or every issue that you you see in nigeria today emanated from the point that nigeria nigeria's unity is unnatural so how can you make that unity natural you make it natural by first the amalgamating and 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 designing the ethnic nations within the nigerian space you design it along ethno-linguistic lines the same way western european countries if it's 500,000 people that speak the same language, they have the same culture, they have the same history, descent, then those people have to have their own nation. So, and in Nigeria, the Yoruba people, um, you know, some people have um, estimated our population to be around, you know, 55 to 60, some people even say 70 million. We, that's enough population, you know, to have a nation, we should never, you as a Yoruba national, you should never entertain when people want to force you to be inside one Nigeria. Because if you agree to be inside one Nigeria, the only thing you're going to get is death, devastation, and destruction. You will lose your civilization, you will lose your language, you, you lose your culture, you lose your signature, you lose your ethnic signatures. And once you do that, you are nothing and eventually will go extinct. I went to a room filled with um you know arabs and arab apologists and they're talking about how arabs conquered africa and some of them they were laughing <laughs> at you know africans even though and then they op they openly agree they openly even admitted to it that yes um the arabs they raped you know africa they they enslaved africans they did all of this but it was necessary so it's it's they call it a doctrine of necessity. So if we get conquered by the Fula Mohammedans inside Nigeria, the 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 progenies of those Fulani will make fun of our own um, you know progenies, and we should never make that happen. So by that I'm saying what we need to engage in is ethno ag aggregation and. The only way we can achieve that is by focusing on uh, focusing on vertical integration, which are issues that are peculiar to Yoruba people. Please do not fight people, do not engage people that talk about um, you know religion, humanity, sexuality, feminism, and pan-Africanism. Don't because you know that applies to uh, those things apply to everybody across the board. When you're focusing on those issues, you don't have enough time to focus on Yoruba issues on issues that are you know, peculiar to Yoruba people. So I want all Yoruba nationalists to come together and engage in ethno aggregation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ojo. Uh, Lady Mary, continue to bless your wisdom. Uh, Mr. Olayinka, please, you can go on. Uh, I say good evening to all the Omolua bees on this forum tonight. And I thank Elidu Mario for the gift of life and earth that we are using in communicating to each other this evening. I thank you for the opportunity given to me. And I want to appreciate every member of this platform here tonight. Precisely, uh, my able uh, leader to say, Are Pumi Bonka Ujo Aki Konju Babala Wu. Everybody here, Yamia Wuko Babami Suliki. Everybody here, I appreciate you all. Uh, on the topic of the creation of the Nigerian Empire, fate of indigenous people. 
I, I always educate people on the amalgamation of Nigeria. And the amalgamation of Nigeria did not start in 1914. And why was Nigeria amalgamated in the first instance is because of Yorubas. The whites that amalgamated us as as their plan to get us into extinction as a nation in Nigeria. If we are a stu uh, student of history, or if we read history very well, on the Western uh, efforts in Yoruba land, even before the amalgamation of Nigeria, when uh, Lords, uh, when Lugard was one of the members of uh, uh, British Parliament then, he has raised this thing in 1915, in 1815, not even 18, 1815, I think, when he told the members of Parliament, and I knew he was referring to Yoruba land. Uh, everyone here, I enjoy you to go and chase for a pair or more Yoruba is on YouTube. You'll be able to understand what I'm saying in extent, so that I will not be repeating. I will not be I will, I will, because I have a lot of issue to discuss here. Now coming back to amalgamation, like my brother has rightly said, the the Berlin 18, Mr. Ojo has rightly said it. But when Awolowo and Azikiwe and Yafela were fighting for the freedom, the independence of Nigeria from colonial, I want everybody here to realize that then the Northern people has not produced a single BSC. A single BSC. Order. As of 1946, the Yaba Technical College that was created was the first school. Sadano, Amadubelo, um, uh, Tafa Palewa, uh, uh, and others attended. It was when Awolowo and others were conversing for independence, and these people that had their plan as far as 18th century knew that. Yoruba had already gotten their words. What is our words? The knowledge to develop, to create, to dominate. They now took this uh, Amadou Bello, Tafa Balewa, took them to London to train them on how to govern Nigeria. And that was the effect of what we are having today. So if you are saying we want Nigeria will be one, Nigeria will be united, uh, football world, that, those are the deceit language. And uh, uh, people have been gotten wise these days. We are no longer on the on a dark age again. We are on a light day now that every every everybody realized and knew that Nigeria Nigerian F, Nigerian Nigeria is a fraud. Nigeria was um, was fraudulently amalgamated to suppress Yoruba, and this is what we could clearly see through our language, through our culture, through our tradition. In Nigeria today, even ever before the, ever before today, our language is called the barbaric uh, voice. A vernacular, our culture is not being respected, our tradition is nowhere to be found in the Nigerian constitution. In on our own soil that our ancestors gave to us. And I wonder when people talk, well, yeah, we in Nigeria will be united. We are one Nigeria. You will see a Yoruba man with PhD uh, degree. We will be saying Nigeria will be united. We just need to pray. We just need to pray. We just need to continue fasting. I laugh at these people. That most of them are intelligent. Educatively. But wisdom, knowledge, and understanding elude them. 
because until you get to know whom you are then you'll be able to realize where you are going so in order not to subjugate us we need we need we need we need to strengthen up our ability like yeah i finally said that uh is is, is is not sure the effort is being i can tell you ma in nigeria today in nigeria today 75 75 percent of populace has knew that nigeria wants to be divided and are ready to be divided 75 percent and to buttress my point when apc was having their convention in abuja you see the their national the, their national anthem when the apc wanted to to to, to, to sing it was yoruba national anthem that is song. so even if wari has not heard it before by waging war on sunday go he has clearly seen it that even the apc knew Yoruba nation we come. So in every aspect of Yoruba land today, 95% of people living in Yoruba land knew that there is one group, there is one uh, agitation now. It is called Yoruba wants to go out of Nigeria. So the only thing we be Able, we will continue to do is evangelizing ourselves, educating ourselves on why we need to go. And that is why I did a Peruomo Yoruba to let people realize that why Yoruba must leave Nigeria. Thanks so much. Uh, like uh, I rightly said, when anywhere I see Ale, I'm always happy, delighted to be on the same floor with him. I will plead to the man. We may not have had uh, a discussion previously than meeting in the clubhouse, but I will beg Ale. If he's here, she'll be listening. Pelu Ishendale Omo Yoruba Ati Ebe Awen Rumole. I am pleading on behalf of all the Yorubas everywhere in the world that that your program you brought into us. Why must you lose your land? should be taken to every volume of all Yorubas for presentation again you can repeat it one million way until people realizes what you said that alone will change millions of mind and i'm not sure 50 percent of us here realizes what i'm saying for the little one of us that listened to that program knew that you are you are you are not an ordinary person you are an angel to this generation and i want you to spread that uh, topic to all the look and corners of wherever the program of yoruba is being uh, 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 mentioned and I will enjoy all those who ask this uh, uh, forum to please beg this man, Are, to give us a day in this house that he will lecture us back, he will educate us. Why must we lose our land? May God, may we let Mary continue to bless every one of us in this house. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thanks so much. I appreciate you all. Thank you. I shall. I shall. Okay, we'll just uh, continue with the discussion. I think um, we are about uh, rounding up, um, hopefully, um, very soon. I don't know, we've uh, exhausted uh, the queue. Uh, Yoruba, please. I think, I think, please, uh, you can go. You, yeah, you can. can I say uh, something? Uh, uh, please, who is that? 
So it's Dr. Buke Oberi. Ah, okay, okay. I did, I did. Okay, you can you can go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me just use like two minutes, then I'll let my brother, Mr. Ting, talk. I just want to um, second what Mr. Ojo said uh, when he was talking about the people that are advocating for election. I always look at it from a medicine perspective, being a physician. If you misdiagnose a patient, you're going to give them the wrong medication. Uh, not only is it that the patient will not get better, they will actually get worse. So those are the dangers of medical error. You can apply the same concepts to the Nigeria space. When people fail to understand uh, the reason why the country has not progressed. They, they, they focused on the wrong thing. They are actually focusing on the symptoms of the disease as opposed to the actual disease itself. Then you're, you're going to be treating symptoms and uh, the symptoms will never go away until you address the root cause of the problem. So it's, it's the same way. It's a very, very simple analogy. People like to focus on issues like poverty, which is really man-made. Uh, they also like to say, oh, the people are very indisciplined. They don't follow rules. They don't follow orders. Uh, it, it is the religion. The religion is the problem. They, they are too, too religious. Uh, that is why we, we have this problem. Oh, it's, it's corruption. And uh, since I started coming to Clubhouse, there is also another scapegoat, which is uh, the, uh, the civil servant. Okay, oh, it's the civil servant. They are the problem of Nigeria. Get rid of them. They are very indisciplined. They are corrupt. So they, they, they look at everything. They look at everything except the actual thing that is causing the problem, which is the, 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 this, uh, this compulsory amalgamation. It's, it's like a self-inflicted wound. And we cannot say it's uh, enough, you know? If we don't do the needful, the, the consequences are, are very, 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 very there. And uh, we are just talking here. Talk, they think it's cheap, but it's not because you know, it's words that God, Olodumare, used to create this world. So it's very important. Continue advocacy by talking is just one of the things that we do at Think Your Bar First. Uh, we also go out there in the community and actually do community programs that touches people's lives. If you look at our world today in Yoruba land, Poverty has been weaponized to destroy the brilliant mind of the people. People are so hungry that they can even sell their mother just to get food. That is how, how bad it has become. So we have community programs uh, that is targeting some, some stuff, some, some of these issues in, in the Yoruba land. Our effort is not enough, uh, of course. That is why we, we like to collaborate with other well-meaning Yoruba organizations as well to, to get the work, to get the job done. Because if the people cannot feed themselves, if you go to them and give them 5,000 Naira, okay, uh, to vote, they will surely vote. So, and they don't care because their life won't change anyway. So let's just keep in mind, anytime we go to any room, and we heard them talking about, oh, corruption. Uh, corruption is, has been used a lot. It is this same corruption, corruption of, 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 uh, of the government and corruption of religion. This is the same thing that the Fulani has used from time immemorial. It is the same excuse that their forefathers down for the used to enslave the Hausa people. Guess what? What was Gwari's campaign all about? If you don't kill corruption, corruption will kill Nigeria. Look around you. Who had the most corrupt in Nigeria? 
who are the most corrupt? The level of corruption that they are displaying, bold face corruption. I have never seen anything like that in my life on this heart. Even as a uh, as somebody that, that that came from that Nigeria, I have never seen corruption at that level before. They are not afraid at all. They just treat the place like the the estate of their ancestors, like they said. They see it as the garden of their father. They just go in and pluck everything. They put their their woman in in the Nigerian Port Authority, which belongs to the to the Odudua country. And they took all the money. She took all the money there. And when you guys make noise, they just took her and put her in another place. Every basic infra in infrastructures you can think of in that country is controlled by them. And you think you're sitting there, you think you are not conquered. Think, think again. I encourage you to join Think Yoruba Force. You can join us here on Clubhouse. If you have an idea, if you think you want to make a difference and you're genuine, please. Contact us. We like to bring brilliant minds together and brainstorm. Nobody knows uh, I have all the answers, but as as uh, we can bring our collective together and 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 charge forward. Thank you very much, and thank you, Are. May May Olodumari continue to bless you, and thank you, everybody, all the great speakers, Mr. Bunka, Mr. Um, Ujo and all the other uh, speakers as well. Not that you're not important. Baba, uh, what's, the, what's the Baba's name? I think he left. Baba Lainka, thank you very much. That was a very brilliant uh, submission as well. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ovo. Uh, Mr. Tinkan, please, uh, you, have, you, have the, you have the floor, please. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's great to be here on the Think You About First platform. Uh, speaking about the creation of the Nigerian Empire, the fate of indigenous peoples. Um, yeah, the Nigerian state, um, I mean, uh, has been running for about 60 years plus. And um, it's been a very terrible experience for indigenous people. Um, if you date back to uh, the amalgamation when um, the British started this project, uh, you could see the vision of the British. It was to weld together disparate peoples, not minding their um, uh, distinct uh, identities and civilizations. But it was just to weld together uh, it, uh, these peoples to keep them under their uh, control for the purpose of, ex of the expropriation of uh, material resources, as well as the human resources also, because what they do is for those who, um, the human resources, uh, who, I mean, the excellent human resources that come out of that contraption, they make the contraption as uh, unlivable as possible, such that those those the, the best uh, our best brains eventually go to serve, continue serving the British Empire, and this is what we have seen. Uh, that is why we have a very large um, um, diaspora. But uh, thanks be to God that. Uh, Despite the fact that uh, a lot of us are essentially we are put through the educational system within the Nigerian contraption, uh, where the lack of critical reasoning was not uh, put to the, I mean, brought to the forefront. Rather, it was more the kind of educational system we got was more about uh, rote learning, which was essentially to just. Um, taking information and um, and um, spew it out when needed, without interrogating it, without carrying out deductive reasoning, without critical reasoning, and all of that. But um, as God will have it, because this thing is a very deeply spiritual thing, um, our consciousness has been raised. Uh, a lot of us, when we were born, did not realize that uh, this is the assignment. God will um, 
give to us, which is to preach the for the redemption of our people. We never had an idea that this was going to be the, the, um, the situation, that at a point in time in our lives, we will begin that, uh, that uh, mission to preach the gospel of uh, redemption for our people and to reverse this tidal wave of destruction of, our, of the indigenous peoples of Nigeria. So the empire, as it were, is uh, shaking. It's been shaken to its foundation and it will be destroyed by God's grace as we continue to march forward in this uh, battle for liberation. One thing we are thankful to God also is that the empire itself has not crystallized. Uh, it is still uh, at its maybe uh, basic infancy stage. And it is uh, at a stage where it can also be still be destroyed. Uh, had it been that certain force multipliers, um, such as uh, the explosion of the information superhighway, uh, the media, and all of that, did not come at a time like this, a lot of us will have still been in the dark, thinking that some of these symptoms, like corruption like uh, badly behaved people, like leadership was a problem of Nigeria. But uh, like they've always said, the problem we have with us as black people is that um, the, the, the white man will say that uh, if you want to hide something from a white uh, black man, just put it in, the bo in a book. And this is what essentially has been our the bane uh, people would rather not interrogate the um, the um, problems, the history of our country. A lot of people have uh, reduced the history of Nigeria to just 1960. Uh, um, especially for those of us in the South who pretend that we are educated. You know, the sheer lack of historicity and the crass inability to interrogate our existence beyond the colonial provenance, provenance of 1960. Beggars belief, as we still hear most times, Southern youths moving against this uh, concentration gradient of a clearly defective foundation that presents a clash of civilizations between Southern Nigeria and Northern Nigeria. You know, so it's important that we continue to preach this gospel uh, to tell the world, to tell our people on the ground that uh, we are, we need a de-amalgamation of this failed contraption. We, the Igbos, have been in this battle, I mean, even before the foundations of Nigeria was built. And despite all of the things, the terrible things that have happened to us, we have remained resolute. It doesn't matter. They can kill as many people as possible. They can do whatever they like. But at the end of the day, we will get our freedom, no matter what they throw at us. One thing we should also understand is that every empire has a beginning and an end. The British, who are trying to create this empire uh, in Nigeria through their surrogate Fulani Caliphate, have almost come to uh, a full circle with their own empire, the British Empire. There's no way in history, if I recall, that an empire on the decline will create a, 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 a supplanter empire somewhere else. Uh, just to, because the, the idea is that as long as the British Empire exists, maybe they will want to create a supplanter empire somewhere where that will, it will provide the resources to maintain its own empire. But the British themselves are current, currently on a constant decline. Um, with the um, opening up of a multipolar world, as we can see in the clash of ideologies between the Eastern and Western Hemisphere. And that will continue progressively um, as, we, as we move forward in world affairs. So for us, this is a, a, a window of opportunity to be able to 
take this opportunity, this uh, uh, era that is coming to de determine our own future and to make sure that um, we establish or we de amalgamate that failed contraption called One Nigeria. You know, so I will just end by saying because uh, it's unfortunate that uh, we come and you see a lot of people who are incurable, incurably optimistic about the Nigerian project. Uh, but um, I will say, uh, like I've always said, that is it's only an incurably optimistic architect that tries to rework the design framework of a building with a faulty foundation that will not realize that he's committing professional suicide because that defective defective building must surely come down if not by his own incompetence from the prescription of science but certainly by the pervasive laws of nature i yield uh, th thank you so much uh, mr thing thank you for your contribution uh and your perspective uh, your perception uh, perception perception of uh, the whole situation and uh you know you brought a lot to the conversation i uh, just want to say thank you so much uh we'll take um Vigiano and we take abby please you have two minutes each we have about uh, 25 minutes uh, to round up this room so that we don't lose uh the recording please so Bajino, take two minutes uh abby take two minutes then we take um all other speakers are on the stage before we go back to Arian Bonka for closing uh, submission. So, Bijano, please, uh, you, you have the floor, please. Two minutes, please. Okay, Mr. Bijano is not there. Abby, please, are you there? Hello, everyone. Hello, my ancestors. Hello um, to all of the um, highly indigenous people that is in this. Um, clubhouse i just think I, I wanted to speak on the topic really quickly because i like to type better than speaking because when i speak ultimately people will assume that i'm not nigerian or they assume that i'm not um yoruba or they'll say i don't know about nigeria what i want to say is this right i am a proper yoruba girl i am yoruba first in everything that i do my first name is Abosede. My middle name is Adenike. My last name is Adeni. So I just want to tell people, right, the reason why we live in certain areas in Western civilization where we change our names or change our certain structures about our ways of life is so that we can provide for our families. It's a tactic that we utilize. But when we go back home to our home, we know who we are. We know who we should stand for. We know the type of people that we should be around. We know our culture. But as Yoruba people, sometimes we allow culture to blind us. We allow culture to make us feel as if we're not educated enough to be able to move the, move the country forward. As far as politics is concerned, Yoruba people are the most prominent people in all of Africa. Meaning that even in the whole of Yoruba nation, there is not one political person that did not come from that Yoruba aspect that we live in. Yoruba people are one of the most smartest, one of the most culturally moved. We move the culture forward in our clothing. We move the culture forward in our music. We move the culture forward in our foods and everything that we do. As far as Nigeria is concerned, people say it's corruption. It is corruption. 100% because the typical person in Nigeria, let's be honest with ourselves, we need to open our hearts. Are we also good? Are we good as individuals to ourselves? Are we good as individuals to our family, our neighbors? Are we good? Because I know a lot of people that get on the plane from America here, they follow all of the rules, they follow all of the regulations in the, in, in the plane. Once they land in Nigeria, they become a different person. They start being lawless. So it's not about always blaming corruption, right? It's us as a people. It's me as a person. It's all of us coming collectively and saying, what can we do to move the country forward? We need a better educational system. If you read the curriculum in Nigeria, it's outdated. 
we need a group of people to get together, educators that have traveled or educators that are in Nigeria to come together to de design a better curriculum. Uh, um, Abby. There's so many things that we need. Abby. So where you're about first. Abby. Thank you. I, I, I will let uh, land then and we can come back. Well, first okay. of all, uh, okay, yes. Uh, okay. Abby, the thing is, the thing is this, and we, I, I, I'll let, let Are go. We have passed on uh, the stage of, you know, making the country work. And Abby, like you said, um, most of us here and a lot of people on this um, clubhouse, we, we basically have lived on uh, the most part of our adult life. A lot of people also were born there in uh, outside of Nigeria. But the question, Abby, is let's ask ourselves, why should we be speaking English in our own motherland? It starts from there. So even if we talk about education, why should we be educating our own children in English? And those are part we of the fundamental. We should uh, not. To be honest with you, we should not. You're right. We should not. But the curriculum that was designed, that was passed down, was passed down in English. None of us decided to come together and say, I'm not yeah, saying I'll us be in man. general, I'll be to change man. our I'll curriculum. Be, be, let me quickly um, answer you. Um, normally, I like to, sorry for calling you Abi Ahmed. Sorry. Um, I have to quickly come in here. Uh, and I'm going to take you through history a little bit. Do you know that University of University of Ife, uh, OAU, uh, which was former, formerly Western Nigeria University, it was designed to teach in Yoruba language from uh, science to social sciences, even to technology and even to arts. Are you aware of that? Abby, okay, I'm very sure I, you're not I, aware. I, I, I'm aware of that because I'm actually, okay. my background is in what? curriculum and instruction. I'm what? actually an educator, so I'm okay. aware of that. But what I'm saying is no, education no, should no, start no, from no, primary no, school, no, not no, college, no. sir. You primary are, school. Can, can you calm down? All right, all right, can we do this? Can we do this really fast? We don't have much time. Okay. She can join the club, come to our room often. She'll be able to join the conversation more and learn okay, more. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, I understand where you're coming from, Mr. Michael, but I just wanted to pass some messages across. All these things you're talking about, Abby, you do not treat malaria, uh, you don't treat cancer with acetaminophen or paracetamol. The country called Nigeria is a cancer to the Yoruba people. That's the major problem we have. And I'm going to tell you why. The lives of Yoruba people used to be better than this. We had the best infrastructure, the best one of the best education, the best agricultural revolution, the best one of the best industrialization. We were the most prosperous region in Sub-Saharan Africa. South Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, all the Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian countries, Asian tigers, Hong Kong, they were learning from us. Where did you get you wrong? We got it wrong because we could not control our sovereignty and we could not control our space. We negotiated to be part of Nigeria with having our nation within a nation, which was the Western region. That was why how we joined Nigeria. We built embassies in London, in Saudi Arabia. Those, at least I know of those two countries to take care of Yoruba citizens when we are outside the space called Nigeria. The only thing Nigeria controlled as a 1960 was sovereignty, international relations, the military, and the currency. Every of our curriculum was built based using Yoruba civilization pattern, which was modernized. That is why they say Yoruba people are one of the best educated people in Africa. We achieved that education not because of West or of Nigeria. That was the work of Yoruba nationalists who did that. You all know about Chief Obafemi Awolowo, the free education. That was Yoruba African socialism. When we were doing that in Western region in Yoruba land, guess what they were doing in Northern Nigeria? 
They were busy feudalizing and weaponizing poverty and destroying the indigenous people in those spaces. Now, the regional system that we negotiated for before we can be part of Nigeria was destroyed. So when I asked you a question, do you know what happened to Obafemi Awolowo University? Let me tell you what they did. Obafemi Awolowo University was nationalized by the federal government of Nigeria. They took that university that was built with cocoa money, with the taxes of the people of the Yoruba nation, took it away from us and federalized it and nationalized it. And it became a Nigerian property. The same thing, they took our embassies away in London. They took our embassies away in Saudi Arabia. So I know you don't know. That's why I don't want to come out on you. Of the injustices, same thing we did with the, they did with the Lagos Stock Exchange. They turned into Nigerian Stock Exchange. Everything they were taking away from us in the name of Nigerianization. They wanted to enforce unitary. They wanted to enforce unitarianism, and they call it unity. That's why you cannot be a conscious Yoruba person and still be mentioning Nigeria in that context. You cannot. Because when we talk about the Yoruba people, we talk about the Yorubas of the Republic, the Yorubas of Togo, the Yorubas of Cuba, the Yorubas of Brazil. They are as important as me and you on this platform if they come to speak about their issues. So you Nigerianizing the Yoruba identity, Yoruba consciousness, and Yoruba discussion is not fit for this place. Sorry for being too harsh. So that is what I want to say. The reason why we are stuck and we are messed up is because Nigeria is a cancer that is destroying the essence of who we are. I gave you that instance. If we had our Western region, who destroyed the Western region of government? The Yoruba people never did that. And ever since that destruction started, D was carried out in 1966. Up to this present moment, the Yoruba people are still fighting for us to have our nationhood. Outside, but this is what immediately they took away that nationhood. Firstly, they took away our sovereignty. They we, we and took away our uh, took away took away our nationhood. The British did that. The Yoruba nationalists led by Haulowo were able to get a form of nationhood back because it's Western region. Western Nigeria means Yoruba nation. But what happened? Because we were yoked with ethnic nationalities we we're not supposed to yoke with. People who had a different understanding about how the future should be. They took away, they did, they did a coup. Because why should this, I'm sorry to say this, why should non-Yorubas be orchestrating coup d'etat that will be affecting Yoruba people if you are not a conquered people in the first place? Who made you a Nigerian? How are you a Nigerian? You're a Nigerian because you are conquered. I love Igbo people. I love Ijo people. I love um, Tif people. You know, I don't hate Fulani people because they are opportunists, exploiting their misery and aggravating our, our, our pain. The reason why we share the same nationality, political nationality together, is because we have the same slave master. I have nothing in common with them. I don't hate them. There's no difference between a Igbo man and a Fulani man, you know? And the, um, um, the, the difference between a Igbo man and a Fulani man is not different between a, a, a somebody from Russia and a German, an ethnic Russian and an ethnic German. No difference. No difference. But because they've destroyed organic African states and empires, many of us have lost the consciousness and the understanding of what it takes to form a country. That is why there's killing. We talk about this lawlessness. This is an empire. There is chaos. This was built on the bloodshed of indigenous people. Do you expect something that was built on bloodshed to be lawful? How come? There is a lot of bloodshed and innocent people that have been killed in this contraption. So it's not going to work. So there's a lot of empires that were destroyed. There were a lot of countries and kingdoms that existed before Nigeria was created. So when you do that, you destroy the normal. That's why when you invade a particular state, country, you displace people. There will be refugee crisis. There will be instability. The instability, go and read about what they wrote about the Yoruba country in the 19th century, that it was one of the most organized people's places to be, even in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Go and look at what they wrote about us. Organized people. 
we were one of the most uh, urban, earliest urbanized people in in the surface of on the surface of the heart we built cities before portugal and lisbon was created before created we've been living in cities that is the essence and the the greatness of the yoruba spiritual uh, yoruba civilization so the disorganization you see when a madman comes from europe drew a map in 1884 and are telling the yorubas of togo to see the yorubas of nigeria that are, that are, we are different they called us nigerians they call yorubas of togo togolis yorubas of Benin republic Benin, Beninua, the yorubas of nigeria nigerians that is chaos you destroy the people so if when we are when we control ourselves when we control have our own police when we control our own judiciary we control our own spirituality we control our own educational curriculum where yoruba people will determine yoruba destiny don't come here and tell me nonsense about uh, about bringing somebody from kano to be becoming a commissioner of police in Ibadan. what an insult what does he know about the, what, 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 what does he know about the spirituality of Ibadan people? That's why we need All to right. go spiritual. So I'm to, let me just round up. Let me just round up. Thank you, Michael. Please, Are, please, we have a 10 minutes to round up, please. Thank you. So please, I know you are speaking from passion and you are speaking. Please don't Nigerianize the Yoruba discussion again. Please. Yorubas are Yorubas. And we will correct the injustice that have been done against us. We will do it. This generation will do it. So that when we talk about the Yoruba people, you start bringing the nigger area into a discussion. We want to get out of this mess. And that is the mistake between that we committed between 1960, between 1951. Are, are please kindly do round off, are. Between 1951 and 1960, Yoruba nation was independent. It was independent. We only lacked sovereignty, which the British took and gave it back to the Fulanis via Nigeria. So that's why we are here. That's why we are here. I'm sorry for taking so much time. Maybe we are going to have some other time, some other discussions. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, yeah Miss Abby, please have, have followed you. Kindly try to follow back. I think um, it, it, it's, all, it's all about perspective and please and kindly do come back to the room so that we can have more of these engaging discussions and we obviously see things differently. But the fact is that most of us on this, on this platform right now, We've moved from this stage of believing in Nigeria, and it's just about having our own sovereignty and control over our own land and our own identity and our own future. And that is just what it's all about for the moment. So please, we'll come back to you. I followed you. Kindly follow the Olin Risk moderator. We are, we are, we are all Yorubas. We are, we are facing the same place. We are having the same objective, you know, to free our people. But please, let's just follow each other and just, just um, find a way to discuss this thing and come to a common ground of where each and every one of us stand. Thank you so much. Please, Sam, we, are about, we have about um, a few minutes just to round up the room. Uh, Mr. Mike, please, any final word from you? If you have a final word, um, please, can you just um, blink, blink the mic, please? Can you, thank you. No, there is no final word. Everything that could be said has been said. Area has essentially compiled all the words and there to be said in the last um, couple of minutes. And at the end of the day, there is no uh, replacement for sovereignty. You cannot entrepreneur your way into out of the lack of sovereignty you cannot replace government by entrepreneurs or by individuals you need to have that collective force and you need to have that common purpose that unity among your people to go forward so if you are lacking that you are subject to the whims of whichever contraption you find yourself which is why nigeria has africa essentially has 54 administrative areas which are only created for the purpose of allowing the world especially the european to better relate and expect africa they exist for no other reason rather than that. And without accepting the reality of things and understanding the greatest injustice that was done and the fact that sovereignty was stolen from the indigenous people and indigenous nations of Africa and finally to rectify that, we keep on with this rigmarole into the future and time eternal. So until we are ready to accept our fate, our reality, and actually work with our two hands to change it, then we just keep speaking English and just We'll be treating the symptoms, not the fundamental problem that we have. So thank you very much, and I think we've come to the end of the room today. Hopefully, uh, people I, join I, us. I, I think Mr. Gonka wants to have a final submission, please, and uh, Mr. Michael. Yeah, sorry, so, Mr. Gonka, please, and uh, you have the floor for your final submission. I see you were breaking. Yes. Uh, how many minutes do we have? Let me see. I can wrap up my thoughts. We, we have. We have. Question. We have a maximum of uh, five minutes. Three minutes. We have three minutes. Oh, <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll do it another time. I wanted to come from the perspective of King Leopold's letter to to give a narration, but of we course there'll be other, other times in the future. 
yeah. can create the follow-up room if people still have things to say it's simply that the follow-up room will not be streamed so it's more like a general chat and we can just banter words and ideas if that's okay for everybody yeah we could we could do that so that the replay will be saved yeah so uh, okay. what, what topic uh, what topic bunker are you looking at so that we can just frame the topic so uh, so I, I i make it conquer the black man's mind and take his lands Okay, conquer the black man tonight. Uh, Mr. Michael, you, Mr. Michael, mm. can you just uh, open the? You can start opening the room. Then I will just uh, round up uh, okay. with everything here. Thank you so much. Is there any final word from anyone on the stage before we close the room, please? We have uh, two, three minutes just to end the room uh, before we take the national anthem. Uh, thank you, moderator. This change. We do. Have, we have less than five minutes to go. So. Yeah, just one minute only. Just I want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity. And, uh, you know, people who are talking about the unity or Nigerization, they are just a chronic disease to us as separatists. Make us sick. Don't focus on them. Just remove them and move forward. Thank you. Think Yoruba first. Th 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 thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll be taking the Yoruba National Anthem. We'll be taking the Yoruba National Anthem for now. Please, we'll be taking the Yoruba National Anthem now and uh, we'll be closing the room. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Please kindly uh, follow Think Yoruba first uh, for more conversation like this. Thank you so much. <laughs>